Section One of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre chapter one the drama of the rue norvon on monday april fourth nineteen the evening paper la capitale published the following article on its first page a drama over the motives of which there is a bewildering host of conjectures was unfolded this morning on the heights of montmartre the baroness de vibre well known in the parisian world and among artists whose generous patroness she was has been found dead in the studio of the ceramic painter jacques dolon the young painter rendered completely helpless by a soporific lay stretched out beside her when the crime was discovered we say crime designedly because when the preliminary medical examination was completed it was clear that the death of the baroness de vibray was due to the absorption of some poison the painter jacques dolon whom the enlightened attentions of dr myron had drawn from his condition of stupor underwent a short examination from the superintendent of police in the course of which he made remarks of so suspicious a nature that the examining magistrate put him under arrest then and there at police headquarters they are absolutely dumb regarding this strange affair nevertheless the personal investigation undertaken by us throws a little light on what is already called the drama of the rue norvon the discovery of the crime this morning about seven o'clock madame Bijou, a housekeeper in the service of the painter jacques dolan who with his sister mademoiselle elizabeth dolan occupied lodge number six in the close of the rue norvon was on the ground floor of the house attending to her customary duties she had been on the premises about half an hour and so far had not noticed anything abnormal however astonished at not hearing any movements on the floor above for the painter generally rose pretty early madame Bijou decided to go upstairs and wake her master who would be vexed at having let himself sleep so late she had to pass through the studio to reach monsieur jacques dolan's bedroom no sooner had she raised the door curtain of the studio than she recoiled horror-struck disorder reigned in the studio a startling disorder pieces of furniture displaced some of them overturned showed that something extraordinary had happened there in the middle of the room on the floor lay the inanimate form of a person whom madame Bijou knew well for she had seen her at the painter's house many a time the baroness de vibray not far from her buried in a large armchair motionless giving no sign of life was monsieur jacques dolon when the good woman saw the rigid attitude of these two persons she realized that she was in the presence of a tragedy stirred to the depths she redescended the stairs calling for help shortly afterwards the entire close was in a state of ferment house porters neighbors male and female crowded round madame Bijou, endeavouring to understand her disconnected account of the terrifying spectacle she had come face to face with but a minute before sudden death suicide crime all were plausible suppositions the more audacious of these gossip-mongers had ventured as far as the studio door from that standpoint a rapid glance round enabled them to get a clear idea of the truth of the housekeeper's statements they returned to give a confirmation of them to the inquisitive and increasing crowd in the principal avenue of the close the police the police must be informed cried the close portress whilst this woman with considerable presence of mind and aided by madame Bijou, exerted herself to keep out the people of the neighbourhood who had got wind of the tragedy two men had set off to seek the police lodge number six on the summit of montmartre is the rue norvon in shape it resembles a donkey's back and at one particular spot it hugs the accentuated curve of the butte 
the close of rue norvon is situated at number forty seven it is separated from the street by a strong iron gate the porter's lodge being at the side the close consists of a series of little dwellings separated by wooden railings up which climbing plants grow fine trees encircle these abodes with so thick a curtain of leafage that the inhabitants might think themselves buried in the depths of the country lodge number six is even more isolated than the others it consists of a ground floor and a first floor with an immense studio attached three years ago number six was leased to monsieur jacques delon then a student at the fine arts school it has been continuously occupied by the tenant and his sister miss elizabeth delon who has kept house for her brother for the last fortnight the painter has been alone his sister who had gone to switzerland to convalesce after a long illness was expected back that same day or the day following the reputation of the two young people is considered by their neighbours to be beyond criticism the artist has led a regular and hard-working life last year the salon accorded him a medal of the second class his sister an affable and unassuming girl seemed always much attached to her brother in that very bohemian neighbourhood she is highly thought of as a girl of the most estimable character the baroness de vibray visited them frequently and her motor-car used to attract attention in that high remote suburb the wilds of montmartre the old lady liked to dress in rather showy colours she was considered eccentric but was also known to be good and generous she took a particular interest in the dolans whose family so it was said she had known in provence jacques dolan and his sister highly valued their intimacy with the baroness de vibray who was known all over paris as a patroness of artists and the arts first verifications already slander and imagination between them had concocted the wildest stories when monsieur agram the eminent police superintendent of the clignancourt quarter appeared at the entrance to the close accompanied by his secretary he at once entered number six charging the two policemen who were assisting him on no account to allow any one to enter excepting the doctor whom he had at once sent for he requested the portress to hold herself at his disposal in the garden and made madame bajou accompany him to the studio barely twenty minutes had elapsed since the housekeeper had been terror-struck by the dreadful spectacle which had met her eyes there when she entered with the superintendent of police nothing had been altered madame de vibray horribly pale her eyes closed her lips violet hued lay stretched upon the floor her body had assumed the rigidity of a corpse that of jacques dulon huddled in an armchair was in a state of immobility monsieur agram at once noticed long intersecting streaks on the floor such as might have been traced by heavy furniture dragged over the waxed boards of the flooring a pungent medicinal odour caught the throats of the visitors madame bajou was about to open a window the superintendent stopped her let things remain as they are for the present was his order after casting an observant eye round the room he questioned the housekeeper is this state of disorder usual never in this world sir declared the good woman monsieur delon and his sister are very steady very regular in their habits especially the young lady it is true she has been absent for nearly a month but her brother has often been left alone and he has always insisted on his studio being kept in good order did monsieur delon have many visitors very seldom monsieur sometimes his neighbours would come in and then there was that poor lady lying there so deathly pale that it makes me ill to look at her jacques delon lives the conversation was interrupted by the arrival of the doctor employed in connection with relief for the poor the superintendent of police pointed out to this dr myron the two inanimate figures a glance of the doctor's trained eye sufficed to show him that madame de vibray had been dead for some time approaching jacques delon dr myron examined him attentively will you help me to lift him on to a bed or a table he asked it seems to me that this one is not dead his bedroom is next to this cried madame bijou oh heavens above if only the poor man would recover 
silently the doctor aided by the superintendent and a policeman transported young dollon into the next room air cried the doctor give him air open all the windows it seems to me a case of suspended animation there is partial suffocation this will probably yield to energetic treatment whilst good madame bijou whose legs were shaking under her was carrying out the doctor's orders the superintendent of police kept watch to see that nothing was touched the doctor's attention was concentrated on jacques dollon monsieur agram was searching for some indication which might throw light on the drama so far he had been unable to formulate any hypothesis should the moribund painter return to consciousness the explanation he could give would certainly clear up the situation at this point in the superintendent's cogitations the doctor called out he lives he lives bring me a glass of water jacques dollon was returning to consciousness slowly painfully his features contracting as at the remembrance of a horrible nightmare the young man stretched his limbs opened his eyes he turned a dull gaze on those about him a gaze which became one of stupefaction when he perceived these unknown faces gathered round his bed his eyes fell on his housekeeper he murmured madame b madame b and fell back into unconsciousness is he dead whispered monsieur agram the doctor smiled be reassured monsieur he lives but he finds it terribly difficult to wake up he has certainly swallowed some powerful narcotic and is still under its influence but its effects will soon pass off now the good doctor spoke the truth in a short time jacques dollon making a violent effort sat up casting scared and bewildered glances about him he cried who are you what do you want of me oh the ruffians the bandits there is nothing to fear monsieur i am simply the doctor they have called in to attend to you be calm you must recover your senses and tell us what has happened jacques dollon pressed his hands to his forehead as though in pain how heavy my head is he muttered what has happened to me let me see wait ah uh, yes that's it at a sign from the doctor the superintendent had stationed himself beside the bed behind the young painter keeping a finger on his patient's pulse the doctor asked him in a fatherly fashion to tell him all about it it's like this replied jacques dollon yesterday evening i was sitting in my armchair reading it was getting late i had been working hard i was tired all of a sudden i was surrounded by masked men clothed in long black garments they flung themselves on me before i could make a movement i was gagged bound with cords i felt something pointed driven into my leg into my arm then an overpowering drowsiness overcame me the strangest visions passed before my eyes i lost consciousness rapidly i wanted to move to cry out in vain there was no strength in me powerless and, and that's all there's nothing more asked the doctor after a moment's reflection jacques answered that is all he now seemed fully awake he moved the movement was evidently painful it hurts he said instinctively putting his hand on his left thigh let us see what is wrong said the doctor and was preparing to examine the place when a voice from the studio called monsieur it was monsieur agram's secretary the magistrate left his post by the bed and went to the studio monsieur said the secretary i have just found this paper under the chair in which monsieur dollon was will you acquaint yourself with its contents the magistrate seized the paper it was a letter couched in the following terms dear madame if you do not fear to climb the heights of montmartre some evening will you come to see the painted pottery i am preparing for the salon you will be welcome and will confer on us a great pleasure i say us because i have excellent news of elizabeth who is returning shortly perhaps she will be here to receive you with me i am your respectful and devoted jacques dollon the magistrate was frowning as he handed back the letter to his secretary saying keep it carefully then he went into the bedroom where the doctor was talking to the invalid the doctor turned to monsieur agram monsieur dollon has just asked me who you are i did not think i ought to hide from him that you are a superintendent of the police monsieur ah cried jacques dollon can you help me to discover what happened to me last night you have just told us yourself monsieur replied the magistrate 
but have you nothing further to tell us can you not recollect whether or no you had a visitor before the arrival of the men who attacked you why no monsieur no one called the doctor here intervened the pain in the leg monsieur complained of need not cause any anxiety it is a very slight superficial wound a slight swelling above the broken skin possibly indicates an intramuscular puncture which might have been made by someone unaccustomed to such operations for it is a clumsy performance it is a queer business monsieur agram who had been steadily observing jacques dollon persisted is there not a gap monsieur in your recollections of what occurred were you quite alone yesterday evening were you not expecting any one are you certain that you did not have a visitor did not someone pay you a visit someone you had asked to come and see you jacques dollon opened his eyes eyes of stupefaction and stared at the superintendent no monsieur it is that went on monsieur agram then stopping short and drawing the doctor aside he asked do you consider him in a fit state to bear a severe moral shock a confrontation the doctor glanced at his patient he appears to me to be quite himself again you can act as you see fit monsieur jacques dollon astonished at this confabulation and vaguely uneasy was in fact able to get up without help be good enough to go into your studio monsieur said the magistrate jacques dollon complied without a word no sooner did he cross the threshold than he recoiled terror-struck he was shaking from head to foot his lips were quivering every feature expressed horrified shrinking from the spectacle confronting him the the baroness de vibray he barely articulated how could it be possible the superintendent of police did not lose a single movement made by the young painter keeping a lynx-eyed watch on every expression that flitted across his countenance he said it certainly is the baroness de vibray dead assassinated no doubt how do you explain that but retorted jacques dollon who appeared overwhelmed i do not know i do not understand the magistrate replied yet did you not invite her to your studio had you not asked her to come some evening soon had you not certain pieces of painted pottery to show her that is so confessed the painter but i was not aware i did not know he seemed about to faint the doctor made him sit down on the chair where he had been found unconscious whilst he was recovering monsieur agram continued his investigations he opened a little cupboard in which were several poisonous powders this was shown by the writing on the flasks containing them he spoke to the doctor taking care that jacques dollon did not overhear him did you not say that this woman's death is due to poison it certainly looks like it a post-mortem will the arrest interrupting the doctor monsieur agram went up to jacques dollon in the exercise of your profession monsieur do you not make use of various poisons of which you have a reserve supply here that is so confirmed jacques dollon in a faint voice but it is a very long time since i employed any of them very good monsieur monsieur agram now made madame bejou leave the room he asked her to transmit an order to his policeman they were to drive back the crowd soon a cab brought by a constable entered the close and drew up before the door of number six jacques dollon supported by two people descended and entered the cab immediately a rumour spread that he had been arrested the rumour was correct our inquiry silence at police headquarters probable motives of the crime such are the details referring to this strange affair which we have been able to procure from those who were present but the motives which determined the arrest of monsieur dollon are obscure there are however two suspicious facts the first is the puncture made in monsieur jacques dollon's left leg this puncture is aggravated by a scratch according to the doctors soporific injected into the human body by the de Prava's syringe acts violently and efficaciously it is beyond a doubt that monsieur jacques dollon has been rendered unconscious in this manner to begin with the painter's first version was considered the true one namely that he had been surprised by robbers who rendered him unconscious but on reflection this explanation would not hold water murderous house thieves do not send people to sleep 
they kill them add to this that nothing has been stolen from monsieur dollon therefore mere robbery was not the motive of the crime besides monsieur dollon maintained that he was alone yet at the time madame de vibray was in his studio and was there precisely because the artist had asked her to come we know that the baroness de vibray who was very wealthy took a particular interest in this young man and his sister we should consider ourselves to blame did we not remind our readers that the names of these personages dolan vibray implicated in the drama of the rue norvon have already figured in the chronicles of crimes both recent and celebrated thus the assassination of the marquise de langrune cannot have been forgotten an assassination which has remained a mystery which was perpetrated a few years ago and brought into prominence the personalities of monsieur rambert and the charming therese avernois madame de vibray who has just been so tragically done to death was an intimate friend of the marquise de langrune monsieur jacques delon is a son of madame de langrune's old steward we do not of course pretend to connect in any way whatever the drama of the rue norvon with the bygone drama which ended in the execution of gurn but we cannot pass over in silence the strange coincidence that within the space of a few years the same halo of mystery surrounds the same group of individuals footnote one see fantomas but let us return to our narrative monsieur jacques dollon interrogated by the superintendent of police declared that he very rarely made use of the poisons locked up in the little cupboard of his studio notwithstanding this it was discovered during the course of the perquisition that one of the files containing poison had been recently opened and that traces of the powder were still to be found on the floor this powder is now being analyzed whilst the faculty are engaged in a post-mortem examination of the unfortunate victim's body but at the present moment everything leads to the belief that there does not exist an immediate and certain link between this poison and the sudden death of the baroness de vibray it might easily be supposed and this we believe is the view taken at police headquarters that for a motive as yet unknown a motive the judicial examination will certainly bring to light the artist has poisoned his patroness and in order to put the authorities on the wrong scent perhaps he hoped she would leave the studio before the death agony commenced he has devised this species of tableau invented the story of the masked man in fact the doctor who first attended him has declared that the puncture clumsily made might very well have been done by jacques dollon himself it is worth noting that not a soul saw the baroness de vibray enter monsieur dollon's house yesterday evening as a rule she comes in her motor-car and all the neighbourhood can hear her arrival it seems evident that jacques dollon will abandon the line of defence he has adopted it can hardly be described as rational there is little doubt but that we shall have sensational revelations regarding the crime of the rue norvon last hour mademoiselle elizabeth dollon to whom police headquarters has telegraphed that a serious accident has happened to her brother has sent a reply telegram from lausanne to the effect that she will return to-night the unfortunate girl is probably ignorant of all that has occurred nevertheless we believe that two detectives have left at once for the frontier where they will meet her and shadow her as far as paris in case she should get news on the way of what had occurred and should either attempt to escape or make an attempt on her life decidedly to-morrow promises to be a day full of vicissitudes this article published on the first page of la capitale was signed jerome fondor end of chapter one Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 2 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 2 Tomary's two loves two days before the sinister drama details of which jerome fandor had given in la capitale the smart little town-house inhabited by the baroness de vibray 
in the avenue henri martin assumed a festive appearance this did not surprise her neighbors for they knew the owner of this charming residence was very much a woman of the world whose reception rooms were constantly open to the many distinguished parisians forming her circle of acquaintances it was seven in the evening when the baroness dressed for dinner passed from her own room into the small drawing-room adjoining crossing a carpet so thick and soft that it deadened the sound of footsteps she pressed the button of an electric bell beside the fireplace a major-domo of the most correct appearance presented himself the baroness rang for me madame de vibray who had instinctively sought the flattering approval of her mirror half turned i wish to know if anyone called this afternoon antoine for the baroness of course she replied a note of impatience in her voice i want to know if anyone called to see me this afternoon no madame no one has telephoned from the barbey natul bank no madame repressing a slight feeling of annoyance madame de vibray changed the subject you will have dinner served as soon as the guests arrive they will not be later than half-past seven i suppose antoine bowed solemnly vanished into the anteroom and from thence gained the servants hall madame de vibray quitted the small drawing-room traversing the great gallery with its glass roof encircling the staircase she entered the dining-room covers were laid for three inspecting the table arrangements with the eye of a mistress of the house she straightened the line of some plates gave a touch of distinction to the flowers scattered over the table in a conventional disorder then she went to the sideboard where the major-domo had left a china pot filled with flowers with a slight shrug the baroness carried the pot to its usual place a marble column at the further end of the room it was fortunate i came to see how things were antoine is a good fellow but a hare-brained one too thought she madame de vibray paused a moment the light from an electric lamp shone on the vase and wonderfully enhanced its glittering beauty it was a piece of faience decorated in the best taste on its graceful form the artist had traced the lines of an old colour print and had scrupulously preserved the picture born of an eighteenth-century artist's imagination with its brilliancy of tone and soft background of tender grey madame de vibray could not tear herself away from the contemplation of it not only did the design and the treatment please her but she also felt a kind of maternal affection for the artist this dear jacques she murmured has decidedly a great deal of talent and i like to think that in a short time his reputation her reflections were interrupted by the servant the good antoine announced in a low voice and with a touch of respectful reproach in his tone monsieur thomery awaits the baroness in the small drawing-room he has been waiting ten minutes very well i am coming madame de vibray whose movements were all harmonious grace returned by way of the gallery to greet her guest she paused on the threshold of the small drawing-room smiling graciously framed in the dark drapery of the heavy door curtains the soft light from globes of ground glass falling on her the baroness de vibray appeared a very attractive woman still her figure had retained its youthful slenderness her neck white as milk was as round and fresh as a girl's and had the hair about her forehead and temples not been turning grey the baroness wore it powdered a piece of coquettish affection on her part she would not have looked a day more than thirty monsieur thomery rose hastily and advanced to meet her he kissed her hand with a gallant air my dear matilda he declared with an admiring glance you are decidedly an exquisite woman the baroness replied by a glance in which there was something ambiguous something of ironical mockery how are you norbert she asked in an affectionate tone and those pains they seated themselves on a low couch and began to discuss their respective aches and pains in a friendly fashion whilst listening to his complaints madame de vibray could not but admire his remarkable vigour his air of superb health his looks gave the lie to his words 
about fifty-five monsieur norbert Tomery seemed to be in the plenitude of his powers his premature baldness was redeemed by the vivacity of his dark brown eyes also by his long thick moustache probably dyed he looked like an old soldier he was the last of the great Tomery family who for many generations had been sugar refiners his was a personality well known in parisian society always first at his office or his factories as soon as night fell he became the man of the world frequenting fashionable drawing-rooms theatrical first nights official receptions and balls in the aristocratic circles of the faubourg saint germain remarkably handsome extremely rich Tomery had had many love affairs gossips had it that between him and madame de vibray there had existed a tender intimacy and for once gossip was right but they had been tactful had respected the conventions whilst their irregular union had lasted though now a thing of the past for Tomery had sought other loves his passion for the baroness had changed to a calm strong semi-brotherly affection whilst madame de vibray retained a more lively a more tender feeling for the man whom she had known as the most gallant of lovers Tomery suddenly ceased talking of his rheumatism but my dear friend i do not see that pretty smile which is your greatest charm how is that madame de vibray looked sad her beautiful eyes gazed deep into those of Tomery. ah oh, she murmured one cannot be eternally smiling life sometimes holds painful surprises in store for us is something worrying you Tomery's tone was one of anxious sympathy yes and no was her evasive reply there was a silence then she said it is always the same thing i have no hesitation in telling you that you my old friend it is a money wound happily it is not mortal Tomery nodded well i declare it is just what i expected my poor matilda are you never going to be sensible the baroness pouted you know quite well i am sensible only it happens that there are moments when one is short of cash yesterday i asked my bankers to send me fifty thousand francs and i have not heard a word from them that is no great matter the barbie nature credit cannot be shaken oh cried the baroness i have no fears on that score but as a rule their delay in sending me what i ask for is of the briefest yet no one has come from them to-day Tomery began scolding her gently ah matilde that you should be in such pressing need of so large a sum must mean that you have been drawn into some deplorable speculation i will wager that you invested in those oral copper mines after all i thought the shares were going up was madame de vibray's excuse she lowered her eyes like a naughty schoolgirl caught in the act Tomery, who had risen and was walking up and down the room halted in front of her i do beg of you to consult those who know all the ins and outs persons competent to advise you when you are bent on plunging into speculations of this description the barbey nantour people can give you reliable information i myself you know but since it is really of no importance interrupted madame de vibray who had no wish to listen to the remonstrances of her too prudent friend what does it matter it is my only diversion now i love gambling the emotions it arouses in one the perpetual hopes and fears it excites Tomery was about to reply to argue to remonstrate further but the baroness had caught him glancing at the clock hanging beside the fireplace i am making you dine late she said in a tone of apology then with a touch of malice and looking up at Tomery from under her eyes to see how he took it you are to be rewarded for having to wait i have invited princess sonia danidov to dine with you Tomery started he frowned he again seated himself beside the baroness you have invited her yes and why not i believe this pretty woman is one of your special friends that you consider her the most charming of all your friends now Tomery did not take up the challenge he simply said i had an idea that the princess was not much to your taste the eyes of madame vibray flashed a sad strange look on her old friend as she said gently one can accustom oneself to anything and everything my dear friend besides i quite recognize that the princess deserves the reputation she enjoys of being wonderfully beautiful and also intellectual Tomery did not reply to this he looked puzzled annoyed 
the baroness continued they even say that handsome bachelor monsieur thomery is not indifferent to her fascinations that for the first time in his life he is ready to link oh as for that thomery was protesting when the door opened and the princess sonia danidov rustled into the room a superbly a dazzlingly beautiful vision all audacity and charm accept my apologies dear baroness she cried for arriving so late but the streets are crowded and i live such a long way out added madame de vibray you live in a charming part amended the princess then catching sight of thomery why you she cried and with a gracious and dignified gesture the princess extended her hand which the wealthy sugar refiner hastened to kiss at this moment the double doors were flung wide and antoine with his most solemn air his most stiff starched manner announced dinner is served no cried she smiling while she refused the arm offered by her old friend take in the princess dear friend i will follow by myself thomery obeyed he passed slowly along the gallery into the dining-room with the princess behind them came the baroness who watched them as they went thomery big muscular broad-shouldered sonya danidov slim pliant refined dainty checking a deep sigh the baroness could not help thinking and her heart ached at the thought what a fine couple they would make what a fine couple they will make but as she seated herself opposite her guests she said to herself bah i must send sad thoughts flying it is high time my dear thomery she cried playfully i wish i expect you to show yourself the most charming of men to your delicious neighbour ten o'clock had struck before madame vibray and her guests left the dinner-table and proceeded to the small drawing-room thomery was allowed to smoke in their presence besides the princess had accepted a turkish cigarette and the baroness had allowed herself a liqueur a most excellent dinner and choice wines had loosened tongues and in accordance with a pre-arranged plan madame de vibray had directed the conversation imperceptibly into the channels she wished it to follow thus she learned what she had feared to know namely that a very serious flirtation had been going on for some time between thomery and the princess that between this beautiful and wealthy young widow and the millionaire sugar refiner the flirtation was rapidly developing into something much warmer and more lasting so far the final stage had evidently not been reached nevertheless thomery had suggested tentatively that he would like to give a grand ball when he took possession of the new house which he was having built for himself in the parc monceau and had he not been so extremely anxious to secure a partner for the cotillion which he meant to lead then madame vibray had suggested that the person obviously fitted to play this important part was the princess sonia danidov who better the suggestion was welcomed by both it was settled there and then yes thought the baroness thomery's marriage is practically arranged that is evident well i must resign myself to the inevitable it was about half-past eleven when sonia danidov rose to take leave of her hostess thomery hesitating looked first at his old friend then at the princess asking himself what he ought to do madame de vibray felt secretly grateful to him for this momentary hesitation as a woman whose mourning for a dead love is over she spoke out bravely dear friend said she surely you are not going to let the princess return alone i hope she will allow you to see her safely home the princess pressed the hands of her generous hostess she was radiant what a good kind friend you are she cried in an outburst of sincere affection then with a questioning glance in which there was a touch of uneasiness a slight hesitation she said ah do let me kiss you for all reply madame vibray opened her arms the two women clung together sealing with their kiss the treaty of peace both wished to keep when the humming of the motor-car which bore off the princess and thomery had died away in the distance madame de vibray retired to her room a tear rolled down her cheek a little bit of my heart has gone with them she murmured the poor woman sighed deeply ah it is my whole heart that has gone there was a discreet knock at the door she mastered her emotion it was the dignified mistress of the house who said quietly come in it was antoine who presented two letters on a silver platter 
he explained that believing his mistress to be anxiously awaiting some news he had ventured to bring up the last post at this late hour after bidding antoine good night she recalled him to say please tell the maid not to come up i shall not require her i can manage by myself madame de vibray went toward the little writing-table which stood in one corner of her room in leisurely fashion she sat down and proceeded to open her letters with a wearied air why it's from that nice jacques delon she exclaimed as she read the first letter she opened i was thinking of him at this very minute yes she went on as she read i will certainly pay him a visit soon madame de vibray put jacques delon's letter in her handbag recognizing on the back of the second letter the initials b n which she knew to be the discreet superscription on the business paper of her bankers monsieur's barbe nantil it was long and closely written in a fine regular hand when she began to read it her attention was wandering for her mind was full of sonia danidoff and thomery and what she had ascertained regarding their relation to each other but little by little she became absorbed in what she was reading till her whole attention was taken captive as she read on however her eyes opened more and more widely there was a look of keenest anguish in them her features contracted as if in pain her bosom heaved her fingers were trembling under the stress of some intense emotion oh my god ah my god she gasped out several times in a half-choked voice Silence had reigned for a long while in the smart townhouse of the Baroness de Vibray in the avenue Henri Martin. From without came no sound. The avenue was quiet, deserted. The night was dark. But when three o'clock struck, the bedroom of Madame de Vibray was still flooded with light. She had not left her writing-table since she had read the letter of her bankers, Monsieur's Barbe Nantul. She wrote on and on, without intermission. End of chapter 2 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 3 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 3 unexpected complications at nine o'clock in the morning the staff of that great evening paper la capitale were assembled in the vast editorial room writing out their copy in the midst of a perfect hubbub of continual comings and goings of regular shindies of perpetual discussions a stranger entering this room which among its frequenters went by the name of the wild beasts cage might easily have thought he was witnessing some thirty schoolboys at play in recreation time instead of being in the presence of famous journalists celebrated for their reports and articles jerome fandor had no sooner appeared on the threshold than he was accorded a variety of greetings ironical cordial fault-finding sympathetic but he ignored them all for like most of those who came into the editorial room at this hour he was preoccupied with one thing only where the caprice of his editorial secretary would send him flying for news in the course of a few minutes on what difficult and delicate task would he be dispatched it depended on the exigencies of passing events on how questions of the hour struck the editorial secretary in relation to fandor just as he had expected the editorial secretary called him hey fandor come in here a minute i'm on the make-up what have you got for today i don't know who has charge of the landing of the king of spain moray he has just left have you seen the last issue of le boss here it is the two men ran rapidly through the night's telegrams deplorably empty remarked the editorial secretary but where am i to send you ah now i have it that article of yours on the rue norvons affair yesterday evening was interesting it made the others squirm i know isn't there anything more to be got out of that story what do you want can't you stick in something just a little bit scandalous about the baroness de vibray or about delon about no matter whom in fact after all it's our one and only crime to-day and you must put in something under that head jerome fandor seemed to hesitate would you like me to rake up the past refer to what happened before 
what passed come now you must have an inkling of what i refer to not i ah my dear fellow it will not be the first time we have had to mention these personages in our columns just cast your mind back to the gurn affair ah the drama in which a great lady was implicated to her detriment lady lady beltham you have got it these delans jacques and elizabeth did you know it happened to be the children of old delan who was murdered in the train an extraordinary murder when on his way to paris to give evidence in the gurn case why of course i remember perfectly declared the editorial secretary dolan the father was the marquise de langrune's steward the old lady was murdered isn't that so that's it but after the death of his mistress he entered the service of the baroness de vibray she who was assassinated yesterday well i must say they have not been favoured by fortune said the secretary jokingly but look here fandor like father like son eh if this young dolan has murdered madame de vibray doesn't that make you think that his father was the murderer of the marquise de langrune jerome fandor shook his head no old boy yesterday's crime was ordinary even commonplace but the assassination of the marquise de langrune on the contrary gave the police no end of bother they did not find out anything did they why yes don't you remember naturally enough it must all seem rather remote to you but i have all the details as clearly in mind as if they had happened only yesterday the gurn affair was one of the first i had a hand in with juba it was in connection with that very affair i made my start here on la capitale footnote two see fantomas fandor grew pale and you were jolly proud of it eh fandor good heavens how you did hold forth about this juba and you regularly fed us up with this villain so mysterious so extraordinary who was never run to earth could not be captured was capable of the most inhuman cruelties capable of devising the most unimaginable tricks and stratagems this fantomas fandor grew pale my dear fellow said he never speak sneeringly or jokingly of fantomas no doubt it is taken for granted by the public at any rate that fantomas is an invention of juba and myself that fantomas never existed and that because this monster who is a man of genius has never been identified because not a soul has been able to lay hands on him and because as you know this fruitless pursuit has cost poor juba his life the truth is this famous detective died a foul death no you are mistaken juba died on the field of honour when after a terribly difficult and dangerous investigation he succeeded by this time it was no longer the gurn fantomas affair but that of the boulevard Inkerman at newly in cornering fantomas he was well aware that he risked his life in entering the bandit's abode what happened was that the villain found means to blow up the house and to bury juba underneath the ruins fantomas has proved the stronger but according to my ideas juba has had none the less the finest death he could desire death in the midst of the fight a useful death footnote three see the exploits of juba useful in what way my dear fellow cried fandor in a tone of vigorous denial in the opinion of all unprejudiced minds the death of juba has proved proved up to the hilt the existence of fantomas more it has forced this villain to disappear it has restored peace tranquillity to society at the cost of his life juba has scored a final triumph he has deprived fantomas of the power to do harm pared his claws in fact the truth is he is never mentioned now by a soul for all that fandor only to see you smile why and the editorial secretary shook a threatening finger at his colleague i'll wager you still believe in fantomas that one fine day you will write us a rattling good article announcing some fresh fantomas crime jerome fandor made no direct reply to this it was useless to try and convince those who had not closely followed the records of crimes perpetrated during recent years you could not make them believe in the existence of fantomas fandor knew but juva dead was there another soul who could know the true facts all he said was well my dear fellow this does not tell us what we are to fill up the paper with now if the doings connected with fantomas are frightful rousing our feelings in the highest degree i repeat that yesterday's crime bears no resemblance to them we can put in a paragraph or so that is all no way is there of compromising any one with our baroness de vibray 
i don't think so it's a perfectly commonplace affair an elderly woman patronizes a young painter whose mistress she may or may not be and she ends up by getting herself assassinated when the young man imagines he is mentioned in her will ah good well i think you will have to fall back on the opening of the artesian well that suits you oh quite all right if you like i can give you my copy in half an hour i know who are going to speak at the inauguration ceremony and i can add names this evening you know i am a bit of a specialist as regards reports written beforehand fondor had got well on with his article at the rate he was going he would have finished that morning he thought with pleasure and would have a free afternoon just then an office boy appeared monsieur fondor you are being asked for at the telephone like most journalists fondor was accustomed to reply in nine cases out of ten in similar cases that he was not to be found on this occasion however some interior prompting made him say i will come a few minutes later fondor went up to the editorial secretary look here old fellow something unexpected has happened i must go to the palais de justice you don't want me for anything else this morning do you no go along but what's up oh this jacques dollon you know the assassin of the rue norvans well this imbecile has gone and hanged himself in his cell at the exit door of la capitale in the noisy rue montmartre crowded with costermongers barrows jerome fandor hailed a taxi to the palais some minutes later he was crossing the wall of the wandering footsteps as it is called giving rapid cordial greetings to all the barristers of his acquaintance one never knew when they might impart a special piece of information which let an enterprising journalist into the know or put him early on to a good thing and finally reached the lobbies of the law courts proper he was saying to himself as he went along he is a good fellow jouet the news is not known yet he telephoned me first his friend jouet met him with a warm handshake you did not seem to be in a good temper at the telephone just now although i was giving you a nice bit of information yes retorted fandor but information which simply proved how much the administrators of justice to which you have the misfortune to belong can make egregious mistakes when for once you succeed in immediately arresting the assassin of someone well known and are in a position to bring into play all the power and rigour of the law you are clumsy enough to give the fellow a chance of punishing himself you let him commit suicide on the very first night of his arrest fandor had been speaking in a fairly loud voice as usual but at imperative signs made by his friend he lowered his tones what is it he murmured his friend rose what we are going to do old boy is to take a turn in the galleries i have something to say to you and joking apart you are not to breathe a word of it to a soul Shh. count on me presently the two friends found themselves in one of the corridors of the palais known only to barristers and those accused of law-breaking come now cried fandor your assassin has hanged himself hasn't he my assassin expostulated the junior barrister my assassin allow me to inform you that jacques dollon is innocent innocent jerome fandor shrugged a disbelieving shoulder innocent it is the fashion of the day to transform all murderers into innocents what ground have you for making such a declaration of innocence here is my ground i have just copied it out for you read fandor hastened to read the paper handed to him by his friend it was headed thus copy of a letter brought by maitre guerin to the public prosecutor a letter addressed to maitre guerin by the baroness de vibray oh it's a plant cried fandor go on reading you will see fandor continued my dear maitre you will forgive me i am certain of that for all the inconvenience i am going to cause you i turn to you because you are the only friend in whom i have confidence i have just received a letter from my bankers messieurs barbet nantoul of whom i have often spoke to you who you know manage all my money affairs for me this letter informs me that i am ruined you quite understand absolutely completely ruined the house i am living in my carriage the luxurious surroundings so necessary to me i shall have to give it all up so they tell me these people have dealt me a terrible blow struck me brutally my dear maitre i learned this only two hours ago and i am still stunned by it i do not wish to wait for the inevitable moment when i shall begin to console myself because i shall begin to hope that the disaster is exaggerated 
i have no family i am already old apart from the satisfaction it gives me to use my influence on behalf of youthful talent and to help forward its development my life has no sense in it it is without aim or object my dear maitre there are not two ways of announcing to one's friends resolutions analogous to that i now take when you receive this letter i shall be dead i have in front of me on my writing-table a tiny phial of poison which i am going to drink to the last drop without any weakening of will almost without fear as soon as i have posted this letter to you myself i must confess that i have an instinctive horror of being dragged to the morgue as happens whenever there is some doubt about a suicide it is on account of this i now write to you so that thanks to your intervention all the mistakes justice is liable to make may be avoided i kill myself i only that is certain no one must be incriminated in connection with my death if it be not fatality which has caused my ruin i once more apologize my dear maitre for all the measures you will be forced to take owing to my death and i beg you to believe that my friendship for you was very sincere signed baroness de vibray good for you cried fandor here's a go what a pretty petard and prospect jacques dollon was innocent you arrest him he is so terrified that he hangs himself well old boy i must say you make some fine blunders on clock quay it is nobody's fault protested the young barrister that is to say retorted fandor it is everybody's fault by jove if you let innocent prisoners hang themselves in their cells i am no longer surprised that you leave the guilty at liberty to walk the streets at their sweet will don't make a joke of it old boy you understand of course that so far no one in the palais has seen the letter it has just been brought to the public prosecutor's office by madame de vibray's solicitor maitre Guerin you came on the scene only a few minutes after i had sent up the original to the examining magistrate the case is in fusilier's hands as he in his office certainly certainly he should proceed with the examination relative to poor dollon this morning very well then i will go up i shall jolly soon get out of this booby of a fusilier the information i need to make one of the best reports i have ever written and you know i am ever so obliged to you for the matter you've given me but mind you i am going to put together a bit of copy that will not deal tenderly with our gentlemen of the robe the lot of you no it is a bad unlucky business enough but it is even more funny it is tragic comedy for my part began fandor's barrister friend yes yes good day pontius pilate cried fandor i am going up to fusilier we must meet to-morrow Hastening along the corridors, Fondor gained the office of the examining magistrate. Fondor had known the magistrate a long while. Was not Fusilier the justice who, with Detective Juve, had had everything to do with the strangely mysterious cases associated with the name of Fantomas? In the course of his various judicial examinations, he had often been able to give Fondor information and help. At first hostile to the constant preoccupation of Juve and Fondor, for long the arrest of fantomas was their one aim the young magistrate had gradually come to believe in what had seemed to him nothing but the detective's hypothesis open-minded gifted with an alert intelligence fusilier had carefully followed the investigations of juva and fandor he knew every detail every vicissitude connected with the tracking of this elusive bandit since then the magistrate had taken the deepest interest in the pursuit of the criminal thanks to his support juva had been enabled to take various measures otherwise almost impossible avoid the many obstacles offered by legal procedure risk the striking of many a blow he could not otherwise have ventured on fusilier had a high opinion of juva and his attitude to fandor was sympathetic our journalist was going over the past as he hastened along ah if only juva were here if only this loyal servant of justice this sincerest of friends this bravest of the brave had not been struck down fandor would have been full of enthusiasm for the dolan affair for its interest was increasing its mystery deepening but fandor was single-handed now he had had a miraculous escape from the bomb which had blown up lady beltham's house on that tragic day when juva had all but laid hands on fantomas but fandor would not allow himself to become disheartened never that in the school of his vanished friend he had learned to give himself up with single-minded devotion to any task he took up his sole satisfaction being duty well fulfilled well the dolan case should be cleared up 
to do so was to render a service to humanity having come to this conclusion he hastened to interview monsieur fuselier monsieur fuselier cried fandor as he shook hands with the magistrate you must know quite well why i have come to see you about the rue norvans affair say rather about the depot affair it is there the affair became tragic monsieur fuselier smiled you know then that jacques dollon has hanged himself yes that he was innocent again yes confessed fandor smiling in his turn you know that at la capitale we get all the information going and are the first to get it evidently conceded the magistrate but if you know all about it why put my professional discretion to the torture by asking absurd questions now what the deuce are they on about on clock quay don't they supervise the accused in their cells certainly they do when this delon arrived at the depot he was immediately conducted to monsieur bertillon there he was measured and tested finger marks taken and so on just so said fandor i saw bertillon before coming on to you he told me delon seemed crushed he submitted to all the tests without making the slightest objection but he never spoke of suicide never said anything which could lead one to imagine such a fatal termination well he would not cry it aloud on the housetops when he left monsieur bertillon what then after oh the police took him to a cell and left him there at midnight the chief warder made his rounds and saw nothing abnormal it was in the morning they found this unfortunate delon had hanged himself what did he hang himself with with strips of his shirt twisted into a rope oh my dear fellow i see what you are thinking you fancy that there has been a want of common prudence that the warders were lax that they had let him retain his braces his cravat or his shoelaces well it was not so precautions were taken and this suicide remains incomprehensible well this wretched youth must have been ferociously energetic because he had fastened these shirt ropes of his to the iron bars of his bed and strangled himself by lying on his back death must have been long in coming to release him from his agony can i not see him asked fandor why not photograph him asked the magistrate in a bantering tone oh if it were possible fandor stopped short a youth knocked and entered the lady wishes to see you monsieur tell her i am too busy she asked me to say it, that it is urgent ask her name here is her card monsieur monsieur fuselier looked at the card he started elizabeth dollon ah good news what am i to say to this poor girl how am i to tell her just then the door was pushed violently open and a girl in tears rushed toward him monsieur where is my brother but mademoiselle whilst the magistrate mechanically asked his distracted visitor to sit down jerome fandor discreetly withdrew to the further side of the room he was anxious that the magistrate should forget his presence so that he might be a witness of what promised to be a most exciting interview pray control yourself mademoiselle begged the magistrate your brother has perhaps been arrested through a mistake oh monsieur i am sure of it but it is frightful mademoiselle the dreadful thing would be that he was guilty but they have not set him at liberty yet he has not been able to clear himself yes yes mademoiselle he has vindicated himself i even monsieur fuselier stopped short intensely pained not knowing how to tell elizabeth delon the terrible news at once she cried ah oh, monsieur you hesitate you have learned something fresh you are on the track of assassins it is certain your brother is not guilty the poor girl's countenance suddenly brightened she had passed a horrible night after her return to paris and the receipt of the wire from police headquarters what a nightmare she cried but the telegram said he was injured nothing serious is it where is he now can i see him mademoiselle said the magistrate your brother has had a terrible shock it would be better i fear that suddenly elizabeth dollon cried oh monsieur how you said that how can seeing me do him harm as monsieur fuselier did not reply she burst into tears you are hiding something from me the papers said this morning that he also was a victim swear to me that he is not but you are hiding something from me the poor girl was frantic with terror she wrung her hands in a state of despair where is he i must see him oh take pity on me as she watched the magistrate's downcast look his air of discomfiture the horrid truth flashed on elizabeth dollon dead she cried she was shaken with sobs 
mademoiselle oh mademoiselle implored the magistrate filled with pity he tried to find some words of consolation and this confirmed her worst fears i swear to you it is certain your brother was not guilty the distracted girl was beyond listening to the magistrate's words huddled up in an armchair she lay inert collapsed presently she rose like a person moving in some mad dream her eyes wild take me to him i want to see him they have killed him for me i must see him such was her insistence the violence with which she claimed the right to go to her brother to kneel beside him that monsieur fuselier dared not refuse her this consolation control yourself i beg of you i am going to take you to him but for heaven's sake be reasonable control yourself with his eyes he sought for the moral support of fandor whose presence he suddenly remembered but our journalist taking advantage of the momentary confusion had quietly slipped from the room evidently some unpleasant occurrence had upset the routine existence of the functionaries at the depot the warders were coming and going talking among themselves leaning against the doors of the numerous cells the chief warder called one of his men there must be no more of this disorder nibet the chief warder was furious he was about to hold forth to this subordinate when an inspector approached what is it he asked sergeant it is monsieur jouet he has a gentleman with him he has a permit shall i allow him to enter who monsieur jouet no the gentleman accompanying him hang it all why yes if he has a permit the sergeant moved away shrugging his shoulders disgustedly not pleased with things this morning the chief isn't one of the warders marked not likely after last night's performance it is he who will catch it hot over this business the warder rubbed his hands laughing meanwhile fandor had appeared at the entrance of the corridor under the guidance of a warder he was thinking of the splendid copy he had secured he was hoping that when fusilier learned that a journalist had obtained admittance to the depot and had seen the corpse of jacques dollon in his cell that he would not turn vicious but after all he said to himself fusilier is not the man to give me the go-by out of spite fandor walked up and down the hall of the prison he had informed the warders that he was waiting for the magistrate how strange life is thought he to think that once again i should be brought into close contact with elizabeth dollon and that there is no likelihood of her recognizing me we were such children when we parted she especially had she any recollection of the little rascal i was at the time of poor madame de langrune's assassination and closing his eyes fondor tried to call to mind the features of the jacques dollon he used to know it was useless the body of jacques dollon he would be gazing at in a few minutes would be that of an unknown person whose name alone awakened memories of bygone days so to pass the time fandor continued his marching up and down monsieur fuselier appeared at the entrance to the depot supporting the unsteady steps of poor elizabeth dollon fandor quickly drew back into an obscure corner better not attract any attention to myself just at present thought fandor i will wait until the cell door is opened if fusilier does not wish to give me permission to remain i can at any rate cast a rapid glance round that ill-omened little cell fandor followed at a distance the wavering steps of the poor girl whom monsieur fusilier was supporting with fatherly care when they paused before one of the cells pointed out by the head warder monsieur fusilier turned to elizabeth dollon do you think you are strong enough to bear this trial mademoiselle you are determined to see your brother elizabeth bent her head the magistrate turned toward the warder open said he as the key was turned in the lock he said according to instructions from the head we have placed him on his bed again there is nothing to frighten you he seems to be asleep now then but as he opened the door stretching his arm in the direction of the bed where the body of jacques delon should be an oath escaped him great heavens the dead man is gone in his cell with its bare walls its sole furniture an iron bedstead and a stool riveted to the floor in this little cell which the eye could glance round in a second there was no vestige of a corpse jacques dollon's body was not there you have mistaken the cell said the magistrate sharply no no cried the astounded warder you can see can't you that jacques dollon is not there he was there a few minutes ago then he must have taken him somewhere else the keys have never left me oh come now no sir he was there now he isn't there that's all i know hey you down there yelled the warder who knows what has become of the corpse of cell twelve the corpse we laid out just now 
one after the other the warders came running all confirmed what their chief had said the dead body of jacques delon had been left there lying on the bed not a soul had entered the cell not a soul had touched the corpse yet it was no longer there jerome fandor well in the background followed the scene with an ironical smile the frantic warders the growing stupefaction of monsieur fusilier amused him prodigiously the magistrate was trying to understand the how the why and wherefore of this incredible disappearance as this man is not here he cannot have been dead he has escaped but if he wanted to escape he must have been guilty oh i cannot make head or tail of it seizing the head warder by the shoulders almost roughly monsieur fusilier asked look here chief was this man dead or was he not elizabeth dollon was repeating he lives he lives and laughing wildly the warder raised his hand as though taking a solemn oath as to being dead he was dead right enough the doctor will tell you so too also my colleague favril who helped me lay out the body on the bed but how can a dead body get away from here if he was dead he could not have escaped said the magistrate it is witchcraft declared the warder with a shrug fusilier flew into a rage had you not better confess that you and your colleagues did not keep proper watch and ward the investigation will show on whose shoulders the responsibility rests but sakes alive monsieur expostulated the warder there aren't only two of us who have seen him dead there are all the hospital attendants of the depot as well there is the doctor and there are my colleagues to be counted on the truth is monsieur some fifty persons have seen him dead so you say cried the impatient magistrate i am going to inform the public prosecutor of what has happened and at once as he was hurrying away he espied jerome fandor who had not missed a single detail of the scene you again exclaimed the irate magistrate how did you get in here by permit replied our journalist well you have learned what there is to know haven't you be off then you are one too many here frankly there is no need for you to augment the scandal will you therefore be kind enough to take yourself off and fusilier almost beside himself with rage raced off to the public prosecutor's office after the magistrate's furious attack fandor could not possibly linger in the corridors of the depot the warders too were pressing their attentions on him and on elizabeth dollon this way monsieur madame this way ah it's a wretched business here this way this way be off as fast as you can presently fandor was descending the grand staircase of the palais studying the uncertain steps of poor elizabeth dollon i implore you to help me she cried help me help us my brother is guiltless i could swear to that he must must be found this hideous nightmare must end mademoiselle i ask nothing but her only where to find him ah i have no idea none i implore you you who must know influential people in high places do not leave any stone unturned do all that is humanly possible to save him to save us intensely moved by the poor girl's anguish of mind fandor could not trust himself to speak he bent his head in the affirmative merely hailing a cab he put her into it gave the address to the driver and as he was closing the door elizabeth cried do all that is humanly possible do everything in the world i swear to you i will get at the truth was fandor's parting promise the cab had disappeared but our journalist stood motionless absorbed in his reflections at last uttering his thoughts aloud he said if the baroness de vibray has written that she has killed herself then she has killed herself and delon is innocent it's true the letter may be fictitious therefore we must put it aside we have no guarantee as to its genuineness here is the problem jacques delon is dead and yet has left the depot yes but how jerome fandor went off in the direction of the offices of la capitale so absorbed in thought that he jostled the passers-by without noticing the angry glances bestowed on him jacques delon dead has left the depot he repeated this improbable statement so absurd of necessity incorrect repeated it to the point of satiety jacques dollon is dead and he has got away from the depot then in an illuminating flash he perceived the solution of this apparently insoluble problem a mystery such as this is incomprehensible inexplicable impossible except in connection with one man there is only one individual in the world capable of making a dead man seem to be alive after his death and this individual is fantomas to formulate this conclusion was to give himself a thrilling shock since the disappearance of juva he had never had occasion to suspect the presence 
the intervention of fantomas in connection with any of the crimes he had investigated as reporter and student of human nature fantomas the sound of that name evoked the worst horrors fantomas this bandit this criminal who has not shrunk from any cruelty any horror fantomas is crime personified fantomas he sticks at nothing pronouncing these syllables of evil omen fondor lived over again all the extraordinary improbable impossible things that had really happened and had put him on the watch for this terrifying assassin fantomas it was certain that to whatever degree he had participated in the assassination of the baroness de vibray one must not be astonished at anything neither at anything inconceivable nor at any mysterious details connected with the murder fantomas he was the daring criminal daring beyond all bounds of credibility and whatever might be the dexterity the ingenuity the ability the devotion of those who were pursuing him such were his tricks such his craft and cunning such the fertility of his invention so well conceived his devices so great his audacity that there were grounds for fearing he would never be brought to justice and punished for his abominable crimes fantomas ah if life ever brought jerome fandor and this bandit face to face there would ensue a struggle of every hour day and moment a struggle of the most terrible nature a struggle in which man was pitted against man a struggle without pity without mercy a fight to the death fantomas would assuredly defend himself with all the immense elusive powers at his command jerome fandor would pursue him with heart and soul with his very life itself it was not only to satisfy his sense of duty at the promptings of honour that the journalist would take action he would have as a guide for his acts and to animate his will the passion of hate and the hope of avenging his friend juba fallen a victim to the mysterious blows of fantomas in his article for la capitale fandor did not directly mention the possible participation of fantomas in the crime of the rue Norvans. when it was finished he returned to his modest little flat on the fifth floor in the rue bergere he was about to enter the vestibule when he noticed a piece of paper which must have been slipped under his door he stooped and picked up an envelope why it is a letter and there is no name and no stamp on it entering his study he seated himself at his table and prepared to begin work then he bethought him of the letter which he had carelessly thrown on the mantelpiece he tore it open and drew out a sheet of letter paper whatever is this he cried his astonishment was natural enough for the message was oddly put together to prevent his handwriting being recognized fondor's correspondent had cut letters out of a newspaper and had stuck them together in the desired order the two or three lines of printed matter were as follows jerome fondor pay attention great attention the affair on which you are concentrating all your powers is worthy of all possible interest but may have terribly dangerous consequences of course there was no signature evidently the warning referred to the delon case why exclaimed fandor this is simply an invitation not to busy myself hunting for the guilty persons who has sent this invitation and warning surely the sender is the assassin to whose interest it is that the inquiry into the rue norvans murder should be dropped it must be jacques delon but how could delon know my address how could he have found time between his flight from the depot and the present minute to put this message of printed letters together and take it to the rue bergere and that at the risk of encountering someone who could recognize him and might have him arrested afresh had he accomplices fandor was puzzled agitated but i am mad mad it cannot be dolan dolan is dead dead as a doornail dead beyond dispute because fifty men have seen him dead dead because the depot doctors have certified his death daylight was fading evening was coming on fandor was still turning the whole affair over in his mind every now and again he murmured fantomas fantomas has to do with this extraordinary this mysterious affair fantomas is in it fantomas end of chapter three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com
Section three of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter four A Surprising Itinerary Jerome Vandor had passed a bad night. Visions of horror had continually arisen in his troubled mind between nightmare after nightmare he had heard all the horrors of the night sound out in the darkness and the glimmering dawn then he had fallen into a heavy sleep which had left him on awakening broken with fatigue he had given himself a cold douche and this had calmed his nerves then he had dressed quickly when eight o'clock struck he was at his writing-table thinking things over it's no laughing matter i thought at first that the dolan affair was quite ordinary but i am mistaken the warning i received last night leaves me no doubts on that head since the guilty person thinks it necessary to ask me to keep quiet it is evident he fears my intervention if he is afraid of that it is because it must be hurtful to him if disastrous to him a criminal it is evident that it must be useful to honest folk my duty then is to go straight ahead at all costs there was another motive besides this of duty which incited him to follow more closely the vicissitudes of the rue norvins drama a motive still indefinite vague but nevertheless terribly strong jerome fondor had sworn to elizabeth dolan that he would get at the truth he recalled the girl's entreaty her emotion and when he closed his eyes now and again he seemed to see before him the tall graceful fair and fascinating sister of the vanished artist all fondor would admit to himself was a chivalrous feeling towards her elizabeth dolan was worth putting himself out for that was all our journalist spent the entire morning seated at his writing-table his head between his hands smoking cigarette after cigarette arranging his plans for investigating the dolan case what i have to find out is how the dead man left the depot the first impossibility to be explained yes and how am i to set about it suddenly fandor jumped up marched rapidly up and down his room whistled a few bars of a popular melody and in his exuberant gaiety attempted an operatic air in a voice deplorably out of tune there are eighty chances out of a hundred that i shall not succeed cried he but that still leaves me twenty chances of arriving at a satisfactory result let us make the attempt as fondor was hurrying off he called to the portress in passing madame audre i don't know whether i shall be back this evening or no perhaps i may have to leave paris for a while so would you be kind enough to pay particular attention to any letters that may come for me be very particular about them please fondor went off a thought struck him he turned back he had something more to say to the good woman i forgot to ask you whether anyone called to see me yesterday afternoon no monsieur fondor no one good if by any chance a messenger should bring a letter for me look very carefully at him madame audrey i have a colleague or two who are playing a joke on me and i should not be sorry to get even with them this time fondor really went off having set his portress on the alert in the rue montmartre he hailed a cab to the national library and as quick as you can by jove it's three o'clock and not a minute to lose cried fandor as he got back his stick from the cloak-room of the national library he had handed it in there some hours ago he entered the rue richelieu now for an ironmonger's shop he caught sight of one and went in i should like fifty yards of fine cord please very strong and very pliable said fandor the shopkeeper stared at the smart young man what do you want it for sir i have various qualities without the trace of a smile and as if it were the most natural thing in the world he replied it is for one of my friends he wants to hang himself a shout of laughter was the response to this witticism and the amused shopkeeper forthwith displayed various samples of cords fandor promptly made his choice and left the shop now for a watchmaker's said our journalist he entered a jeweller's close by i want an alarm clock a small one the cheapest you have provided with his alarm fandor looked at his watch again confound it all it's half-past three he cried he signalled to a closed cab 
to the palais de justice as hard as you can lick directly fondor was well inside the vehicle he drew down the blinds took off his coat unbuttoned his waistcoat the great clock of the palais de justice had just struck four and its silvery tones were echoing harmoniously along the corridors when jerome fondor entered the tradesmen's gallery he turned to the right and gained the little lobby in which the cloakroom is he quietly entered it barristers were coming and going full of business throwing off their gowns inspecting the letters put aside during the sittings of the courts fondor made his way among the groups with the ease of custom he seemed to be looking for someone and finished by questioning one of the women employed in the cloakroom is madame marguerite not here oh yes monsieur she is down below madame marguerite was an old friend of fondor's she was head of the cloakroom staff and by her kind offices she had often obtained an interview for our journalist with one or other of the bigwigs of the bar who generally object strongly to being questioned by journalists when she appeared fondor told her he only wanted a little bit of information from her oh yes i know all about that there is someone you wish to see and you want me to manage it for you no not a bit of it what i want to know is where these gentlemen of the court of justice robe and unrobe i mean the justices of the assize courts this seemed to astonish madame marguerite considerably but monsieur fondor if you wish to interview one of the puisan judges it would be ten times quicker for you to go and see him at his own home here at the palais it's almost certain he will refuse to answer you don't bother about that madame marguerite just tell me where these worthy guardians of order defenders of right and justice divest themselves of their red robes madame marguerite was too much accustomed to our young journalist's ridiculous questions and absurd requests and remarks to argue with him any longer the robing room of these gentlemen said she is in one of the outer offices of the court near the council chamber there is an assistant in that room isn't there yes monsieur fondor ah that is just what i wanted to know many thanks madame and fandor grinning with satisfaction made off in the direction of the court of the assize he ran up the steps leading to the council chamber and spying the messenger asked can president gachon see me do you think monsieur le president has gone fandor seemed to be reflecting he gazed searchingly round the room as a matter of fact he was verifying the correctness of madame marguerite's information all round the room fandor saw the little presses where the men of law kept their red robes yes it was the robing and unrobing room of the puisan judges the magistrates right enough so the president is gone ah well fandor hesitated he must think of some other name he noticed the visiting cards nailed to each press indicating the owner he read one of the names and repeated it well then could justice hubert see me could he possibly will you ask him to let me see him for five minutes what name shall i say my name will not tell him anything please say it is with reference to the uh peru case and i came from maitre tissot i will go and see said the messenger moving off whilst he was in sight fondor walked up and down the regulation way murmuring maitre tissot the peru case go ahead my good fellow you will have a nice kind of reception down below there with those made-up names some minutes later the messenger returned to his post prepared to inform the importunate young man that he could not possibly be received by justice hubert he stopped short on the threshold not a soul was to be seen wherever has that young man got to taken himself off most likely i expect he was one of those lawyers clerks confound them a nice fool i should have looked if his honour justice hubert had said he would receive him with this reflection the messenger went back to his newspaper not without having ascertained that it was four o'clock and therefore he had still an hour to wait before he could have his coffee and cigar at the men of the robe through the great windows of the court of assize carefully closed as they were not a ray of moonlight filtered into the courtroom and this obscurity lent an added terror to a silence as profound as the grave a silence which with the falling shades of night assumed possession of the vast hall where so many criminals had listened to the fatal sentence the sentence of death when the court had risen the assistants had as usual proceeded to put the place in order then the police sergeant had made his rounds and had gone away double locking the doors behind him 
after this the chamber had gradually sunk into complete repose a repose which would be broken the following morning when the bustling routine of the legal day commenced once more little by little too the many and varied noises which had echoed and re-echoed the whole day through in the galleries of the palais de justice had died down and sunk into silence the custodians had made their last round the barristers had quitted the roaming room the poor wretches who had slunk in to warm themselves at the heating apparatus in the halls had shuffled back to the cold street and the whistling blasts of the north wind the immense pile was entirely deserted a clock began to strike then hardly had the last stroke of eleven sounded awakening the echoes of the empty galleries than in the court of assize itself under the monumental desk before which the justices sat in state by day a noise made itself heard long strident nerve-wracking the noise of an alarum clock just as the alarum ceased its raucous call a loud yawn resounded through the empty spaces of the chamber the sleeper who had selected this spot that he might indulge all undisturbed in a revivifying sleep evidently took no pains to smother the sound of his voice for after yawning enough to dislocate his jaws he uttered a loud ah oh! he accompanied his yawns with exclamations it's a fact the republic doesn't do things up to the scratch the rugs here are of poor quality i'm aching all over the floor is strewn with peach kernels surely at any rate it's a quiet hotel and one is not disturbed a truly delectable refuge to have a jolly good snore in the sleeper sat up what's the time exactly let us have a light on it a match was struck and a tiny flare of light shone from under the desk of the presiding judge ten past eleven i've still five minutes to be lazy in and i shall need all of it for i've a rough night before me i can rest a while and think things over the speaker calmly lay down again trying to find a comfortable position on what he christened mentally the administrative peach kernels let me see now he went on aloud at five in the afternoon it was known that jacques delon had committed suicide was probably innocent and that his corpse had disappeared yesterday at half past five la capitale announced that he had a very pretty sister to-night at ten past eleven behold me shut up quite alone in the palais de justice free to proceed to the little investigation i think of making jerome fandor my dear friend i congratulate you you have not managed badly yes went on our journalist what a joke it is here have i got myself shut up in the palais without the slightest difficulty it is true that if the assistant had been obliged to open and verify the contents of all the robing rooms of all the judges he would never have finished as for me in my cupboard i followed all the good fellow's movements and he never suspected my presence if i am to be congratulated he cannot be blamed for it there i was there i remained and now i must be off fondor drew a small wax taper from his pocket and lighted it with a match what's to be done with the alarum he went on to leave it will be to betray my having passed this way what of it in any case even if this reporting job fails i shall make a story out of it and how can they accuse me of stealing if i leave my cloak as a gift for his judgeship laughing fandor piled up the law books lying on the desk and placed the alarum on the top that done he went to the principal entrance the only one with double doors he seized the heavy iron bar placed across the door and worked it loose he drew the two leaves of the door toward him and although it had been locked as usual he effected his escape after a considerable trial of strength out on the stairs lighted taper in hand the laughing fandor closed the two leaves of the door with the utmost care and went forward whistling a marching tune his objective was a certain little staircase leading to the top story of the palais and this he mounted with vigorous determination there was no likelihood of chance encounters for there was not a soul in the vast building the police were making their rounds outside it our adventurous journalist did not make his way upwards with stealthy tread there was no need for that having gained the top floor he went straight to a corner where an ebony ladder was ensconced a ladder which had long been the joy and pride of the grand master of this part of the palais the amiable monsieur peter pretty heavy grumbled fandor as he carried it upwards under the roof he caught sight of a skylight rested his ebony ladder against it and climbed briskly on to the roof 
from thence fondor had a view that was fairy-like spread out in the distance were the sparkling lights of paris he was divided from them by the vast mass of roofs about him by a gulf of empty space and beyond by a dark blur the two arms of the seine flowing on either side of the palais de justice the mysterious darkness the fascination of the sparkling points of light fandor gave himself a mental shake this was no moment for dreaming under the stars from his pocket he took a tiny folding dark lantern from his pocket-book he drew a paper which he spread out and proceeded to study as he bent over it he murmured a bit of good luck that i was able to get hold of a complete and detailed plan of the palais de justice without it i never could have found my way among these roofs he examined the plan for some minutes made a note of various landmarks then refolding it he gained one of the sloping roofs facing the quay of the leather dressers now thought fandor i must be just above the depot and now to find out how jacques delon dead or living has got out of the depot no use thinking of a window for the cell has not got one fusilier has reason on his side when he declares that you do not get out of the cells of the depot nor out of the palais well now to carry off delon dead or living by way of the palais square or by the boulevard is out of the question there are too many people about to carry him off by one of the exits on to either of the quays is equally out of the question there are the sentries in the first place and then comes the seine then jacques delon has left the depot or he has not or at any rate he is still somewhere in the palais unless fandor interrupted his cogitations to light a cigarette smoking helped him to think things out it is equally certain that if delon is still in the palais he cannot be in the depot for the depot has been rigorously searched since his disappearance and he would most certainly have been found had he been anywhere about the depot it is also certain that he is not inside the palais because the only means of communication between the depot and the palais is a single staircase and it is certain that a corpse could not have been taken that way unperceived then it follows that jacques delon must have got out by the only ways which are in communication with the depot that is to say the drains and the chimneys how could he have got out or been got out by the drains as far as i know there is no system of pipes large enough to allow of the passage of a man through the pipes which join the main sewers but as a set-off to that there is a chimney the ancient chimney of marie antoinette which communicates with the depot and the roof i am now on it must have been by this chimney that the escape was made let us see whether this is so or not by the light of his tiny dark lantern fandor studied afresh the plan of the palais and tried to identify the various chimneys about him he soon picked out the orifice of marie antoinette's chimney after a considering glance at it he remarked that's odd here is the only chimney whose opening is below the ledge of the roofs it is certain that unless one had been warned and had examined this roof from some neighbouring building the orifice of this chimney would not be noticed if jacques delon passed out by it no one would notice his exit our journalist continued his examination full of excitement surely he was on the right track ah ah here are stones freshly scraped and scratched he cried delightedly and this white mark is just the kind of mark which would be made by a cord scraping across the wall and look what a size this chimney is it's not only one jacques delon who could pass out by it but two but three a whole army aha i believe i am on the right track now for it fandor bent over and looked down the interior of the chimney and at the risk of toppling over he managed to reach something he saw shining in the darkness of the opening he drew himself up radiant by jove there are irons fixed in the walls of the chimney to climb up and down by and what is more they bear traces of a recent passage the rust has been rubbed off here and there yes it is by this way dolon has come out to whom else could it be an advantage to use this as an exit from the interior of the palais on to the roofs fandor was keen on the scent here indeed was matter for an article which would bring him into notice good business for a journalist if delon had been alive reflected fandor it is evident that once on the roofs he had a choice of three ways to escape he could do what i have just done but the other way about 
he could break a skylight jump into a garret and lie hidden under the tiles awaiting the propitious moment when he could gain the corridors below and mingling with the crowd slip unobserved into the street or he could hide among the roofs and stay there or he could search for an opening one of those air holes which put the cellars and drains in communication with the exterior but i have come to the conclusion that dolon is dead then his corpse could only remain up here or it has been put down into some place where nobody goes the garrets of the palais are so incessantly visited by the clerks and registrars that no corpse could remain undiscovered in any of them therefore either jacques dolan's corpse is somewhere on the roofs of the palais or there is some sort of communication between the roofs and the drains it is obvious evidently the next step was to search every hole and corner of these same roofs armed with revolver and lantern fandor started on his tour of investigation but prudently for he was now almost certain that there were a number of accomplices involved in this delon affair to go carefully over the enormous roof of the palais de justice was no light task one has only to consider the immensity of this monumental pile its complicated architecture the numberless little courts enclosed within its vast confines to understand the difficulties with which our intrepid journalist had to contend but jerome fandor was not the man to be discouraged in the face of difficulties he was determined to brave them conquer them he examined minutely the entire roofing of the palais he did not leave a corner or a morsel of shadow unexplored there was not a gutter which he had not searched from end to end when after two hours of strenuous exertion he returned to his starting point the chimney of marie antoinette he was fain to confess that if jacques dollon had mounted to the roof of the palais de justice he certainly had not remained there fandor unfolded his plan once more it fluttered in the night breeze as he carefully numbered all the chimneys opening on to this roof then one by one he identified them with the real chimneys before his eyes he exclaimed joyfully there now it's just what i suspected he had discovered there was one chimney not down on the plan whither did it lead at all costs he must find out make sure he hastened to this extra chimney its orifice was large enough to allow of the passage of a man also here again stones had been recently loosened and a rope had rubbed against them what the deuce is this chimney thought fandor another mystery this chimney is not a chimney there is not a trace of soot in it even old soot after a moment's reflection he added can it be for ventilation only but a ventilation hole could only communicate with one of the apartments in the palais itself and how the deuce could they drop a corpse down there it would have been in the highest degree imprudent to attempt it no it is not by that road they have carried off delon's body but then by what way he glued his ear to the chimney after a while fandor could make out a vague intermittent sound could catch a little far-away plashing sound can the chimney communicate with the seine he asked himself no we are too far off it why this opening then ah i have it it is a drain a sewer it communicates with to verify that there was nothing for it but to descend the chimney which was no chimney so be it fandor took off his coat and uncovered the long fine cord rolled round and round his middle weighting the cord with a flint he let it slide down the chimney testing the straightness of the descent by the balanced oscillations of the stone and so ascertaining the even size of the opening as far as the line would go this was the work of a few minutes fandor did not hesitate he was eager to embark on the descent after all he murmured though i may find myself face to face with a band of assassins what of it it's all in the night's risks he fastened the end of the cord to one of the neighbouring chimneys fastened it firmly then his revolver handily stuck in his belt fandor seized the cord twisted it round his legs and let himself slowly down through the narrow opening it was a perilous descent fandor did not know whether his cord was long enough and lost in the darkness with only the gleam of light from his lantern to guide him he was naturally afraid of reaching the end of his rope unawares and of falling into the black void beneath but what he observed in the course of his descent excited him so much that he almost forgot the danger he was running 
to those at all practised in police detective work it was clear as daylight that men had passed this way and recently here is a dislodged stone muttered fandor and here are scrapes and scratches fresh and that mark looks like blood pushing his knees and his shoulders against the wall to support himself and stay his movements he examined the mark there was no doubt possible fandor's sharp eyes and the lantern's light had picked out a little red patch which sullied one of the projecting stones in the chimney walls this reflected our amateur detective only confirms delon's death if the wound that caused this mark had been made by a living body the mark would have been larger and there would have been others for it must come from an abrasion of the skin made during the descent it is not a mark made by flowing blood but by blood crushed out he descended a few yards further here's a find he cried he had just perceived some hairs sticking to the rough surface of the stones again with arched shoulders and bent knees he supported himself against the wall examined his discovery left half the hairs where they were took the rest and carefully placed them in his pocket-book the police must not be able to say that i have arranged this for their benefit fandor remarked cost what it may if i do not come across delon's corpse below i must find out to-morrow whether these hairs resemble his fandor went on descending and first in one place then in another he saw on the walls of this chimney whitish patches such as might have been caused by the passage of a heavy mass or body hanging at the end of a rope and striking against the walls on its way down whilst he still believed himself to be some distance off the end of his downward journey he felt a point of resistance beneath his feet at first he mistook it for firm ground much to his surprise he was about to leave go of his cord when a remnant of prudence restrained him how do i know there is not an abyss depths upon depths below me down into the very bowels of the earth i had better take care what fandor had taken for firm ground was nothing but an iron staple projecting from the wall fandor seized it stopped for a minute or two's breathing space ascertained by drawing it up that of his cord there were only a few yards remaining but he also perceived and with what relief that from where he was resting downwards the chimney was as far as he could see by his lantern's light marked off into regular spaces by these iron staples which are sometimes placed there for the use of chimney cleaners and masons fandor found them a most convenient kind of ladder the descent now became easy and in a short time our adventurous journalist reached the bottom of the chimney at first he could not understand where he had got to in the thick gloom around him his lantern's gleam of light showed him a kind of vaulted wall of massive masonry he had advanced a step or two with noiseless tread listening on the alert not a sound could he hear he decided to expose the full light of his lantern the brighter light showed him that the chimney from which he was now standing some yards away ended in a kind of sewer evidently no longer in use and the plashing sound he had heard on the far up heights of the palais roofs proceeded from a thin and muddy stream of water flowing in the middle of the sewer channel in the direction of the seine kneeling at the foot of the chimney fandor could distinguish marks of steps made by human feet much deeper and very different indentations were visible also not only have men passed this way but a short while ago he murmured but they were carrying a heavy burden there are two kinds of footmarks made by two kinds of shoes and the heels have made much deeper marks in the soil than have the tips yes these men bore a heavy burden fandor was so pleased that he mentally rubbed his hands over his discovery his quest was a success so far he was on the track of dolan's body and what copy for la capitale then a sad thought came to dim his delight poor poor elizabeth dollon i swore to her i would get at the truth and a lamentable truth it is her brother is dead he died in the depot he was done to death it was no suicide whilst talking to himself fandor was scrutinizing every inch of the ground as he moved forward there might be fresh clues it's a queer kind of sewer he went on this streamlet is as much mud as water it is almost stagnant evidently this underground sewer way is no longer used has been abandoned a horrid spectacle struck him motionless his lantern made visible a struggling heaving mass of rats fighting tooth and claw enormous rats devouring some hidden thing fontor's stomach rose at the sight 
oh horror could it be jacques dollon's body fandor snatched up a stone and flung it furiously among the unclean beasts they fled on the ground he could distinguish a mass a red formless mass saturated with congealed blood assuredly if the corpse has disappeared it is there the assassins must have cut it in pieces that they might carry it more easily and those vile creatures are in the thick of feasting on the poor victim's remains Pah! fondor moved on only to discover another pool of blood almost as large also besieged by rats evidently i shall find nothing else thought fondor the corpse no longer exists he continued his advance determined to find out what this underground way ended in his lantern was flickering to a finish when he arrived at the end of the sewer and found as he had foreseen that its opening had been cut in the steep bank of the seine that's a bit of luck i can get out this way instead of having to climb back the way i came up to the palais roof and down again it was still night darkness reigned save on the far horizon where a faint whitish line indicated the early dawn of an april day Bondor was just asking himself by what gymnastic feat he could regain the quay, and he was leaning over the opening of the sewer, his body bending far forward over the inky waters of the Seine. Before he had time to turn, before he could regain his balance, a brutal blow from behind half stunned him, and a vigorous thrust precipitated his body into the Seine. End of chapter 4 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 5 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel, Alain, and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins chapter five mother Toulouche and cranajour come along cranajour let's have a sight of what they've given you for the frock coat and the whole outfit the person thus challenged rummaged in the pockets of his old much patched and filthy garments and after interminable fumblings and huntings finished by extracting a certain number of silver pieces which he counted over with the greatest care finally he replied seventeen francs mother Toulouche mother toulouse showed her impatience it's details i want how much for the coat how much for the whole suit i've got to know i tell you i've got to write it all down and i've got to see how much i've to hand over to each of the owners of the duds try to remember cranajour the individual who answered to this odd appellation reflected after a silence shrugging his shoulders he replied i don't know i can't make myself remember not anyhow and it's a long time since i sold the goods mother toulouse shrugged in turn a long time she grumbled what a wretched job why it's only two hours since barely that it's true she went on with a pitying look at the shabby down-at-heel fellow who had spread out his seventeen francs on the table it's true that you're known not to have two hapworths of memory and that at the end of an hour you have forgotten what you've done that's right enough answered cranajour let's have done with it then cried mother toulouse she held out a repulsive-looking specimen of old clothes be off with you go and pawn this academician's cast-off when the comrades catch a sight of this bit of stuff to the fore they'll understand they can come without danger no cops about the store on the lookout are there mother toulouse took the precaution to advance to the threshold of her store cast a rapid glance around not a suspicious person nor a sign of one to be seen a good thing muttered she but i was sure of it those police spies are going to give us some peace for a bit likely the whole lot of them are on this dollon business isn't it so cranajour as she retreated into her store again mother toulouse knocked against that individual who had not budged he had hung over his arm respectfully the miserable bit of stuff that had been styled an academician's robe well what are you waiting for asked she sharply nothing what are you going to do with that cranajour seemed to reflect haven't i told you grumbled mother toulouse to go and stick it up outside don't say you've gone and forgotten already no no protested cranajour hastening to obey orders 
what a specimen thought mother Toulouche, whilst counting over the seventeen francs cranajour was a remarkably queer fish beyond question how had he got into connection with mother Toulouche and her intimates that remained a mystery one fine day this seedy specimen of humanity was found among the comrades exchanging vague remarks with one and another he stuck to them in all their shifting from this place to that no one had been able to get out of him what his name was nor where he came from for he was afflicted with a memory like a sieve he could not remember things for two hours together a feeble-minded poor sort of fellow with not a halfpenny's worth of wickedness in him always ready to do a hand's turn for any one to judge by his looks he might have been any age between forty and seventy for there is nothing like privations and misery to alter the looks of a man faced by this queer fish with a brain like a sieve they had christened him cran ajour and the nickname had stuck to this anonymous individual besides was not cranajour the most complacent of fellows the least exacting of collaborators always content with what was given him always willing to do his best as to mother Toulouse, she kept a little shop on the quay of the clock the sign over her little store read for the curiosity lover this alluring title was not to be justified by anything to be found inside this store which was nothing but a common pick-up-anything shop it was a receptacle for a hideous collection of lumber for old broken furniture for garments past decent wear for indescribable odds and ends where the wreckage of human misery lay huddled cheek by jowl with the beggarly off-scourings of parisian destitution behind the store whose little front faced the edge of the quay and looked over the seine was a sordid back shop here the pallet of mother Toulouche, a kitchen stove out of order and the overflow of the goods which were crowded out of the store were jumbled up in ill-smelling disorder this back shop communicated with the rue de harlay by a narrow dark passage thus the lair of old mother Toulouche had two outlets nor were they superfluous in fact they were indispensable for such as she ever on the alert to escape the inquisitive attentions of the police ever receiving visitors of doubtful morals and thoroughly bad reputation mother Toulouche's quarters comprised not only the two stores but a cellar both large and deep to which one obtained access by a staircase pitch dark crooked and everlastingly covered with moisture owing to the proximity of the river the floor of the cellar was a kind of noisome cesspool one slipped on the greasy mud floundered about in it for all that this cellar was almost entirely filled with cases of all kinds with queer-looking bundles with objects of various shapes and sizes evidently the jumble store of mother Toulouche did not confine itself to the rough and ready shop in the front and into the bargain this basement might be used as a safe hiding place in an emergency a precious refuge for whoever might feel it necessary to cover his tracks and thus escape the investigations of the police for instance mother Toulouche, as a matter of fact needed such premises as hers if she took ceaseless precautions it was because she had a reason for her uneasy watchfulness mother Toulouche had already come into involuntary contact with the police and her last and most serious encounter with them went as far back as those days of renown when the band of numbers had as their chief the mysterious hooligan lupart also known under the name of dr chalec she had been arrested for complicity in a banknote robbery had been tried and had been sentenced to twenty-two months imprisonment footnote four see the exploits of juve not turned in the slightest degree from the error of her ways and possessing some money which she had kept carefully hidden mother Toulouche had decided to set up shop close to the palais de justice the great house where those gentlemen of the robe judged and condemned poor folk she would say being so close to the red-robed i shall end by making the acquaintance of one or two of them and that may turn out a good job for me one of these days but this was merely a blind for other considerations had led to mother Toulouche renting this shop on the isle of the city in opening on the quay of the clock a quay but little frequented her wretched jumble store of odds and ends she had kept in touch with the band of numbers which had gradually come together again as soon as the various numbers of it had finished serving their time 
for a while they had lived unmolested but lately misfortunes had laid a heavy hand on the group still as the band began to break up other members came to replace those who had disappeared either temporarily or for good and all at any rate they could safely count on the assistance of an individual more valuable to them than any one this was a man named nibet who although he intervened but seldom could thanks to his influence save the band many annoyances this nibet held an honourable official position he was a warder at the depot whilst mother Toulouche, from the back of her store was watching with a derisive air the good-natured chronajour fasten up the academician's robe in a prominent position on the front of her nondescript emporium some one stepped inside and warmly greeted mother Toulouche with a good day old lady it was big ernestine who explained volubly that for a good half hour she had been prowling about near the statue of henry the fourth keeping the store well in view but not daring to approach until the usual signal had been displayed those who frequented the place knew that when the store was under police observation and mother Toulouse feared a raid she took care to hang out any kind of old clothes but if the way was clear if no lurking police were on the lookout then the rallying flag would be hoisted the flag being the old patched rusty musty academician's robe footnote five see the exploits of juva ernestine had arrived looking thoroughly upset have you heard the latest she cried the bad news what news whose news questioned mother Toulouse. why that poor emilette has come down a regular cropper the poor fellow he isn't smashed up is he mother Toulouse lifted her hands i haven't heard anything more than what i've told you consternation was on the faces of the two women their good Mimile, he who knew how to take care of himself without leaving a comrade in the lurch, who stuck to them, working for the common good. A few years previous to this, Mimile, having refused to conform to military law, had been arrested in the tavern of a certain Father Corn during a particularly drastic police raid, and the defaulting youth had been straightway put under the penal military discipline administered to such as he instead of making himself notorious by his execrable conduct as those in his position generally did he behaved like a little saint having thus made a reputation to trade on he was twice able to steal the money from the regimental chest without a shadow of suspicion falling on him and what was worse two of his innocent comrades had been accused of the crime had been condemned and shot in his stead owing to his good conduct mimile had been transferred to a regiment stationed in algiers and having a considerable amount of spare time on his hands he got into close touch with the aeroplane mechanics he was very much at home in this branch of work could not mimile demolish a lock as easily as one rolls a cigarette he was daring to a degree and as soon as his time in the military was up he began to earn his living as an aviator and rightly for he had become an able airman nevertheless mimile become amulet had aspired to greater things a humdrum honest livelihood was not to his taste he had come to the conclusion that provided he went warily nothing could be easier than to carry on a lucrative smuggling trade by aeroplane he could fly from country to country under the pretext that he was out to make records in flying custom-house officials and police inspectors in the interior would never think of examining the tubes of a flying machine to see whether or no they were packed with lace nor would it occur to them to overhaul certain cells fore and aft to discover whether things of value had been secreted in them such as thousands of matches or false coin so from time to time mimile would announce that he was off on a trial trip to brussels from paris from london to calais and so on for mechanics mimile had two broken-down sharpers who served as connecting links between the aviator and the band of smugglers and false coiners who gathered at the lair of mother Toulouse under the seal of secrecy this was why big ernestine was so anxious when she heard of mimile's accident had the aeroplane been totally wrecked would the very considerable prize of malign's lace they were expecting reach its destination safe and sound for some time past ill luck had pursued them had seemed to pursue implacably these unfortunates who took such pains and precautions to carry through their unlawful operations to a successful issue 
already the cooper a member of the confraternity who had had his glorious hour in the famous days of chalec and lupart had scarcely left prison retirement before he had been nabbed again owing to the far too sharp eyes of the french custom-house officials on the belgium frontier others of the band were also under lock and key again it really seemed as if mother Toulouche and her circle were being strictly watched by the police and now here was Amelette, who had come a regular cropper in his aeroplane no doubt about it mother Toulouche was set on knowing the rights of it but what has happened to Amelette exactly she called cranajour the queer fellow came forward from the back store where he had been loafing he had a bewildered air cranajour said mother Toulouche, putting a sou in his hand hurry off and buy me an evening paper now be quick about it don't forget make a knot in your handkerchief to remind a stupid head oh don't be afraid mother Toulouche, declared cranajour i shan't forget he nodded to big ernestine and vanished as by magic into the darkness for night had fallen scarcely had cranajour gone than a surly-looking individual slipped into the store not by the quay entrance but through the back store to which he had gained access by the dark passage leading to the rue de harlay his collar was turned up as though he were cold his cap was drawn well over his eyes thus his face was almost entirely hidden having barred the door on the quay side of the store mother Toulouche joined big ernestine and the newcomer well nibet anything fresh she asked removing his cap and lowering his collar nibet's crabbed visage glowered on the two women it was the depot warder right enough bad he growled between his teeth things are hot right at the palais things to worry about to do with comrades committed for trial questioned big ernestine nibet struggled and threw a glance of disdain at the girl you're going silly it's this delon mess up the warder gave them an account of what had happened the two women were all ears as they followed nibet's story of events which had thrown the whole legal world into a state of commotion incomprehensible occurrences which threatened to turn an ordinary murder case into one of the most mysterious and most popular of assassination dramas mother Toulouche and big ernestine were well aware that nibet knew much more than he had told them about the details of the delon vibray affair but they dared not cross-examine the warder who was in a nasty mood nor did the announcement of Amelette's accident add to his gaiety it just wanted that he grunted and those bundles of lace were to turn up this evening too who is to bring them asked big ernestine the sailor declared nibet and who is to receive them demanded mother Toulouche. i and the beetle answered nibet in a surly tone come to think of it went on nibet staring hard at big ernestine where is that man of yours the beetle like someone who had been running at top speed cranajour who had been gone about an hour on his newspaper buying errand drew up panting before the dark little entry leading from the rue de harlay to the den of mother Toulouche. he slipped into the passage but instead of rejoining the old storekeeper he began to mount a steep and tortuous staircase which led up to the many floors of the house he climbed up to the seventh story turned the key of a shaky door and entered an attic whose skylight window opened obliquely in the sloping roof this poverty-stricken chamber was the domicile of the queer fellow who passed his daylight hours in the company of mother Toulouche, hobnobbing with a hole and corner crew cronies of the old receiver of stolen goods overheated with running cranajour unbuttoned his coat opened his shirt sprinkled his face and the upper part of his body with cold water sponged the perspiration from his brow and brushed the dust off his big shoes it was clear starlight to-night to freshen himself up still more he put his head and shoulders out of the half-opened window he was gazing at the roofs facing him suddenly he started and his eyes gleamed they were the roofs outlined against the night sky of the palais de justice there was a shadow on the roof of the great pile a shadow which moved to and fro passing from one roof ridge to another now vanishing behind a chimney now coming into view again anxiously cranajour followed the odd movements of the mysterious individual who was making his lofty and lonely promenade up above there what the devil does it mean soliloquized the watcher whoever could have seen cranajour at this moment would have been struck by the marked change produced in his physiognomy 
this was not the chronosure of the wandering eye the silly smile the stupid face known to mother toulouse and her cronies it was a transformed chronosure mobile of feature lively of movement a sharp keen-witted chronosure veritably another man puzzled by the vagaries of the promenader on the palais roofs chronosure followed his movements intently for a few minutes longer he would have remained at the window the whole night long had the unknown persisted in his peregrinations but chronosur saw him climb to the top of a chimney a wide one lower himself slowly into the opening of it and then vanish from view chronosur waited a while in hopes that the unknown would not be long in coming out of his mysterious hiding-place again he waited and expected in vain the roofs of the palais resumed their ordinary aspect solitude reigned there not long afterwards chronosur re-entered the back store what a time you have been cried mother toulouche you've brought the newspaper haven't you chronosur looked at the little company with his most stupid expression and then lowered his eyes my goodness i've forgotten to buy one he cried nibet who had paid but scant attention to the new arrival continued his conversation with big ernestine they were talking about her lover nicknamed the beetle he was a terrible individual this beetle though his nickname suggested a peaceful occupation he really owed it to the frightful reputation he had won as a bell-ringer but the bells big ernestine's lover was in the habit of ringing were unfortunate pedestrians whom he would rob and half murder beating them unmercifully about the head and body sometimes he would beat them to within an ace of their last gasp occasionally he would beat the life out of them altogether if they tried to resist his brutal attacks the beetle was an apache footnote six hooligan of the first order of brutality big ernestine finished explaining to nibet that he must not count on the beetle that evening for things were so queer and uncertain the outlook was so gloomy that no one knew what bad business they might be in for mother toulouche asked if he had got mixed up in the delon affair chronosur cocked his ear at that whilst pretending to put a great bundle of old clothes in order but nibet replied the beetle has nothing whatever to do with that business i know what i know about all that he's afraid of getting what the cooper got so he keeps away he's not far out either you've got to be careful these days queer times ernestine and mother toulouche bewailed the cooper's fate poor fellow no sooner out of quad than back only a fortnight's liberty and with a vile accusation fastened to him smuggling and coining nibet tried to relieve their minds haven't i told you growled he that i'm going to get maitre henri robart to defend him he knows how to get round juries he'll get the cooper off with an easy sentence nibet looked at his watch it will soon be half past two got to go down the boatman will be there before long at the mouth of the sewer mother toulouche who was always in a flurry when smuggled goods were to be unloaded in her cellars tried to dissuade nibet you'll never be able to manage it by yourself nibet glanced at cranajour the warder hesitated then said since there's no one else couldn't i take cranajour with me at first objections were raised there was a low voice discussion so that the simpleton might not catch what they were saying Cronajour had never been up to dodges of this kind so far he had been kept out of them besides he was such a senseless cove he might give things away make a hash of it nibet smiled why it's just because he is such a simpleton and because he hasn't a mite of memory that we can use him safely that's true said mother toulouche somewhat reassured she called to Cronajour. come along Cronajour, and just tell us where you dined this evening the simpleton seemed to make a prodigious effort of memory seized his head between his hands closed his eyes and racked his brains after quite a long silence he declared emphatically and with a distressed air faith i can't tell you now nibet who had closely watched this performance nodded it's quite all right he said the cellars below mother toulouche's store were extensive dark and ill-smelling the walls glistened with exuding damp and the ground was a sticky mass of foul mud of all sorts of refuse of putrefying matter nibet followed by his companion made his way down to them it was no easy descent for they had to climb over cases of all kinds and over bales and bundles that moved and rolled about 
they passed into a smaller cellar around which were ranged long boxes of tin with rusty covers Cronajour, who had been given the lantern to carry was attracted to these boxes he lifted the cover of one of them and drew back wonderstruck for the box was full of shining gold pieces nibet with a jab and thrust in the back interrupted Cronajour's contemplation of this fortune nothing to faint over he growled you're not such a simpleton then you know the value of yellow boys all right then i'll give you one or two if you do your job all right but continued the warder leading his companion to the further end of the second cellar you will have to look out if you present your banker with one of those pieces for the little bits of shiny won't pass everywhere you've got to keep your eye open and jolly wide too Cronajour nodded comprehension false money false money he murmured there was a very strong big door an iron bar kept it closed nibet raised it with Cronajour's help through the door the two men passed into a long passage swept by a sharp rush of air the floor of it was paved and at the side of it flowed a pestilential stream carrying along in its slow-moving water a quantity of miscellaneous filth it was thick as soup with impurities a little collecting sewer of the cité whispered nibet pointing to a grey patch in the distance he put his mouth to Cranajour's ear see the daylight yonder that's where the sewer discharges itself into the sand it's there the boatman and his load will be waiting for us presently nibet stopped dead drew Cronajour back by the sleeve and stepped stealthily backwards to the massive doors of the cellar an unaccustomed noise had alarmed the warder in profound silence the two men stood listening intently there was no mistake the sound of sharp regular steps could be clearly heard coming from that part of the sewer opposite the opening someone said Cronajour, who was all on the alert as he had been in his attic watching the shadow and its vagaries on the roofs of the palais de justice nibet nodded the light from a dark lantern gleamed on the damp slimy walls of the subterranean passageway come inside murmured nibet in an almost inaudible voice and with infinite precaution he closed the massive portal between the cellar and the sewer way in safe hiding the two men could watch the approaching intruder they had extinguished their lantern and were peering through the badly joined wood of the solid door friend or foe an individual moved into view the reflected light of his lantern lit up the vaulting of the sewer way and showed up his face the man was young fair wore a small moustache hardly had he passed the cellar door when nibet gripped Cronajour's arm and growled intense rage was expressed in grip and tone it's he again the journalist of the delon affair of the depot business jerome fandor ah this time we'll see nibet's hand plunged into his trouser pocket Cronajour was eagerly watching the warder's every movement he clearly heard the sharp snap of a pocket-knife a long sharp knife a deadly weapon giving prudence the go-by nibet had opened the door and dragging Cronajour in his wake had rushed into the sewer way hard on the heels of the journalist who was slowly going in the direction of the seine nibet ground his teeth i have had enough of that beast always on our track too good a chance to miss i'm going to make a hole in his skin for him in the twilight of early dawn which penetrated the sewer near the opening Cronajour shuddered with stealthy step the two men drew near the journalist fandor walked on unsuspicious at a slow regular pace his head lowered the two bandits came up to within a yard of him noiselessly savagely determined nibet lifted his arm for a murderous stroke at this precise moment fandor stopped at the verge of the exit by which the sewer discharged its burden steeply into the seine yet a moment nibet's knife was poised for the rapid and terrible stroke it was about to bury itself into the neck of the journalist up to the hilt when Cronajour lifted his foot as if inspired by an idea on the spur of the moment gave the journalist a violent kick in the lower part of the back and sent him flying into space they heard his body fall heavily into the seine so roughly sudden had been Cronajour's movement that nibet stood dumbfounded arm in air and staring at Cronajour. Cronajour smiled his most idiotic smile nodded but did not utter one word it was formidable the rage of nibet here had that crass fool Cronajour kicked away the warder's chance of ridding himself of the journalist for good and all this hit and miss made nibet foam with rage 
of all the exasperating simpletons this fool of a chronosaur took the cake the two made their way back to the store where mother Toulouche and big ernestine anxiously awaited the results and now not only had the two men returned stuttering over their statements and with no news of the boatman who was generally up to time but they had missed a fine opportunity chance had offered them nibet hated the journalist like all the poisons taunts jeers abuse were heaped on the silly head of chronosaur who all in vain raised his eyes to heaven beat his chest shrugged his shoulders stammered mumbled vague excuses he didn't know exactly why he had done it he thought he was helping to bet they disputed and contended for two hours suddenly chronosaur broke a long silence and demanded looking as stupid as a half-witted owl what have i done then what are you scolding me for mother Toulouche and big ernestine and the wrathful nevet stared at one another taken aback then they understood two hours had gone by and chronosaur no longer remembered what had happened decidedly he was more innocent than a newborn babe there was nothing whatever to be done with such an idiot that was certain end of chapter five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggy bark dot blogspot dot com section six of messengers of evil by marcel elaine and pierre Silvestre. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter six in the opposite sense when jerome fandor had been precipitated into the seine so unexpectedly and with such violence he kept control of his wits he did not utter a cry as he fell head foremost into the darkling water he was an excellent swimmer all aching as he was he let himself go with the current and presently reached the sheltering arch of the pont neuf there he took breath for a minute queer was all he murmured then with regular strokes he made for the steep bank of the seine opposite quitting the river he secreted himself behind a heap of stones which lay on the quay he took off his soaked garments and wrung the water out of them this done and clad in what looked like dry clothes fandor walked along the quay hailed a passing cabman half asleep on his seat jumped inside and gave his address to the jehu when he arrived at la capitale on the friday morning a boy approached him and whispered mysteriously monsieur fandor there's a very nice little woman in the sitting-room who has been waiting for over an hour she wishes to see you she will not give her name she declares that you know who she is what is she like fandor asked his curiosity was not much aroused pretty fair all in black replied the boy good i'll go in interrupted fandor he entered the sitting-room and stood face to face with mademoiselle elizabeth dollon she came forward her eyes shining her face alight with welcome oh monsieur she cried taking his hands in hers a movement of pure gratitude oh monsieur i knew you would come to my help i have read your article of yesterday thank you again and again but i implore you since my brother is alive tell me where i can see him for mercy's sake don't keep me waiting surprise kept fandor silent a moment la capitale had published the evening before a sensational article by fandor in which under the guise of suppositions and interrogations he had narrated the various adventures as they had happened to himself concluding with the question really an ironical one if jacques dollon who had disappeared from his cell where he had been left for dead had escaped from the depot by way of the famous chimney of marie antoinette had reached the roof of the palais had redescended by another passageway to the sewer opening on to the seine did it not seem possible that dollon had escaped alive from the depot fandor had indulged in a gentle irony despite the gravity of the circumstances in order to complicate the already complicated affair and so plunge the police into a confusion worse confounded this in spite of his conviction that dollon was dead dead as dead could be now the cruelty of this professional game was brought home to him his article had raised fresh hopes in dollon's poor sister at sight of this charming girl brightened with hope fandor felt all pity and guilt he pressed her hands he hesitated he was troubled he did not know how to explain 
at last he murmured it was wrong of me mademoiselle very wrong to write that article in such a way without warning you beforehand alas you must not cherish illusions illusions which this unfortunate article has given rise to illusions i cannot believe in myself i speak with all the sincerity of which i am capable with the keenest desire to be of service to you i dare not let you buoy yourself up with false hopes i assure you then that from what i have been able to learn to see to know i am convinced that your unfortunate brother is no more if there have been moments when i had doubted this i am now morally certain that he is dead take courage mademoiselle try try to forget to to fandor was trembling with emotion he could not continue elizabeth bent her head her eyes full of tears she could not speak she was overcome by this cruel dashing to the ground of her hopes never never to see her brother again an agonizing silence reigned fandor was profoundly troubled by this mute grief he sought in vain for some word of comfort of encouragement elizabeth rose to go the poor girl realized that nothing could be gained by prolonging the interview her one need now was to be alone for then she could weep fondor was about to accompany her to the door when a boy entered monsieur fondor there's a man wishes to speak to you say i am not here replied our journalist he had no wish to see strangers just then but monsieur fondor he says he is the keeper of the landing stage of the passenger boat service and he comes with reference to the delon affair both elizabeth delon and jerome fondor started she was trembling our journalist said at once bring him in then the boy went off and fandor turned to the trembling girl tell me mademoiselle elizabeth do you feel equal to hearing what this man has to tell us it is not improbable that he has seen something something it would be best you should not hear had you not better avoid it elizabeth shook her head in the negative she was collecting all her forces she would not remain ignorant of any detail of the terrible tragedy which had cost her brother so dear i shall be strong enough she announced firmly the boy ushered in the visitor he looked a good specimen of his class a man about forty on his cap were the gold anchors of those in the employ of the paris boat service monsieur madame at your service the good fellow was very much embarrassed monsieur fandor he went on you do not know me but i know you very well that i do i read your articles every day in la capitale they're jolly good what i say is fandor cut short his admirer now tell me what brings you here oh well here goes i was reading your article yesterday about how jacques dollon no more dead than you or i had escaped over the roofs of the palais de justice that made me laugh because i am the keeper of the landing stage at the pont neuf station this affair is supposed to have happened in my parts don't you see well i had just come to the bit where you also supposed that the corpse might easily have been devoured by rats inside the sewer well monsieur fandor i can assure you that it was nothing of the sort the journalist was all eyes and ears he signed to elizabeth that she must keep quiet so as not to intimidate the good fellow come now what is it you have seen what i've seen why i saw the lawn break bounds at this statement elizabeth grew white as a sheet she jumped up and with clasped hands rushed towards the keeper speak speak quickly i implore you she cried fandor drew elizabeth back gently and whispered a few words to her he turned to the keeper mademoiselle has also come to make a statement regarding this affair he explained that is why she is so interested in what you have just told us but tell us how you saw jacques dollon escape well i had got up a bit earlier than usual to see that the anchors and mooring were all right and i thought i saw what looked like a big bundle fall into the river from the sewer opening only i was half asleep and didn't take much notice for what with all the rain we've been having there's no end of filthy stuff tumbling out of the mouth of the sewers but a few minutes after that i noticed that the bundle instead of going with the flow of the current was drifting across the seine plainly making for the bank there could be no mistake about that elizabeth delon cried and then and then then my little lady what if this surprise packet didn't turn off behind an arch of the pont neuf i didn't see what became of it but no one will get it out of my head that it isn't some jolly dog who had no wish to show himself that's what i think 
the keeper paused then went on that's all i have to tell you monsieur fondor it might serve for one of your articles some time or other only you mustn't say that i told you i might get into trouble with my chiefs about it elizabeth dollon was no longer listening she had turned to fondor and with shining eyes murmured he lives he lives fondor thanked the keeper and got rid of him directly the door closed behind him he darted to elizabeth poor child he cried full of pity for her ah don't pity me i don't need your pity now my brother is alive that man has seen him fondor had to undeceive her your brother is certainly dead he declared if he were the individual in question it would not have been yesterday morning but the morning before that when the keeper saw him and i do assure you but this good fellow is telling the truth then i assure you that i have good reasons the best reasons for believing for being certain that the swimmer who crossed the seine was not your brother great heaven who was it then fondor hesitated a moment should he divulge his secret all he said was it was not your brother i know that so decisive was his tone so great the sympathy vibrating through his words that elizabeth dollon once more convinced that fondor was not speaking at random bent her head and shed tears of deepest grief and bitter disappointment fondor allowed the sorrow-stricken girl to give way to her grief for a few minutes then he gently asked her mademoiselle elizabeth shall we have a little talk you see i simply cannot tell you everything yet i would gladly help you but first and foremost i beg of you to put quite out of your mind this hope that your brother is still alive sadly elizabeth wiped away her tears and in a voice which she tried to steady said oh wh what is to become of me i thought i had found in you a support a help and now you abandon me and i had put my faith in your goodness of heart there are your articles on the one hand and your attitude on the other what am i to make of it it is driving me to despair and if you only knew how much i need to be supported encouraged i feel as if i should go out of my senses out of my mind and i am alone so terribly alone the poor girl's voice was broken by sobs her whole body was shaken by them fondor went up to her and spoke to her in a low tone affectionately he felt great sympathy and an immense pity for this unhappy young creature who charmed and attracted him he tried to console her and to change the current of her thoughts come now mademoiselle do try to control yourself a little i have promised to help you and i certainly shall you may be sure of it but consider now if i am to be of real use to you i must know a little about you you yourself your family your brother who your friends are and who are your enemies i must enter into your existence not as a judge but as a comrade who is interested in all that concerns you will you not confide in me once i know what there is to know we might then unite our efforts to some purpose and find out what really has happened since the mystery remains inexplicable elizabeth dollon felt the young man was sincere and that what he said in such a gentle voice was true this poor human waif asked no more than to be allowed to cling to whoever would take pity on her and be kind she now spoke to jerome fondor of her childhood without suspecting in the least that the same jerome fondor charles rambert used to play with her in those days footnote seven see fantomas she mentioned the assassination of the marquise de langrune the first tragic episode of her life then had come the horrible death of her father old steward dollon who had passed from the service of the marquise to that of the baroness de vibray then perished the victim of a criminal she explained how jacques dollon and she had come to settle in paris feeling themselves rich on the savings they had inherited from their parents elizabeth had become a dressmaker and jacques had become an artist craftsman gradually the young man's talent and industry had enabled his sister to leave her workroom and come to live with him his reputation was a growing one and the two young people looked forward to an existence of honest comfort in the near future they got to know some people one or two of whom were rich and had shown their interest in the brother and sister jerome fondor interrupted her you always remained on good terms with the baroness de vibray at this question the girl's eyes flashed they have put into print shameful things about this poor dear baroness and about my brother also the papers have represented her as eccentric as mad they have said worse things than that you know that don't you 
they have declared that there was a very intimate relation between her and my brother i cannot say more it is too hateful it is all false as false as false can be the baroness was particularly interested in jacques but assuredly that was owing to the long-standing relations between her family and ours the suicide of the baroness has been a sad addition to my grief for i was very fond of her fondor had been listening attentively to elizabeth's story he now said you have used the word suicide mademoiselle do you then really think as every one seems to do that your patroness killed herself of her own free will elizabeth reflected a minute before replying that was what she wrote and one must believe that nevertheless nevertheless elizabeth hesitated passing her hand over her forehead then said nevertheless monsieur fandor the more i think over this death the more remarkable it seems the baroness de vibray was not the kind of person to commit suicide even if she were unhappy even if she were ruined i have often heard her speak of her money affairs she even used to joke about the expostulations of her bankers monsieur's barbe nantul because she was too fond of gambling that was our poor friend's weakness she was a dreadful gambler she was always betting on horses and gambling on the boars footnote eight stock exchange do you know the barbie nantules at all mademoiselle a little i have met them once or twice at madame de vibray's when she had one of her little evenings once or twice my brother has asked their advice about investments very modest investments i can assure you and they got one of their friends a monsieur Tomery, to buy some of my brother's art pottery have you many acquaintances in paris mademoiselle besides the baroness we hardly saw anyone except madame bourrat a very nice kind woman widow of an inspector of the city of paris she keeps a boarding-house at a tulle rue d'affette in fact i am staying with her now for i had not the courage to go back to my brother's place too many dreadful memories are connected with his studio there i am lucky to find such a sympathetic friend in madame bourrat and such a warm welcome i am alone now and life is sad fondor went on with his cross-examination nevertheless mademoiselle i must ask you to return in thought to that tragic home of yours please tell me what people you knew in your immediate neighbourhood acquaintances elizabeth considered acquaintances is the word because we were not on really intimate terms with our neighbours in the cité for the most part they are either art students or work people however we saw fairly often a nice man a stranger a dutchman i think he was called monsieur van huren he manufactures accordions and lives in a little house opposite ours with six children he has been a widower for years also there was a monsieur louis an engraver who used to take tea with us in the evening sometimes his wife also he is employed in the posts and telegraphs we had practically no other acquaintances elizabeth stopped there was a silence fondor asked another question tell me mademoiselle when you entered the studio for the first time after the tragedy did you notice anything abnormal the poor girl shuddered at the appalling picture before her mind's eye good heavens monsieur she cried i did not examine the studio minutely i had only one thought to be with my brother who had been so unjustly accused so fondor interrupted to ask do you not know that in his preliminary examination your brother declared that he had not received a single visitor during the evening preceding the tragedy how then do you explain the fact that the baroness de vibray was found dead in his studio and at his side when no one had seen her enter it did your brother make a mistake please tell me what you think about it elizabeth gazed anxiously at the young journalist then fixed her eyes on the floor her hands twitched she began to twist her fingers feverishly do trust me begged jerome fandor please tell me what you think elizabeth rose took several steps and placed herself in front of the journalist ah monsieur there is something mysterious which i cannot explain as a matter of fact someone must have come to see my brother that evening i cannot assert it as a fact beyond dispute certainly but in my own mind i feel quite sure about it but you must have more proof of it than that cried fandor but there is more cried elizabeth as if enlightened by a sudden discovery there is a fact tell me do cried fandor intensely interested well just imagine then among the papers scattered over his table and close to his book which was open 
i noticed a sort of list of names and addresses written on our own note paper and in the kind of green ink we use so well so interrupted the journalist you came to the conclusion that this list had been written at your brother's house yes and it was not my brother's handwriting nor that of the baroness de vibray nor that of the baroness de vibray and what did this list contain names addresses i tell you of persons we knew there were also two or three dates and is that all that is all monsieur i saw nothing else little enough murmured fandor disappointed still no detail however slight must be ignored what have you done with that list mademoiselle i must have taken it with me when i collected all the papers i could find the day before yesterday before going to the boarding-house at atul when you have an opportunity will you bring me that list requested fandor the conversation was interrupted a boy came to tell fandor that he was wanted on the telephone by someone in the public prosecutor's office later on in the day jerome fandor sent the following express message to elizabeth Delon do not believe a word of the police headquarters version which you will read in this evening's la capitale this dispatched our journalist commenced his article entitled still the affair of the rue norvons police headquarters takes a view of this affair which is the very reverse of that taken by our contributor jerome fandor by the seine sewer the roofs of the palace and the chimney of marie antoinette an inspector has succeeded in reaching the depot Police headquarters is convinced that Jacques Dolan escaped alive. End of chapter 6 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 7 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel, Alain, and Pierre Silvestre this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 7 Pearls and Diamonds. Nadine? Princess? Nadine, what time is it? The young Circassian, with hair as black as ink, supple and slender, rose from her chair and was hastening from the bedroom to ascertain the time when her mistress recalled her don't go away nadine stay with me the dusky circassian obeyed she stared with big astonished eyes into those of her mistress but princess why don't you wish me to go the princess stammered in a mysterious tone don't you know then nadine that today is the anniversary and i am frightened princess sonia danidoff was in her bathrobe it must have been a quarter past eleven or even nearer midnight than that although she had lived in paris for years she had never been able to make up her mind to settle in a flat of her own possessing an immense fortune she much preferred the american way of living and had taken a suite of rooms in one of those great palace hotels near the place de la toile though a very smart staff of servants was reserved for her exclusive use her favourite attendant was a pretty circassian in whom she had absolute confidence this nadine was a native of southern russia the movement of city life and civilized manners and customs had at first terrified this little savage but she had learned to adapt herself to her changed surroundings and was now high in the favor of princess sonia she and she alone was authorized to be present when the beautiful great lady took her daily baths for some years past the princess had insisted on the presence of a maid when she took her baths without fail they must either be in the bathroom itself or in the room next to it within reach or call but on this particular evening sonia danidoff more nervous and restless than usual would not allow nadine to leave her for a second as to the time well if she did not know the exact time it could not be helped really it did not matter to her whether she were half an hour or no for the ball given in her honour by tomery the millionaire sugar refiner in fact it would be much better to make her appearance after all the guests had assembled her arrival would give the crowning touch of brilliancy to this society function sonia danidoff had pronounced the word anniversary in a tone of anguish so sincere that nadine was genuinely alarmed she knew only too well what this fatal word meant to her mistress 
she had not forgotten that five years ago to the day just when the princess was enjoying her evening bath a mysterious individual had appeared before her who after frightening her had robbed her of a large sum of money the adventure would have been little out of the ordinary for hotel robberies are frequent had not the audacious bandit been quickly identified as the enigmatic and elusive fantomas whose prodigious reputation had only increased with the passage of the years sonya danidoff who was not ignorant of the dramatic adventures imputed to this legendary hero could not bear to think of the position she had been placed in that awful night when threatened and robbed by fantomas she had escaped death by a series of unknown and unguessable circumstances the tormenting mystery of it all preyed insistently upon her mind since then sonya danidoff had never taken a bath without thinking of fantomas and every year when the anniversary of his aggression came round she suffered cruelly she was seized with wild unreasoning fears at the idea that she might see this terrifying bandit appear before her again and that this time he would be merciless nadine knew all this she also shuddered at the vision this horrible anniversary evoked but controlling herself she was anxious to change the current of her dear mistress's thoughts forget try to forget sonya danidoff she counselled in her melodious voice you are going to a ball at monsieur thomery's at your fiancé's house the princess shuddered ah nadine my nadine she cried raising herself and regarding her maid with a strange look i cannot overcome my uneasiness my alarms this coincidence of date agitates me you know how superstitious we are at home in our russia and the life i lead in paris has not destroyed in me the simplicity of soul of a daughter of the steppes nadine did not know what reply to make to this pathetic outburst the princess went on and then do you see i think it wrong of monsieur thomery to even want to give this ball only a fortnight after the tragic death of that poor baroness de vibray i tried to dissuade him from it i think the baroness was his most intimate friend once so it is said murmured nadine sonya danidoff went on as if speaking to herself i am not sure of it it is precisely to remove this suspicion from my mind that thomery was determined to have his ball to-night at all costs the baroness de vibray so he told me was no more than a good old friend i cannot make her death an excuse for putting off the announcement of our marriage that would be to give colour to the scandal sonya danidoff shrugged her beautiful shoulders hand me a mirror nadine obeyed the princess gazed long and complacently at the marvellously lovely face reflected in the glass princess cried nadine you must leave the bath you will be late otherwise in the adjacent dressing-room brilliantly illuminated by electric light the princess dressed with the aid of nadine proud and happy to be the sole assistant of her beloved mistress the toilette was a triumph silk of an exquisite blue draped with silk muslin encrusted with pointe de venise and bands of ermine a costly masterpiece of the dressmaker's art it enhanced the brilliant beauty of sonya danidoff and threw nadine into raptures the princess opened her jewel box this evening nadine i shall be pearls and diamonds cried the lovely creature as she fixed two large grey pearls in her ears oh how beautiful you are princess and what a lot they must have cost cried nadine ten thousand francs my child on each side of my head sonya slipped on her fingers three diamond rings set in platinum and here are eight or nine thousand francs more continued she as nadine's eyes grew round with wonder her mind could hardly grasp all these thousands of francs worth of diamonds and pearls there were still more to come for rejecting a magnificent bracelet on the plea that one no longer wore them at balls the princess smilingly bade her circassian fasten round her neck a superb triple collar of pearls to this was added a sparkling cascade of diamonds never had nadine seen her beautiful mistress so richly dressed thus adorned in nadine's eyes sonya danidoff was dazzlingly beautiful exquisitely lovely you look like the holy virgin on the icons stammered nadine kneeling before her mistress quite overcome by emotion good heavens that is blasphemy i am only a humble human creature said the princess smiling then she once more looked at herself in the mirrors well satisfied with her appearance certain of the effect she would produce on her future husband thomery 
she threw over her shoulders a superb mantle of zibeline which was quite needed for though it was the middle of april it was quite cold then ready at last she descended to her motor-car and was whirled away to the ball cranajour cranajour mother toulouse shouted herself breathless she tried to shout louder and louder it was in vain she might shout herself hoarse there was no reply the old termagant who had left the front of her hovel and had gone to call her assistant shouting in the passage at the back of the store returned cursing and swearing and seated herself near the store in the lean-to which did duty as a kitchen where in devil's name has that imbecile got to she grumbled whilst sipping with gusts from the bottom of a cup into which she had poured a small allowance of coffee and a copious ration of rum it was about eleven in the evening there was not a sound to be heard having finished her rum and tea the old receiver of stolen goods went to the entrance of the passage cranajour cranajour yelled the old termagant there was no answer he can't possibly be in his canteen said mother toulouche to herself if he was he'd have answered fool though he is and would have come down sure he's going to drag his old down at heels somewhere but where oh well we can manage to do without him the old receiver went back to her store and was starting on a queer sort of job when the door which led on to the quay burst open before a panting breathless individual he ran right up the store and stopped short mother toulouche had seized the first thing she could find and had taken up a defensive attitude her weapon was a great ancient cavalry sabre but the newcomer intended no harm quite the contrary after an instinctive recoil he leaned against a table and wiped his forehead breathing in gasps incapable of pronouncing a syllable mother toulouche had recognized him ah it's you redhead and not a bit too soon either i've been waiting for you this last half hour ernestine will be there in ten minutes time however is it you are so late redhead was well named his bullet head was covered with russet red hair cut very short his complexion was a good match his bloated cheeks and his potato-shaped nose were covered with red patches his shaven chin was a tawny red round his little gimlet eyes was a fringe of red lashes it was a bestial face he was hatless above his waistcoat with metal buttons he wore a black coat his trousers had a yellow line down them he was evidently a servant wearing the livery of some big house the fellow was slowly recovering his breath but he continued to wipe great drops of sweat off his narrow forehead he was shaking all over and his morose countenance was twitching and contracting nervously well what's your news good or bad questioned mother toulouche in a brutal tone redhead replied almost inaudibly that depends it's good on the whole a gleam of cupidity showed in the old receiver's eyes got a bit of tin on her back that woman eh redhead nodded with a yes thereupon mother toulouche went back into her back store and returned with a claret glass filled to the brim with rum shoot that down your throat that'll put you right when he had swallowed the bumper he seemed to gain courage and said if i didn't get here sooner it's because i had to wait but i saw the little thing what's her name nadine replied redhead and added a pretty little brat too she's got some fire in her eyes what's that to do with it interrupted mother toulouche you don't mean to tell me you were able to make her gabble a bit she queried contemptuously redhead bridled likely since i know everything now and i'm her sweetheart let me tell you mother toulouche said in a jeering tone you don't tell me you oh replied redhead it's just a way of speaking she's a good little thing there's nothing to it you know so much the worse declared mother toulouche virtuous sorts aren't any use to our lot well what did she tell you out with it well said redhead i waited three quarters of an hour before nadine joined me i had no bother in making her talk i can tell you without the asking she told me everything she was pretty well flabbergasted with all the jewels her mistress had stuck on her clothes and her skin seems there's hundreds of thousands worth all pearls and diamonds nothing but mother toulouche was calculating real pearls real diamonds it's possible there's all that worth steps could be heard on the pavement just outside redhead began to shake all over who is it he asked someone coming in mother toulouche grinned be easy then haven't i told you there's nothing to fear nevertheless he asked anxiously there's nothing more i'm wanted for here is there 
i've told you all i know no no it's all right replied mother toulouche maternal and conciliating there's nothing more for you to do here still if you want to see big ernestine without waiting to hear the end of her sentence redhead hurried toward the exit mother toulouche did not try to detain him after all she said in a low tone to his back as a kind of farewell cut your sticks my lad since you're funky when alone she grumbled aloud what a lot they are i never did white livered and for nothing at all mother toulouche was still muttering when big ernestine marched in through the back way she had on a large hat and was heavily veiled she proceeded to remove both hat and veil well she queried they've got on to it all right redhead has just gone he knows through the little maid that the princess went off to the ball dressed up to the nines hung with jewels like a shrine big ernestine uttered a deep sigh of satisfaction her only reply was to hustle the old receiver look alive mother toulouche you've got to give me a beggar's outfit it's up to you to see i'm disguised properly and there's not a minute to lose either mother toulouche was an expert at disguises and make-up of every sort this was not to be wondered at considering the queer company she kept and the fraudulent business she carried on and the smuggling she was mixed up in big ernestine disguised as a poverty-stricken creature and rendered unrecognizable looked exactly like some unfortunate reduced to soliciting alms she walked into the back store and helped mother toulouche to take from a cupboard some bottles bandages and medicated cotton wool by the light of a smoky lamp the two women scrutinized the labels sniffing the various phials and flasks big ernestine with the aid of mother toulouche prepared compresses of pomade and cotton wool on which she sprinkled a few drops of a yellow liquid giving out a sickening odor besides this big ernestine put inside her bodice a long phial after making certain that the mixture with which it was full contained chloroform then under mother toulouche's watchful eye ernestine prepared what was called in that world of light-fingered gentry the mask a mask of cotton which is moulded by force on the face of the victim in order to plunge him or her into a heavy sleep whilst making these sinister preparations the two women talked as they went on with their evil task big ernestine said in reply to mother toulouche's questionings oh it's simple enough it's like this when the motor-car stops i shall go to the right-hand door and begin to beg likely enough the princess won't want to hear what i have to say but while i attract her attention mimile who will be on the other side will open the door and will stick the compress on her mug she won't struggle besides mimile will have hold of her and then i'll have had time to see where her jewels are and how they are fastened and then i'll soon have them in my pocket my deepen mother toulouche nodded it's arranged all right but how will you arrest the motor oh that's where the others come in they'll do it all right i expect they're seeing to it now but look here cried mother toulouche mimile isn't in bits then they said he had fallen from his flyer big ernestine gave a laugh he fell right enough poor little fellow and from pretty high too but he's not broken a thing not this time a bit of luck i don't think eh he's a mascot i'm certain declared mother toulouche then she said you spoke of the others who are they the others but didn't they tell you cried the surprised ernestine for she thought old mother toulouche was in the know why there's the beetle and the beard oh cried mother toulouche much impressed if the beard's in it then it's a serious affair yes replied big ernestine staring hard at the old receiver of stolen goods it's serious all right if the chloroform doesn't work oh well they'll bring the knife into play big ernestine looked at her little silver watch to mark the time past midnight she remarked i must hurry off and see what they're up to as she was making off mother toulouche stopped her have a glass of rum to start on it puts heart into you the two women were quite ready for a drink together when they had swallowed their dose big ernestine smacked her tongue famous stuff it puts a heart into you and no mistake yes it's the right stuff the best agreed mother toulouche it's what nibbit prefers she added then she cried but nibbit how isn't he in it big ernestine put a finger on her lips nibbit's in it of course as he always is you know that old toulouche but he's content to show the way you know he seldom does anything himself besides it seems he's on duty at the depot to-night big ernestine threw an old shawl over her head and went off crying i'm off and in for it now soon be back mother toulouche the magnificent mansion of thomery the sugar refiner overlooked the parc monceau 
it was approached by a very quiet little avenue in which were a few big houses it opened onto the boulevard malasherbes and was known as the avenue de valois all the dwellings there are sumptuous richly inhabited and if the avenue is peaceful and silent by day it is no uncommon thing to see it of an evening crowded with carriages and luxurious motor-cars come to fetch the owners away to dinners and entertainments on this particular evening the approaches to the avenue de valois were full of animation motors and broughams succeeded one another in a long file putting down the guests of thomery under an immense marquee covering the steps leading up to the vestibule all the smart world had been invited to the reception all paris swarmed into the brilliantly illuminated entrance halls of the mansion two mounted policemen sat as immovable as bronze caryatids on either side of the entrance whilst the swarm of policemen made the carriages move on and drove away from the aristocratic avenue de valois the band of poverty-stricken and ragged creatures who crowded the pavement with the hope of securing a handsome tip by opening a carriage door or picking up some fallen object it was no easy matter to keep order one of the police sergeants accustomed to ceremonial functions remarked to one of his younger colleagues i've seen balls and receptions enough well my boy this thomery affair is as fine as set out as if it were at the president's although it was one o'clock in the morning both on the boulevard malasherbes and at the entrance to the rue de monceau there was movement and activity if as seemed likely there was a crush in the great reception rooms of the thomery mansion it was certain that outside the crowd had to form up in line to get near the counters where the wine sellers were serving their customers without a moment's intermission serving them with drinks of every description thus there was a hubbub there was noise and roistering clamour all around most of the chauffeurs coachmen and servants knew one another mingling with all this aristocracy of the servant class were pickpockets mendicants obsequious and wheedling who offered themselves as understudies to these of the upper ten of the servant world and these aristocrats were ready to seize this chance of a little liberty and at the same time play the generous patron to these poor failures in life's battle in fact they gave more generous tips than their masters for did they not rub shoulders with misery and thus realize only too vividly the measureless horrors of destitution ernestine and mamille lost themselves in the noisy crowd they were all eyes and ears for everything going on around them whilst keeping in view their two accomplices the beetle and the beard this was more than usually difficult because they were disguised almost out of recognition the beard was muffled in a blue blouse and a big soft hat which gave him the look of a peasant who had wandered into a crowd with which he had nothing in common the beetle was capitally disguised as a coachman in good service who was out of a situation but who from vanity and custom sports the emblems of office he was continually chewing a quid of tobacco for such is the habit of coachmen who cannot smoke on their seats and thus console themselves with two sous worth of roll tobacco the beetle stopped beside a chauffeur who had just got down from his car a magnificent limousine lined with cream cloth while its exterior was a dark maroon in the best taste why it's casimir cried the beetle going up to the chauffeur with hands outstretched and smiling face mechanically the chauffeur addressed as casimir responded to the offered hand-clasp but after a short silence he said in a questioning tone quite frankly i cannot recall you can't you remember me cried the beetle why don't you remember cesar cesar who was with rothschild last year no casimir could not remember but he was quite willing to believe that he knew cesar for he had seen and known so many since he had been in the service of princess sonia danidoff that there was nothing extraordinary about his forgetfulness besides cesar looked quite a decent fellow and had a taking face and one only had to look at that beaming countenance of his to be sure that an invitation to take a drink together would soon be forthcoming the beetle satisfied that he had so easily made a friend of the chauffeur of sonia danidoff whom he had only known by sight for the last forty-eight hours did in fact suggest their taking a glass together the beetle had indeed come up to expectations drink was casimir's besetting sin excellent chauffeur solid and serious fellow as he was he had two defects he was addicted to tippling though he never drank to excess and never got drunk also he was fond of a gossip 
he could talk for hours without stopping the beetle had been posted up regarding casimir's little weaknesses and tastes thus nothing was easier than to set trap after trap into each of which the simple fellow fell as they were set fell fatally the beetle introducing the beard to casimir under the name of father india rubber an old codger whose trade was to buy and sell tires to chauffeurs tires new and also second-hand at this moment a young ragamuffin appeared on the scenes he asked if he might be left in charge of the car it was mamil the young hooligan who had followed the conversation of the three men and of casimir in particular whilst keeping in the background now intervened at the right moment he made his offer just as the chauffeur was looking about him in hopes of finding some poverty-stricken creatures into whose charge he could give his car casimir gave him twenty sous as an earnest of what was to follow in the way of coin saying take great care of my little shanty don't let anyone come mooching round it and when i return you shall have double what you've just had thank you mister cried mamille bowing low before the chauffeur you may rest assured i shall keep a good look out mamille exchanged signs of understanding with his two accomplices whilst they talking as they went drew the innocent casimir towards the nearest tavern which was crowded with wine-bibbers mamille as faithful guardian of the limousine soon got bored although big ernestine was prowling around and came to have a minute's talk with him now and again they dared not be seen together too much for fear of attracting attention as time went on mamille was surprised that neither the beetle nor the beard came to report progress but at long last the majestic outline of the beard was seen at the corner of the rue Monceau the pretended seller of india rubber was coming out of the tavern he hastened to mamille and in a low distinct voice he gave some hurried instructions for now there was no time to lose that idiot would never get done with his stories about motor-cars and all that stuff and rubbish what's that to us but keep your ears open now mamille it seems there are still fifteen liters of petrol in the tank and that would take it a long way for the motor consumes very little but this shanty has got to stop about five hundred yards from here at the corner of the rue de Monceau and the rue de teheran it's by this way casimir will take his baroness back from the ball well what you have to do is to take fourteen liters and a half from that tank and pitch them in the gutter when casimir finds that his petrol has given out he will have to go in search of more it's during his absence that we will work the trick on the pretty princess we'll perform an operation on her and amputate her jewelry the whole lot the beard drew from under his blouse an empty bottle which he had stolen in the tavern here's your measure count carefully fourteen liters and a half that done wait quietly till casimir turns up your part in the story will be forty sous and not to rouse his suspicions then while he goes up to the avenue de valois to take up the princess you and ernestine have to gallop off to the corner of the rue de monceau and the rue de teheran and then wait mamille with the agility of a monkey and the ability of a first-rate chauffeur for there was nothing he did not know in the way of applied mechanics as became an aviator executed to the letter his accomplice's orders the beard meanwhile had returned to the tavern and casimir suddenly all was activity in the world of carriages and coachmen the great ball was drawing to its end casimir was once more in possession of his motor and had generously tipped his understudy thereupon the hooligan had made off as fast as his legs would carry him ernestine joined him at the appointed spot there the two rogues waited listen cried big ernestine some fifteen minutes later she stared in the direction of the boulevard malesherbes with neck outstretched and straining eyeballs at last after an agonizing wait she and mamille saw the carriages driving by attention cried big ernestine in a sharp whisper everybody's on the move at last the beetle and the beard hidden in the crowd which thronged the approaches to the tomary mansion awaited the departure of princess sonya danidoff the idea of this rich prey excited them then as they stared at the first outflow of departing guests the two bandits could not but notice that far from looking gay and animated as people do who have danced and supped well these guests of tomary showed pale dejected faces in fact they had all the appearance of people under the influence of some tragic emotion they look pretty down in the mouth don't they whispered the beard in the beetle's ear that's a fact you'd think they were returning from a funeral then a vague rumour began to circulate 
confirmation followed spread insensibly within the tomary mansion was passed on by the lackeys spread from the pavements to the avenue people whispered of incomprehensible things incredible but which little by little took definite shape it was said that the tomary ball had just become the scene of an accident of a drama of a robbery of a crime the police and of the highest grade had intervened the news spread like a train of ignited gunpowder nevertheless if tomary's guests were cognizant of the details they did not take the beggars and pickpockets into their confidence among the light-fingered gentry conjectures were rife the beetle and the beard who tried to catch odds and ends of talk separately joined each other again looking crestfallen discomfited the beetle broke silence with an oath adding i am certain we have been done someone has gone in before us been too smart for us beard nodded he was of the same opinion but who then could have had the audacity to plan such an attempt and carry it out too who could have had the same idea as he and his comrades and to realize it successfully whoever it was had proved himself the better man in spite of himself the bandit in thought formulated one word fantomas End of chapter 7. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Section 8 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel, Alain, and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 8 end of the ball when sonia danidoff entered thomery's ballroom she made a sensation it was not far off midnight when she appeared in all her brilliant beauty and dazzling array leaning on the arm of her host and fiance who bore his honors proudly dancers paused to admire this handsome couple then the hungarian band redoubled their efforts and the whirling eddying waltz started afresh more gay more inspiriting than before in a corner opposite the musicians a group of persons were in animated talk among them sonia danidoff thomery and jerome fandor the music was their theme some admired wagner and the classics others voted for the moderns for the sugariest of waltzes for the romantic the bizarre for the profane like myself declared thomery laughing gypsy music has its charms oh cried sonia danidoff you are not going to tell me that such hackneyed things as the smile of spring and the blush rose waltz are to your taste her tone was reproachful but her smile was charming none too the fashionable banker who was fluttering about the princess hastened to take her side come now thomery you would not put your signature to that jerome fandor who had just joined the group declared for my part i thoroughly agree with you my dear monsieur thomery sonia danidoff looked her surprise thomery replied with a touch of malice monsieur fandor is like myself the tinconoy is more to his taste more than wagner's operatic big guns finished fandor then turning to the princess who still wore her air of surprise yes princess i confess it my taste in music is deplorable it comes from absolute ignorance i do not understand these modern symphonies the simple romantic suits me best and that is queried nantou just some music-hall air or ditty answered fandor with a smile as frank as his confession the princess was amused at this little pseudo-artistic discussion she was about to speak when a couple of waltzers broke into the group and scattered it jerome fandor slipped away and wandered through the gorgeous reception rooms here and there when caught up in the throng and forced to halt or when pressed against the wall of the ballroom scraps of conversation mingled with the strains of the hungarian band fell on his retentive ears he took refuge at last in the embrasure of a window but his retreat was soon invaded by two young men who he gathered had run across each other in the gallery and were continuing their talk about old times and new come tell me dear charlie what has been happening to you since we left the school bah i go from the madeleine to the opera nearly every evening and then back again i go to bed late and get up late 
i go out a good deal as you see sometimes i dance but very rarely i often play bridge and that is about all it's not very interesting but you old boy i heard you had got a jolly good billet my dear andral oh hardly that dear fellow but i am well on the way to one i fancy i had the good luck to be introduced to tomery and it so happened he was wanting a young engineer for one of his sugar plantations in san domingo good lord at san domingo among the niggers that's right not so bad though it and the boulevards are a few miles apart but on the other hand i am interested in my work and i am married to a charming woman spanish won't you introduce me to your wife when we are nearer to her old fellow i came to paris by myself to talk big business with tomery i am only here for a fortnight now do point out some of the celebrities you know everybody charlie adjusted his eyeglasses and looked about the room ah there's an interesting pair that old fellow and the young one who are so extraordinarily alike the barbe nentules bankers for generations in the financial swim and mixed up in all sorts of big affairs sugar among them look here that's the widow of an iron master Alouat. she is passing close to the orchestra not bad looking in spite of her mahogany-coloured hair granddaughter of a famous french peer flavonia de saint ange ah i breathe again it's a detail but i am quite delighted general de Rigny's daughters have at last found partners they are ugly poor things and they've dressed themselves in rose pink as though they were schoolgirls a fine name a distinguished position but no fortune and no husband ah now there's someone who looks as if he were in luck and he is too matrimonial luck the affair is settled this evening it's whispered it will interest you particularly for the lucky fellow is none other than tomery what tomery yes tomery although he is well over fifty he means to commit matrimony i quite envy him his future wife my andral there she is that stately dame who is going toward the last of the reception rooms all alone rather haughty but a noble creature it's princess sonia danidoff related to the czar in some distant way and with an immense fortune just look dear boy at those splendid jewels on that beautiful neck of hers they say she's got on seven hundred thousand francs worth and the rest to match millions to swell the sugar refiner's pouch she is to lead the cotillion with him so there's no doubt about the betrothal by the by you are going to stay for the cotillion hm i but you must you simply must we must sit together at supper we have still so much to say besides if you hurry off like that i fancy tomery won't be best pleased oh i say there he is coming our way there's no denying it he is a fine figure of a man though he is in the fifties but 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 do look what is the matter with him he looks as if he had seen a ghost sonya danidoff who had been waltzing with tomery was a little out of breath a quick glance in a mirror showed the lovely princess that her cheeks were rather flushed i am scarlet she thought with that touch of feminine exaggeration characteristic of her she was a true daughter of eve at that exact moment she felt a slight tug at the bottom of her skirt and at the same time a black coat was making profuse apologies it was monsieur nantul i am in despair princess cried the banker but no one is quite responsible for his movements in such a crush. i am very much afraid that i have stepped on the muslin of your ravishing toilette and have slightly torn it the princess protested that it did not matter in the least and the banker moved away bowing low and pouring out apologies and regrets as soon as he had left her the princess showed her annoyance how could she lead the cotillon with this tear in her dress slight though it might be and the cotillion would begin in less than half an hour then she remembered that her fiance had led her on her arrival to a little drawing-room quite away from the reception rooms at the end of the gallery that she might leave her cloak there saying dear princess i have prepared this boudoir for you and you only sonya decided to retire to this boudoir at once and repair the damage to her dress as she passed the cloak-room on her way a maid offered her services the princess refused them if she could not have nadine she preferred to manage for herself besides she saw that two pins concealed in the silk muslin would put her dress to rights 
and a touch of powder to her cheeks would bring her color down to a becoming tint she was considerably amused at the veritable arsenal of flasks and boxes of perfumes which Tomery, as became an attentive lover, had placed there in her honour. The little boudoir had been transformed into a comfortable lady's dressing-room. Everything was provided, down to a glass of sugar and water, down to a little phial of alcohol and mint sonia opened a powder-box then like all the women of her race having a passion for perfumes she took up a scent sprayer and lavishly sprinkled her throat and the lower part of her face with what was labelled essence of violets the princess may have suffered from the intense heat of the ballroom and required rest without realizing it for she felt slightly faint a little sick almost a desire to sleep she slipped down on to a low divan which occupied a corner of the room she drew deep breaths breathing in the perfume a sweet rather strange scent from the sprayer the scent is sickly she thought if only i had some eau de cologne without rising for she felt a real lassitude stealing over her she looked round for the eau de cologne she wanted tomery's arsenal did not contain any there was only one sprayer and that sonia danidoff held in her hand she sprinkled herself a second time hoping that the perfume would revive her but on the contrary her fatigue increased her eyes closed for a moment when she opened them again the room was in darkness sonia tried to rise from the divan an overpowering torpor though not disagreeable was benumbing her whole body and before her eyes bright lights seemed to float succeeded by thick darkness her head turned round and round she strove to cry out but her voice stuck in her throat her body jerked with a feeble convulsive movement she heard indistinctly an unknown voice murmuring let yourself go sleep have no fear sonia danidoff essayed a momentary resistance then she succumbed and lost all consciousness of her surroundings absolute silence reigned in the boudoir tomery had reserved for the sole use of his beautiful betrothed when he arrived to lead her to the cotillion he found the door shut he knocked discreetly there was no reply repeated knocking evoked no audible answer tomery opened the door the room was in total darkness he switched on the electric light the boudoir was brilliantly illuminated the sight that met his startled eyes was so moving that he grew livid with horror and rushed to the side of his betrothed sonia danidoff was extended on the divan motionless and pale as death a hoarse and laboured breath came from her heaving bosom at irregular intervals on the exquisite skin of neck and breast were spattered streaks of blood beside himself tomery rushed away in search of help it was at this terrible crisis that the fiance of sonia danidoff had attracted the attention of charlie whose friend the young engineer andral was the protege of the man whose awful pallor and distracted air spelt tragedy tomery his countenance ravaged by intense emotion his hands clenched shaken by nervous tremors hastened with unsteady steps in the direction of the gallery leading to the ante-room suddenly a woman's shrieks broke in on the charming harmonies of a slow waltz which the orchestra was rendering at the moment there was an irresistible rush toward the boudoir where two half-fainting women had collapsed on chairs and the famous surgeon dr marvier was doing his utmost to prevent the crowd from entering the room the word went round that a tragedy had taken place a death princess sonia danidoff was in the room lying dead the words crime and murder were freely bandied about murmurs of assassin robber assassination could be heard some twenty of the guests who had entered the boudoir could give details the dreadful rumours were true sonia danidoff they declared was stretched out on the floor covered with blood her breast bare her pearls had vanished a horrible sight the uproar died down an icy silence reigned the dancers drew together in groups discussing the terrifying tragedy several women were still in a fainting condition pallid men were opening windows that fresh air might circulate in the overheated rooms on all sides they were watching for the return of their host tomery remained invisible general Dorini called his two daughters to his side and spoke words of affectionate encouragement for they were much upset 
the old soldier marched off with them in the direction of the grand staircase and toward the cloakroom on the landing as he was preparing to take over his coat and hat one of the footmen went up to him and said a few words in a low voice what what cried the general what's the meaning of this not to leave the house but i am under suspicion then it is shameful i never heard such a thing a butler approached the irate general and said very respectfully i beg of you general to speak lower a definite order to that effect was given to us ten minutes ago directly monsieur thomery was aware of the accident he had the entrance doors closed and had the house surrounded by the detectives who were downstairs on duty the sergeant is there to see this order carried out you cannot leave the premises it is not that you are under suspicion general of course not but perhaps in this way they may succeed in finding the guilty person who has certainly not left the house for no one has gone from the house for at least an hour general Rini had calmed down he understood why his host had issued the order he retired to a corner of the gallery with his daughters yvonne and martha the poor things seemed stunned the reception rooms slowly emptied the guests crowded onto the veranda and into the smoking room there was a buzz of talk queries comments conjectures it ceased abruptly monsieur thomery had just appeared at the top of the grand staircase accompanied by a gentleman whose simple black coat was in striking contrast to the light dresses and brilliant uniforms of the guests someone whispered monsieur havard it was in fact the chief of the detective police force within a couple of minutes of his frightful discovery thomery had rushed to the telephone and had called up police headquarters it was a piece of unexpected good fortune to find monsieur havard there at so advanced an hour he had immediately responded to the call in person whilst crossing the reception rooms thomery talked to him in a low voice accept my grateful thanks monsieur for having answered my appeal for help so quickly no sooner did i discover the body of my princess than i lost no time in having all the exits from the premises watched unfortunately i was obliged to leave my reception rooms for quite a quarter of an hour so that i cannot tell you what happened there if only i had been able to remain with my guests i might possibly have surprised some movement some gesture some look which would have put me on the track of this murderous thief unfortunately monsieur havard interrupted smiling that does not matter monsieur if the guilty person is among your guests and has in some way betrayed himself i shall hear of it there are at least four or five plain-clothes men among the dancers i can assure you of that i can assure you to the contrary replied thomery i know my guests know who have been admitted here i also am sure of what i say insisted monsieur havard there is scarcely a ball a reception however select it may be where you will not find a certain number of our men thomery made no reply to this they had arrived at the door of the fatal room the doctor was standing beside the victim dr marvier reassured monsieur havard he announced that the princess had been almost literally felled to the ground by a most powerful soporific and was in no real danger she would certainly regain consciousness in the course of an hour or two but she must be kept perfectly quiet that was absolutely necessary monsieur havard did not question the doctor's statement after a rapid glance he was able to form his own opinion there had been no struggle the victim's wounds were due to the haste with which the thief had torn the jewels from sonia danidoff's neck he next considered the two windows which with the door opening on to the gallery were the only means of entrance and exit the room had there were strong iron shutters behind the windows these could not be very easily opened in any case it was impossible to close them again from the outside the thief must have been in the house probably in the ballroom and had followed the princess into this little retiring room but what had been the princess's motive for coming here alone monsieur havard had learned that the room had not been thrown open to the other guests then he perceived that the lace at the bottom of her dress was undone he bent down and examined it carefully two pins hastily stuck in kept together a piece of this lace the conclusion monsieur havard came to was that the princess having a rent in her dress had wished to be alone for a minute or two in order to repair the damage 
and that while she was stooping toward the bottom of her skirt the assassin had thrown her to the ground and despoiled her of her jewels the chief of the detective force turned to tomary abruptly i shall be obliged to follow a course of action which may rather annoy your guests but they must excuse me everything leads me to think that the guilty person is on the premises since no one has gone away i must hold an investigation at once i am going to cross-examine your guests probe them thoroughly and i wish to put them through their paces in your office monsieur thomery one by one i will begin with you so that your guests may take my questioning with a good grace it is only a mere matter of form a pure formality the investigations were lengthy and trying and led to no result whatever fandor who was preoccupied by this fresh drama in which he had taken some part far too slight to please him was putting on his overcoat when he stopped dead a voice an unrecognizable voice had murmured in his ear attention fandor it is serious our journalist turned round in a flash ah this time he would find out who the mysterious unknown was the unknown who wished to influence by word written and word spoken the course of these investigations he had taken in hand anonymous friend concealed adversary he must at all costs clear up the mystery a dozen people were crowding round fandor insisting on being attended to in the cloak-room no one noticed the journalist no one seemed interested in what he was doing fandor examined every one of thomery's guests who were standing about him he knew some of them by name some he knew by sight he searched their faces with penetrating eyes but in vain some were commonplace looking others calm others impenetrable hang it all he grumbled he went off furious and upset end of chapter eight read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com section nine of messengers of evil by marcel elaine and pierre Silvestre. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter nine fingerprints after having interrogated all the witnesses of last night's tragedy he could get in touch with jerome fandor returned to the palais de justice all the same he confessed to himself i must admit that up to the present i do not know anything very definite about it this princess sonia danidoff has managed to get robbed in a most extraordinary way at one o'clock in the morning havard declares that the thief can be none other than one of the guests and thereupon every person present has to submit to being searched an exhaustive search nothing comes of it then bertillon arrives on the scene and it seems he has obtained very distinct imprints of finger marks if they are as distinct as all that the task of the police will be simplified but on the other hand is it likely the guilty person will be so simple as to respond to the summons issued by the public prosecutor a general summons issued to all Tomery's guests to parade in Bertillon's office for the finger-mark test. Not he. Why, the moment he heard of it, he would make for the train and pass the frontier. When his cab arrived at the Palais, Fandor uttered a big sigh of satisfaction. There are a good many things I am not clear about. Let us hope Bertillon will give me some information. The entrance to the anthropometric department was under the discreet observation of two detectives. Oh, thought Fandor, they think it probable there will be an immediate arrest, do they? We are going to have some complications, I foresee, in connection with the finger-mark ceremony. He sent in his card, and a few minutes after he found himself in the presence of Monsieur Bertillon. Well, what is it you want me to tell you? asked this famous man of science why dear master everything that took place last night is it true that you have summoned here all thomery's guests have you obtained such perfect reprints that in your hasty examination you can be certain of identifying them with those of the persons who will pass through your office to undergo the test bertillon smiled oh my dear fellow you are of those who do not put much faith in the results of my tests for police purposes that let me tell you is because you are not acquainted with our procedure the impressions i obtained are distinct 
precise as can be if an arrest is to be made before long it will be made on sure grounds fandor bowed i accept your statement dear master but do be kind enough to tell me what happened after my departure oh nothing very extraordinary of course you know about the affair how princess sonia danidoff was discovered what i know is that thomery found one of his guests princess sonia danidoff in a dead faint in a small drawing-room that dr dumarvier declared she had been rendered unconscious that the theft of a pearl necklace worn by the victim had been the motive of this criminal attempt that monsieur havard called in at once first made sure that no one had left the house and then had everyone on the premises searched and that is really all i know about it well havard did not find anything no one was caught with compromising jewels in their possession the last guest gone the house searched from top to bottom not a single pearl had been found i arrived just when the investigations had terminated at the moment when they were about to take the princess home she had regained consciousness by this time and declared she knew nothing except that she had fallen asleep after using a perfume sprayer this has been seized and chloroform has been found in it but no one seems to know who filled the sprayer with the stupefying perfume did monsieur havard send for you yes he telephoned you know of course that i am always asked to intervene now in any ticklish affair well dr dumarvier an expert in his way noticed that the princess had been half strangled by the thief in his haste to secure the pearl collar and he wished me to search for fingerprints on the nape of the victim's neck to discover the assassin's signature in fact and there were some a quantity the princess had been slightly wounded in the nape of the neck blood had been pressed onto the skin of her neck and it was easy to take a cast of one of the fingers was that sufficient yes and no such an impression is something but there is better than that the thief must have given the neck a violent squeeze with his hands consequently there is a complete impression of the hand that i had to get fandor instinctively put his hand to his neck as if he were squeezing it he said are such impressions imperceptible yes to the eye but not to the photographing apparatus it is thoroughly established that the pattern formed by the innumerable lines which furrow the fleshy part of our fingers is as peculiarly characteristic of each individual as the form of his nose of his ears or the colour of his eyes the curves or rings the various forms taken by these lines already exist in the newly born and never change to the day of his death even in case of a burn the skin grows again the ridges reappear exactly as they were before the accident look you one can obtain by this method this test such results as you would never dream of for example by taking these imprints i obtained in the early hours of today as a basis i can tell you with almost absolute accuracy the height of the individual this is marvellous cried fandor the service your department renders then is to abolish legal blunders that is so every individual identified is identified plainly irrefutably unfortunately we cannot always obtain perfect imprints on the spot where the crime is committed but this night ah as i told you the impressions were most satisfactory i have the thief's hand the whole of it i will even go so far as to declare that the fellow who committed the crime has already been through my hands i recognize that hand you shall see whether or no i have made a mistake bertillon pressed the bell and asked the official who answered it have you identified the imprints i sent you just now yes sir this man has already been measured here it is register ninety two hundred bertillon turned to fandor you see i was not mistaken all i have to do is turn up my alphabetical index and for this very month for the number is a recent one and i shall know the name of the old offender he must be one as he is catalogued here who has committed this assault whilst speaking monsieur bertillon was turning over the leaves of an enormous register ah here is the ninety two hundred series suddenly the book slipped from his hands and he exclaimed the guilty man is as who questioned fandor is jacques delon the hand that has robbed princess sonia danidoff is the hand of jacques delon but it is impossible bertillon shrugged his shoulders impossible why since the proof is there but jacques delon is dead he was the thief of yesterday's crime you are making a mistake i am not making a mistake jacques delon is the thief i tell you this was too much for jerome fandor he could not contain himself 
and i tell you monsieur bertillon that i know that i am certain positively certain that jacques dollon is dead now then the man of science shook his head i in my turn say you are making a mistake look at the imprints i have here that of jacques dollon taken a few days ago and this made from the impressions obtained this very night or to be exact in the early morning hours of to-day they are identical one can be exactly superimposed on the other coincidence there is no such coincidence possible besides monsieur bertillon took up a powerful magnifying glass look at these characteristic details just look at the lines of the thumb all out of shape the presentment of the thumb itself is not normal either it denotes habitual movement in a certain direction it is the thumb of a painter of a potter oh it is all as clear as daylight believe me there is no doubt about it jacques dollon is the guilty person but repeated fandor obstinately jacques dollon is dead i swear to you he is dead this assertion made no impression on the man of science as to whether jacques dollon is alive or dead that is for the police to decide for my part i can declare that the man who committed the theft yesterday evening is the identical man who passed through my hands some days ago and that man is certainly jacques dollon jerome fandor left monsieur bertillon the young journalist was perplexed if the fingerprints on the neck of princess sonia danidoff were beyond dispute those of jacques dollon then the mystery surrounding this affair and not this affair only but a series of incidents so far from being cleared up was more impenetrable than ever but fandor was obsessed by the idea of fantomas of fantomas in the depths of mystery presiding over this series of dramatic occurrences yes fantomas is certainly in this he cried but dollon has left traces of himself here has it were put his signature his identification mark to this crime but dollon is not fantomas besides dollon is dead i have proofs of it yes he is dead well then what to make of it fandor could not make anything of it end of chapter nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 10 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 10 Identity of a Navy. The Barbain on Tour Bank is certainly gorgeous, thought Jerome Fondor as he traversed the hall on the ground floor where the massive mahogany furniture, the thick carpets, the deep comfortable chairs the sober elegance of the window curtains breathed an atmosphere of luxury and good taste and decidedly banking is the best of businesses added our young journalist an attendant advanced to meet him what do you want monsieur will you take in my card to monsieur nantul i shall be glad to have a few minutes talk with him the attendant bowed on a personal matter monsieur a uh, personal matter yes jerome fandor wanted to interview the barbey nantouls on the subject of the recent occurrences which had roused paris opinion to the highest degree mysterious occurrences on which no light seemed to have been thrown so far not only were the barbey nantouls the bankers of the baroness de vibray but they had been present at thomery's ball when the attack on princess sonia danidoff had taken place would they allow themselves to be interviewed fandor decided that they certainly would for they were business men and was he not going to give them a free advertisement the attendant a stately individual returned monsieur nantul is sorry he cannot see you he is taking the chair at an important committee meeting but monsieur barbey will see you for a few minutes that is to say if he will do instead of monsieur nantul in that case i will see monsieur barbey said fandor rising following the attendant fandor traversed the whole length of the bank and passing the half-open door of monsieur nantul's office the name on the door told him this he noticed that it was empty monsieur barbey received him coldly and with a solemn bow fandor's reply was a pleasant smile i know said he that your time is precious monsieur barbey so i will come straight to the object of my call 
you must be aware of the profound impression caused by the double crimes recently committed on the persons of madame de vibray and the princess sonia danidoff it is true monsieur that i have followed in the papers the account of the investigations regarding them but in what way does it concern you finished fandor good heavens monsieur is it not a fact that the baroness de vibray was your client and were you not present at monsieur thomery's ball that is so monsieur but if you are hoping that i can supply you with further details than those already published you will be disappointed i myself have learned a good deal about these crimes only from reading your articles monsieur can you confirm the statement that madame de vibray was ruined i do not think i am betraying a professional secret if i say that madame de vibray had had very heavy losses quite recently and princess sonia danidoff i do not think she is one of our clients you do not think so but monsieur you cannot suppose that we know all our clients our business is a very extensive one and neither nantoul nor i could possibly know the names of all those who do business with us you know the name of jacques delon yes i knew young delon he was introduced to me by madame de vibray who asked me to give him a helping hand and i willingly did so i can only regret that my confidence was so ill-placed do you believe him guilty then not really i certainly do so do all your readers monsieur is that not so but whilst monsieur barbet was regarding fandor with some astonishment because of his half avowal that he himself was not sure of delon's guilt the door was flung open with violence and monsieur nantoul out of breath looking thoroughly upset rushed into the room followed by five or six men unknown to jerome fandor and showing traces of fatigue and emotion also good heavens what is it cried monsieur barbey rising to meet his partner the matter is cried monsieur nantoul that an abominable robbery has just been committed where rue de quatre septembre still panting he began to give details fandor did not wait to hear more he rushed from the barbey nantoul bank and made for the place de l'opera at top speed in consequence of the extraordinary occurrence which monsieur nantoul had hastened to report to his partner a considerable crowd had flocked to the scene of the accident but barriers had been quickly erected and the crowd directed by the police were able to circulate in orderly fashion when fandor arrived on the scene the agile young journalist had made his way to the front row of the curious and was bent on entering the stone and wood yards of the works forbidden to the public the usual palisade no longer existed owing to the landslip just as he was searching in his pocket for the precious identification card which the police grant to the reporters connected with the big newspapers fondor was jostled by an individual coming out of the yards it was a navvy all covered with mortar white dust and mud he was without a hat and held his right hand pressed against his cheek between his fingers there filtered a few drops of blood the glances of the man and the journalist met and fandor felt as though someone had struck him a blow in the heart the navvy had given him so strange a look fandor thought he had read in his eyes a threat and an invitation whilst our journalist hesitated troubled by this sudden encounter the man moved off forcing his way through the crowd then fandor caught sight of some of his colleagues stumbling about amidst the ruins and rubble in the stone yard this reassured him if he followed the navvy and he had the strongest inclination to do so he could telephone to some reporter friend who would supply him with the necessary details for his article on the accident he had got some facts already a sudden collapse of stones and mortar had buried a handcart in which were large bars of gold belonging to the barbey nantoul bank but the precious vehicle had soon been rescued and they were taking it to the bank under escort satisfied as to this fandor followed with his eyes this strange navvy who was going further and further away fandor had an intuition a very strong feeling that he must follow the trail of this man and make him talk it was of the utmost importance something told him this was so the navvy was not simply going away he had the air of a man in flight fandor who was following now and keenly observant noticed the hesitating movements of the man then there was an astonishing move on the navvy's part he hailed a taxi and got in fandor had the good luck to find another taxi at once jumping in he said to the driver 
follow the 4227 gh which is in front of you don't let it out distance you you shall have a good tip the chauffeur a young alert fellow understood there was a chase in question and amused at the idea of pursuing a comrade through the crowded streets of paris he set off he adroitly cut through a file of carriages and caught up with taxi 4227 gh he then proceeded to follow closely in its track fondor keen as a bloodhound on the scent kept watch over their progress to an unknown destination they rolled along the avenue de l'opera they cut across the rue de rivoli then when they were going at a good pace through the place du carousel fandor felt much moved by memories of past times those days of great and wonderful adventures when he would follow this very route to keep some exciting appointment with his good friend juve how frequent those appointments used to be when the famous detective was alive and so actively at work the work of unearthing criminals those pests of society off fandor used to set when the longed-for summons came and would meet juva in his little flat on the left side of the seine ah those were times indeed when a lad fandor had been practically adopted by the famous detective young jerome fandor had served a kind of apprenticeship with juva and this had brought him in close touch with the ups and downs of a number of crime dramas he and juva together had even been the voluntary or involuntary heroes of some of them then the tragic disappearance of juva had occurred when fandor had escaped death by a kind of miracle after that dreadful date our journalist had found himself alone isolated with not a soul to whom he cared to confide his perplexities his anxieties his hopes fandor shuddered at the thought of this the taxi had just crossed the bridge de saint perez had followed the quay for a few miles then rounding the fine arts school they entered the old and narrow rue bonaparte what was this of course it could only be a coincidence but still rue bonaparte why that only brought the memory of juva more vividly to mind for juva had lived in this street and now a few yards further on they would pass before the modest dwelling where for years the detective had made his home keeping jealously hidden from all and sundry this asylum this secret retreat ah what happy hours what jolly times what tragic moments too had fandor not passed in that little flat on the fourth floor how they had chatted away in the detective's comfortable study then fandor full of spirit would come and go from room to room unable to sit still all fire and activity and juva would remain in one place calm full of thought sometimes sunk in a reverie often silent for hours at a time his eyes obstinately fixed on the ceiling smoking methodically mechanically even his eternal cigarette oh those good good days gone forever after the disastrous disappearance of juva fandor had not gone near the rue bonaparte for six months it was all too painful to find again the familiar rooms and no juva it was too painful however one fine day he determined to go and see what had happened to his friend's old home alas in paris the lapse of half a year suffices to alter the most familiar scene in rue bonaparte the former house porters had left their place had been taken by a stout sulky woman who gave evasive replies to fandor's questions he extracted from her the information that the tenant of the fourth floor flat had died that his furniture had been cleared out very soon after his death and the flat had been let to an insurance inspector fandor was roused from this retrospect he grew pale his heart seemed to stop its beating the taxi he was pursuing had slowed down had drawn up beside the pavement had stopped in front of juba's old home fandor saw the navvy descend from the taxi pay his fare and enter the house still keeping his right hand pressed to his cheek without a moment's reflection fandor leapt from his taxi flung a five-franc piece to his driver and without waiting for the change he rushed into the house whose passages and stairs were so familiar the navvy was swiftly mounting the stairs in front of our excited young journalist who was close on his quarry's heels the two men were panting as they went up that dark staircase at the fourth floor fandor was nearly overcome by emotion for the man entered juva's old flat as if he had a right to do so he was on the point of shutting the door in the face of his pursuer but fandor had foreseen this he slipped through with a forceful push and caught the navvy by his jacket 
Quick as lightning, the navvy turned, and the two men stood face to face. The result was startling. Speechless, they stared at each other for what seemed an interminable moment. Then, with a strangled cry, Fondor fell into the man's arms and was crushed in a strong embrace. Two cries escaped from their lips at the same moment. Juba! Fondor! When he came to himself again, Fondor found he was lying in one of the comfortable leather armchairs in Juva's study. His temples and the lobes of his ears were being bathed with some refreshing liquid. The commingled scent of ether and eau de cologne was in the air. When he opened his eyes, it was with difficulty that he could credit the sight that met them. Juva, his dear Juva, was bending over him, gazing at him tenderly, watching his return to consciousness with some anxiety. Fondor vainly strove to rise. He felt dazed. Fondor, murmured Juva, in a voice trembling with emotion. Fondor, my little Fondor, my lad, my own dear lad. Ah, yes, this was Juva, his own Juva, whom Fondor saw before him. He had aged a little, this dear Juva of his, had gone slightly grey at the temples. There were some fresh lines on his forehead, at the corners of his mouth, too. But it was the Juva of old times, for all that juva alert supple robust juva in his full vigour in the prime of life oh a living breathing fatherly juva his respected master and most intimate friend restored to him after mourning the irreparable loss of him and his incomprehensible disappearance while fondor slowly came to himself juva had lessened the disordered state of his appearance he had taken off his workman's clothes and also the red beard which he had worn when he ran up against the journalist in the place de l'opera as soon as fondor was himself again not only did he feel intense joy a quite wild joy but he also knew the good of a keen curiosity now he would know why the detective had felt obliged to disappear officially at any rate from paris life for so long a period protestations of faithful attachment or unalterable affection poured from fandor's excited lips intermingled with questions he wanted to know everything at once juva smiled in silence and gazed most affectionately at his dear lad at last he said i am not going to ask you for news fandor for i have seen you repeatedly and i know you are quite all right why i do believe you have put on flesh a little juva was smiling that enigmatic smile of his Fondor grew impatient, on fire with curiosity. Ah, this was indeed the Juva of bygone days. Imperturbable, ironical, rather exasperating also. However, Juva took pity on Fondor, who was still under the influence of the shock he had received. Well now, dear lad, did you recognize me a while ago? Fondor pulled himself together. To tell you the truth, Juva, I did not, but when our glances met I had an intuition, a kind of interior revelation of what I had to do, and without any beating about the bush. I knew I had to follow you, follow you wherever you went. Juva nodded his approval. Very good, dear fellow. Your reply gives me infinite pleasure, and on two counts. In the first place I perceive that your remarkable instinct for getting on to the right scent, strengthened by my teaching, has improved immensely since we parted and in the second place i am delighted to know that i made my head and face so unrecognizable that even my old familiar friend fandor did not know me when we were brought face to face why this disguise juva demanded fandor his countenance alight with curiosity how was it i came across you at the very spot where the barbe nantul load of gold had been submerged for the moment under bricks and mortar and with regard to that juva how comes it juva cut fandor short gently fandor gently you are putting the cart before the horse old fellow and if we continue to talk by fits and starts never shall we come to the end of all we have to say to each other and must say are you aware fandor that we have been drawn into a succession of incomprehensible occurrences a mysterious network of them but i have good hopes that now we shall be able to work together again and i like to think that if we follow the different trails we have each started on we shall end up by it was fondor's turn to interrupt hang it all juva i partly understand you of course but there's a lot i don't know yet what are you after dear juva are you as i am on the track of jacques delon there was a pause then juva said i shall reserve the details for our leisure what matters now is that i should make clear to you the principal lines my existence has followed during the past three years or so 
a few minutes will suffice to put you in possession of the main facts now listen the narrative went back to the time when juve aided by fandor was close on the heels of their mortal enemy the mysterious and elusive fantomas the detective and the journalist had succeeded in cooping up the formidable bandit in a house at newly belonging to a great english lady known under the name of lady beltham this englishwoman was the mistress and accomplice of the notorious fantomas footnote nine see the exploits of juve but at the precise moment when juve was about to arrest him a frightful explosion occurred and the building blown up by dynamite collapsed in ruins burying the two friends and some fifteen policemen and detectives rescuers were on the spot in a very short time and uninterruptedly for forty-eight hours they searched among the ruins for the victims of the disaster dead or alive by a miraculous piece of good fortune fandor had been but slightly hurt and at the end of a few days he was as well as ever but the poor fellow had lost his best friend juva the search for juva had been a useless one several corpses could not be identified owing to the injuries they had sustained and as it seemed incredible that the detective could have escaped they had concluded that one of the unrecognizable bodies must be his juva however was not one of the dead saved in as miraculous a fashion as fandor had been less injured even a few seconds after the frightful crash he had been able to rise and make his escape the distracted detective had raced away from the scene of disaster in search of fandor and also in pursuit of fantomas for he believed that both had made their escape after wandering about for some hours he had returned to mingle with the crowd of rescuers and had learned that fandor had been found and was not dangerously hurt on the other hand there were those present who declared that he juva was killed this unexpected announcement gave him an idea for an indefinite period he would accept this version for more than ever set upon catching his enemy the detective said to himself that if fantomas could feel certain that juve no longer existed the pretended dead would have a far better chance of catching the living bandit thereupon juve had submitted his project to his chief monsieur havard and the head of the police secret service had consented to ignore juve's presence among the living juve knew that lady beltham had escaped to england supposing that fantomas would rejoin her without delay the detective left paris crossed the channel he then went to america for scarcely had he arrived in london when he learned that the bandits had gone off to the united states juve travelled from place to place for some months it was a vain quest fantomas had vanished leaving not a trace behind and the disgusted detective now convinced that he had followed a false trail returned to france he determined to set himself to study anew the prison world he was all the more interested in it because before his supposed death juve had effected the arrest of several members of a band of which fantomas was the leader among these were the cooper the beard and old mother Toulouche. then at the prison connected with the asylum juve had come across a warder who some years previous to this had been the warder in charge of a man condemned to death one gurn who had not been guillotined because a substituted person had been executed in his stead juve was convinced that the condemned criminal was none other than fantomas juve strongly suspected that this warder nibet by name knew a great deal about this old affair but soon nibet passed to the depot the accomplices of fantomas having served the time of their respective sentences some at melun others at clermont all this nice collection of criminals would meet once more on the pavements of paris juve therefore had imperious reasons for mingling with this charming crowd fondor had followed juve's rapid narrative with the most intense interest and then juve what then insisted fondor and then said the detective to make an end of it for we must not be forever going over the past adventures let me tell you that after many and diverse happenings a band of smugglers and false coiners among whom are to be found individuals already known to you notably the beard the cooper and also that wretch of a mother Toulouche, one fine day made the acquaintance of a poor sort of creature simple-minded and anything but sharp-witted an individual who goes by the name of cranajour cranajour queried fandor i don't in the least understand yes cranajour repeated juve here is how it came about 
you remember when fantomas got an unfortunate actor named valgrand executed in his stead well our mysterious fantomas the better to mislead and bamboozle those who might suspect this atrocious jugglery our bandit of genius for fantomas has genius took the personality of valgrand for several hours and dared to go to the theatre where the real valgrand was playing however as fantomas was not capable of playing the part to a finish he conceived the idea of making those about valgrand believe that he had been suddenly afflicted with a loss of memory and from that moment could not remember anything whatever fantomas the false valgrand could thus pass for the true valgrand and be taken as such by the true valgrand's intimates i humbly confess fandor that i copied fantomas by creating Cronajour. juba then rapidly explained to the journalist the origin of this nickname and also told him how the bandits treated him as one of themselves how as soon as they were convinced that he could not remember anything he had seen or heard for two hours together they talked freely before him of their plans and doings the detective went on i must add my dear fandor that no very sensational revelations have come to me so far through my intimacy with this set of criminals it seemed to me i was in the midst of common thieves who smuggled and circulated false coin but one thing did puzzle me puzzles me still these folks succeed in selling a considerable number of pounds sterling false coin of course and that without my being able to discover so far where they sell them who makes their market they also sell lace smuggled from belgium that however interests me but little and i was prepared to leave to the lower ranks of the service the duty of clearing paris of this commonplace brood of criminals already indeed the regular police had arrested one of the smugglers the cooper and two of his subordinate confederates i was about to turn my back on this crew in order to give all my attention to a new trail which might put me on the track of fantomas once more when the delon affair blazed forth and then suddenly i meet again my fondor braver than ever more perspicacious also adroitly taking the affair in hand bravely thrusting himself into the breach is there any connection between the delon affair and my band of smugglers you will appreciate the importance of this question and the reply to it in a minute my fondor when you learn that the depot warder nibet is one of the most valuable confederates of the coiners of mother toulouse of that hooligan the beard is it possible cried fondor ah juva all this is so strange that i believe you are really on fantomas track once more juva shook his head then he continued i have still a great deal to tell you but i must pause a moment to say that i ought to apologize to you for a fairly brutal act i committed on your behalf in your best interests as you will see and to fondor who opened his eyes in astonishment the detective related in humorous fashion the history of the famous kick he had administered a kick wherewith juba had removed his friend from the immediate and certain danger of assassination at the hand and by the knife of nibet fondor could not get over it he grasped juba's hands and pressed them warmly my friend my good friend murmured he moved almost to tears if i had had the least suspicion juba interrupted him there are many more things fandor you never suspected things you ought to know and what is more you seem to me to be neglecting your work badly at this very moment mr reporter it is already one o'clock in the afternoon and if they are counting on you to supply them with information about this affair of the place de l'opera fandor leapt to his feet it's true he cried i had quite forgotten it but it is of no importance by the side of juba interrupted the affair is serious fandor attention do you remember it is the formula i employed on two or three occasions when warning you after the assassination of jacques delon after the attack on sonia danidoff at thomery's house what it was you juba cried fandor yes it was but let us pass on time presses i am going to disappear anew but you now know where to find me in future and under what form should occasion require it cronajour i am cronajour i remain for the time being at any rate as to you fandor be off with you at once and go and hatch out that article of yours our journalist rose mechanically but juba thinking better of it caught him by the arm drew him back and pointed out the writing-table come to think of it you know nothing about the affair and i do there are things which should be said above all things to be hinted at do you wish me to give you information sit yourself there my lad i am going to dictate your article to you 
our journalist understanding the gravity of the situation and well knowing that if juve took this course he had important reasons for so doing did not say one word he simply brought out his fountain pen screwed it ready for action and with his hand resting on a pile of white paper he waited juba dictated first of all put this as your title an audacious theft that does not tell the reader anything but it awakens his curiosity let us continue right end of chapter ten read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 11 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 11 An Audacious Theft. Two hours after Juba had dictated his article to Fondor, our journalist was reading it in proof in the offices of La Capitale. His article ran thus by a fortunate coincidence we found ourselves this very morning in the directorial office of the barbet nantoul bank chatting with monsieur barbet himself when monsieur nantoul arrived breathless and announced to his partner that a sensational robbery had just been committed in the rue de quatre septembre a robbery involving a sum of twenty millions representing a clearance recently effected by the federated republic it seems that at ten o'clock this morning monsieur nantoul accompanied the little handcart used for transferring the bullion and paper money to the station from whence it was to be dispatched according to custom six of the bank clerks and three plain-clothes men went with monsieur nantoul but at the very moment when the handcart passed out of the place de l'opera and turned the corner of the rue de quatre septembre that is to say at the precise moment when it was passing the palisade surrounding the works on the autul opera metropolitan line a formidable explosion was heard and the handcart as well as the men who were drawing it and escorting it including monsieur nantoul himself disappeared in a deep excavation caused by the explosion whilst the water pipe which had burst at the same moment poured out torrents of water flooding the surrounding pavement and roadway it was then about eleven o'clock in the morning and the rue de quatre septembre presented a very animated appearance at the noise of the explosion the passers-by were glued to the spot dazed stupefied then exclamations broke out on all sides an accident a bomb the explosion had created a veritable chasm the first moment of stupefaction passed policeman three twenty six quickly organized the rescuers and sent notice to the nearest police station some minutes later the firemen arrived on the scene armed with ladders and ropes meanwhile the crowd of curious onlookers was increasing with amazing rapidity monsieur nantoux was the first to be drawn up from the pit by a miracle he had escaped injury unfortunately the clerks of the barbe nantoux bank had not got off so well bruises contusions cases of severe shock more or less serious had to be attended to by neighboring chemists monsieur nantoux reassured as to the fate of his clerks turned his attention to the handcart and its millions of bullion and the police in charge were given to understand that it must be drawn up without delay into the pit the firemen once more descended at first they were surprised not to find the handcart in its millions no doubt it had been covered by the mass of fallen bricks and mortar but fireman legofic who had advanced some yards along the railway line caught sight of it the cart was lying upside down but except for a few scratches it was found to be unbroken it was immediately hauled up to the roadway monsieur nantoul at once ascertained that the seals were intact he then gave orders that it was to be taken back to the barbe nantoul bank without delay as the train which was to have borne away the bullion had left the station hours ago monsieur nantoul decided to break the seals and place the bullion in one of the bank's safes for the night monsieur nantoul's stupefaction can be imagined when having unsealed and opened the handcart he realized that the sacks of gold had been replaced by sacks of lead it was at this moment that monsieur barbet was informed of the fact by his half frantic partner we were witnesses of this dramatic scene every second was of value instant action was the thing 
police headquarters was warned at once and but a few minutes had elapsed when monsieur havard arrived in a taxicab to take charge of the investigations thanks to the courtesy of monsieur havard we were allowed to accompany him to the stone yards of the metropolitan the police were convinced that it was hereabouts that the robbery had been accomplished we reached the spot about an hour after the explosion the first investigations produced no result but monsieur havard pursued his solitary search up one of the sidings and had his reward his exclamation was heard and we hastened to the spot he had just found a second handcart in all points similar to that he had recently examined in the courtyard of the barbey nantoul bank monsieur havard at once realized that he had before his eyes the original handcart and that the handcart he had seen in the bank courtyard was a clever substitute it need scarcely be said that there is no trace of the stolen millions to be found in the original handcart cast away in a siding of the metropolitan our readers know something of the appearance presented by these lines in course of construction on the metropolitan railway we have repeatedly published in la capitale details regarding the way in which the engineers and workmen supervise and execute the cutting of the passageway on the underground the operations in the place de l'opera are on an enormous scale for there is a junction here and the soil is more undermined than elsewhere on the railway at the precise spot where the explosion occurred there are four galleries in course of construction one is the future atel opera line the others either lead to existing lines or are galleries made for the convenience of the workmen handcart number one that is to say the substituted handcart filled with sacks of lead was found in the passageway of the atul opera line which is perfectly accessible and would naturally be visited by rescuers the original handcart was hidden away in one of the lateral galleries which are small and narrow and not likely to be visited and examined except as a last resource it is therefore clear that the affair has been carefully arranged a premeditated robbery the presence of the two handcarts would establish this the handcarts used by the bank for the transport of bullion and other forms of money are of a particular make unique in fact their respective positions show that the robbers had carefully prepared their drama and it was skilfully arranged thanks to monsieur havard's kindness we were permitted to approach the original handcart it was in a lamentable condition the body of it was nearly smashed to pieces of course no traces of the seals were to be found the only remark we see fit to make in this connection is that monsieur nantou his clerks and those who witnessed the accident must have been greatly excited and upset otherwise they would naturally have been much astonished at finding the substituted handcart practically uninjured after an accident of so crushing a nature we have carefully examined the soil round the original handcart in the hope of finding some clear footprints of the thieves or their accomplices but it was impossible to draw any conclusion from this examination the footmarks are intermingled superimposed undistinguishable it must be admitted the soil of the metropolitan hereabouts has been very much trampled over and beaten down so that it is difficult to believe that researches with the object of discovering the robbers footmarks are likely to have any clear result at the moment these lines have been written the investigation in the metropolitan passageways still continues and will in all probability be continued late into the night so far the police admit that results are meagre monsieur havard considers it certain that the deed is a premeditated one carefully prepared and that consequently the explosion which caused the catastrophe was a deliberate act of violence on the other hand monsieur nantoul declares that outside the parties interested that is to say the barbey nantoul bank and the comptoir des comptes who were to receive the bullion not a soul could know of the transfer on that particular morning but the staffs of the bank and of the comptoir national des comptes are absolutely trustworthy their honor has never been questioned it is evident that such a daring and desperate deed carried through so successfully in the galleries of the metropolitan in the sight of all paris at eleven o'clock in the morning could only be the work of a band of criminals numerous and perfectly organized are we returning to the days of fantomas 
let us add that owing to the number of individuals probably involved and the daring nature of the crime monsieur havard considers that it will be extremely difficult for the guilty persons to escape from the police jerome fandor had just finished correcting this sensational article when slips from the havas agency arrived at la capitale our journalist cast his eyes over them thinking he might find some piece of news that had come to hand at the last minute as he read he grew pale he struck his writing-table a violent blow with his fist for all that i am not mad he cried and holding his head between his hands spelling out each word he re-read the following telegram from the havas agency affair of the rue de quatre septembre at the last moment of going to press a bloody imprint has been discovered on hand-cart number two monsieur bertillon immediately identified this imprint it was made by the hand of jacques delon the criminal who was already wanted by the police for the murder of the baroness de vibray and the robbery committed on princess sonia danidoff but i am not mad cried fandor when he had read these lines i declare i am not mad by all that's holy jacques delon is dead fifty persons have seen him dead but for all that bertillon cannot be mistaken after a minute or two fandor took up his pen again and added a note to his article entitled sensational development the police say it is the late jacques delon who has stolen the millions this note showed clearly that jerome fandor did not believe that jacques delon could possibly be involved in this affair or in either of the other crimes in connection with which his name had been mentioned end of chapter eleven Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 12 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 12 Investigations a man jumped quickly out of the atul madeleine tram it would have been difficult to guess his age or see his face he wore a large soft hat a brazilian sombrero whose edges he had turned down the collar of his overcoat was turned up so that the lower part of his face was so far buried in it that his features were almost hidden then during the entire journey seated at the end of the tram-car he had kept his back turned on the other passenger he seemed to be absorbed in watching the movements of the driver at the end of the rue mozart where the rues la fontaine poisson de perchon meet he had quitted the tram with real satisfaction then in the silence of the evening the clock of atul church had slowly struck eight silvery strokes the listening man murmured oh there's no hurry after all i've a good two hours wait in front of me leaving the frequented ways he plunged into the little by-streets newly made and not yet named which join the end of the rue mozart with the boulevard montmorency he walked fast at the same time taking his bearings rue raffet if i don't deceive myself it lies in this direction he reached the hilly and lonely road bearing that name which on both sides of its entire length is bordered by attractive private residences swiftly silently stealthily this individual approached one of these houses he glanced through the garden railing scrutinizing the windows which were lighted up good good decidedly good he said in a low tone of satisfaction for there's two hours to wait they are still in the dining-room if i am to go by the lighted windows the watcher now inspected the rue raffet the house which interested him so much was situated just where the rue de docteur blanche opens into the street at right angles Atul is certainly not a frequented part but as a rule the rue raffet is generally more lonely than any of the streets in Atul. no carriages no pedestrians from an early hour in the evening that hilly road was more often than not quite deserted so was the rue de docteur blanche still surrounded by wasteland and more especially at the rue raffet end a glance or two sufficed to show the man the lie of the land 
he noted the feeble glimmer of the street lamps he made certain that not one of the neighboring houses could perceive his actions mark his movements he repeated in a theatrical tone of voice with a note of amusement in it not a soul not a solitary soul well it is no joke to wait here but after all it is a quiet spot and i can count on not being disturbed in the job i have in hand to-night this individual traversed the rue raffet gained the rue de docteur blanche and wrapping himself up in his voluminous black coat ensconced himself in a break in the palisades bordering the pavement he stood there motionless any one might have passed within a few yards of him without suspecting his presence so still was he so imperceptibly did his dark figure blend with the blackness of the night he started slightly the church clock struck nine its notes sounding silvery clear through the tranquil night in the distance some convent clock chimed an evening prayer then a deeper silence fell on the darkness of night suddenly the front door of the house which the stranger had watched with scrutinizing intentness was thrown wide open showing a large luminous square in the darkness two women were speaking are you going out my darling asked the elder don't be anxious madam replied a girlish voice there is no need to wait for me i am only going to the post why not give jules your letter no i prefer to post it myself you would not like someone to go with you there are not many people about at this hour the same fresh young voice replied oh i am not frightened besides it's only rue raffet which is deserted as soon as i reach rue mozart there will be nothing more to fear the luminous square drawn on the obscurity of the garden disappeared the mysterious stranger who had not lost a word of this conversation heard the door of the vestibule close then the gravel of the garden crunch under the feet of the girl coming down the path very soon the gate of the garden grated on its badly oiled hinges then the elegant outline of a young girl was visible on the badly lighted pavement she was walking fast the stranger remained stationary until the girl had gone some way then pressing against the wall concealing his movements with practised ability he followed her at a discreet distance there can be no doubt about it he murmured i recognized her voice directly it's the very deuce it's going to complicate matters a lover's meeting not likely she must be going to the post as she said she will return in about a quarter of an hour and then then the girl was far from suspecting that she was being followed she had walked down rue mozart turned into rue poisson posted her letter and then walked quietly back to the house the stranger had not followed her into the more frequented streets he awaited her return in a dark and deserted side street when she came into view again he sighed a sigh of great satisfaction ah there is the dear child that's all right now we shall have some fun or rather i shall anyone seeing his face whilst making these significant exclamations would have been frightened by his sneering chuckle his hideous grin a few minutes later the girl re-entered the little garden of the house in the rue raffet a stout woman opened to her ring ah oh, there you are darling there was relief in her tone yes here i am safe and sound madam nothing unpleasant no one molested you elizabeth elizabeth delon for she it was shook her head and smiled a smile both sad and sweet ah no madam i was sure you would be waiting for me i am so sorry no not at all tell me elizabeth jules has told me that you would not be going out to-morrow the poor fellow is so stupid that i ask myself if he has not made a mistake no said elizabeth it is quite true i do not think i shall go out either in the morning or the afternoon you expect a caller it is possible someone may come to see me if by any chance i have to go out for a few minutes to get something or other i must warn jules he must make the visitor wait i shall not go far in case all right that's settled then darling now good night i am going to my room good evening madam and good night leaving stout and kindly madame borat owner of this private boarding-house where elizabeth delon had found a refuge the poor girl still with a smile on her pale lips made her way upstairs 
entered her bedroom and carefully locked the door she lit the lamp her face now wore a tragic look its expression was wild and desperate if only he would come she sighed ah oh, i am afraid i am afraid i am terribly afraid elizabeth stood motionless a frozen image of fear all but her eyes they were casting terrified glances about her and no wonder elizabeth was neatness personified and her room was kept with exquisite care but now everything was in the greatest disorder the drawers of her chest of drawers were piled one on top of the other in a corner of the room their contents were thrown down in heaps a little way off books had been cast pell-mell on a sofa a great wicker trunk wherein elizabeth had packed numerous papers belonging to her brother was overturned on the floor the lid open its contents were scattered near a confused mass of documents and crumpled papers elizabeth stared about her for a long minute and again she cried oh if only he would come what is the meaning of all this she regained her self-control her usual expression of serene gravity returned to go to sleep she murmured that is the best thing to-morrow will come more quickly so and oh i am so sleepy so very very tired soon elizabeth blew out her lamp darkness reigned in her room it was about half-past ten o'clock and the light in elizabeth dollon's room had been extinguished for some little while when the front door of the little house was opened again noiselessly with infinite precautions with searching and suspicious glances taking care to keep off the gravel of the paths tiptoeing on the grass edging the flower-beds where his steps made no sound a man left the house and went toward the garden gate he quickly reached it and there he commenced to whistle a soft slow monotonous and continuous whistle second succeeded second then another whistle identical in rhythm replied soon a voice asked is it you jules it is i master the man whom jules called master was the stranger who for two weary hours had kept strict watch over the goings and comings of the house all well jules all well master and nothing new i don't know about that master she has written a letter to whom i couldn't say i could not see the address master you red-headed idiot the servant protested no it was not my fault she did not write in the drawing-room but in her own room i couldn't get a squint at her paper did she not say anything nothing did she look upset a little no one suspects anything i hope not master gods and little fishes if anyone suspected the visitor's voice grew harsh imperious enough said he we have no time to lose how no time that's it we must set to work work now this very night oh master surely not don't i do you imagine that i arranged a meeting only for the pleasure of talking to you come on now march what are we to do a moment's silence i cannot see the house very well because of the branches listen look isn't there a light someone still up no they've all gone to bed good and she she too you did what i told you yes master you were able to pour out the narcotic yes master and then what do you mean by then have you carried out all my orders the last yes it is all right i went into her room and blew out the lamp good now for it a slight brushing sound along the low stone wall of the garden was barely perceptible to a listening ear the wall was topped by railings and the gate had sheets of iron fastened to it in a twinkling the stranger leaped down beside jules it is child's play to vault that gate he said by the uncertain light of the stars jules could see the individual who had just joined him his appearance was fantastic and the wretched jules started and trembled in every limb the stranger who had thus invaded madame borat's domain who had a short while before been wearing a long cloak and immense sombrero wore them no longer probably he had rid himself of them by casting them among the bramble bushes on the waste ground around rue docteur blanche 
now he was clad in a long black knitted garment moulded tightly to his figure a sinister garment by means of which the wearer can blend with the darkness so as to be almost indistinguishable his face was entirely concealed by a long black hood a movable mask which prevented his features being seen through two slits gleamed two eyeballs they might have burned away through like glowing coals master master murmured jules what are you going to do now this spectral figure replied in a low tone fool go on in front or no better follow me and not a sound it's as much as your skin is worth take care great care the two men advanced in silence but while jules seemed to take exaggerated precautions to prevent being heard his companion seemed naturally shod with silence he advanced noiselessly almost invisible in his black garment the two accomplices were soon at the front door steps of the house open commanded the master jules slipped the key into the lock noiselessly the door turned on its hinges listen whispered the cloaked man halfway up the stairs you must stop i do not wish you to go right up but do as i say you must keep watch if by chance you should hear a noise if i were to be taken by surprise you must go downstairs making a great noise and shouting at the top of your voice stop him stop him thus in the first moment of confusion everyone will rush after you and that will give me the time to choose my way of escape jules whatever his fears did not dare to question his instructions very good master he breathed i'll do as you say i should think you would scoffed his master almost inaudibly leaving his accomplice on the stairs the masked man went forward he seemed to know the ins and outs of the house for he turned into the corridor and without a moment's hesitation walked towards the door of elizabeth delon's room he put his ear against it she sleeps he murmured he had inserted a key in the lock there was an obstacle to its easy entrance confound it the girl has left her own key in the lock he said softly what the deuce am i to do now what did jules do when he got in and put out the lamp why of course he took off the screw that fixes the staple a simple push will suffice with a push of his shoulder the door yielded the stranger entered and carefully closed the door he walked to the window and drew the curtains muttering that fool should have thought of this just now taking a small electric torch from his pocket he turned on the light calmly collectedly he approached a couch at one side of the room on it lay elizabeth delon in a deep sleep she looked white as death an excellent narcotic he muttered bending over the unconscious girl when one thinks that she took it at dinner then went out and that then it produced its effect moving away from elizabeth he crossed the room to where the contents of the overturned trunk lay damnable papers he growled low to think it is too late now to continue the search bah by shutting the mouth of an informant that's the way to settle it the best way too now for it without apparent effort the man in the hooded mask seized elizabeth delon in his muscular arms come mademoiselle he said in a jeering tone come to bye-bye sleep better than on this sofa you will sleep a longer sleep that's certain an evil smile punctuated these sinister remarks he laid the poor girl's body on the floor in the middle of the room then approaching a little gas stove he detached the india rubber tube and slipped the end of it between his victim's teeth he turned the gas tap perfect he said as he straightened himself to-morrow morning early at eight o'clock or at nine the excellent madame borat will open the meter the narcotic this child has taken will prevent her from waking so that without suffering without cries quite gently sweet elizabeth will pass from life to death but it will not do to linger here let us find jules and give him the necessary instructions the stranger went out into the corridor closing the door the thing had been well managed the screws keeping the bolt case in position were put back in their holes the key remained inside no one would suspect that only a slight push was necessary to get into the room with a chuckle the stranger bent down and pushed a tassel under the door the servant must not discover the trick when she is sweeping the passage 
now with this wedge the door cannot be opened without a violent push with a last glance up and down the passage illuminated for a moment by his electric torch the stranger made sure that there was no one about to see him then with silent tread he began to go downstairs halfway down his accomplice awaited him well master questioned jules in a low trembling voice in a calm quiet voice the man in the hood mask replied it is done is successful i have wedged the door too you will be careful when you are sweeping to-morrow jules lowered his head yes yes have you the stranger put his hand on the servant's shoulder listen whispered the stranger i do not repeat my orders twenty times over have i not already told you that i do not allow myself to be questioned try to remember that you wish to know whether i have killed her well i will tell you this i have not killed her but i have so managed things that she will kill herself a suicide you understand one piece of advice to-morrow keep anyone from going to her room as long as you can if madame bourrat or anyone else asks for her you must say that you saw her leave the house that she has gone out but protested jules it is impossible what you tell me to say master it just happens that she is expecting visitors to-morrow she told me that on this account she meant to stay indoors all day the man with the hood mask ground his teeth you idiot what does that matter you are to say mademoiselle elizabeth has just gone out but she told me that she was not going far and that you should return in about twenty minutes if anyone should ask for her again you are to answer that she has not come in yet but master when they find out what's happened really ho oh, when it is discovered it will seem quite natural that a person who means to commit suicide for she will have committed suicide you understand should have taken precautions not to be disturbed you grasp this yes master yes they had returned to the garden the man in the hooded mask was preparing to get over the gate farewell be faithful be intelligent you know what you have to gain you also know what risks you run eh now go you will return to-morrow master the man with the hooded mask looked his accomplice up and down i shall return when it pleases me to do so then with marvellous agility without making a spring for it with a quite extraordinary muscular flexibility and power the stranger leaped on to the little wall cleared the gate and disappeared into the night jules with bent head much moved terribly anxious slowly walked back to the house end of chapter twelve read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com section thirteen of messengers of evil by marcel elaine and pierre Silvestre. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter thirteen rue raffette marais second reporter of la capitale shook hands with fandor are you in a good humour dear boy so so ah oh, well here is something which will cheer you up i'm sure here's a letter from a lady for you i found it in my pigeonhole by mistake fandor smiled from a lady you must be mistaken how do you know it is by the handwriting the paper and so on i am not mistaken am i ever laughing marais threw down on fandor's table a small envelope with a deep black border yes it is a letter from a woman said fandor as he picked it up from whom ah why yes with a hasty finger he tore open the envelope whilst his colleague withdrew making a joking remark dear boy i leave you to this tender missive i should be annoyed with myself were i to interrupt your reflections fandor's friend would have been surprised if he could have seen the gloomy expression which the perusal of this so-called love letter produced jerome had turned to the signature elizabeth Delon what does she want with me he asked himself after the extraordinary affair of rue de quatre septembre one must suppose that she has arrived at some conclusion regarding the possible guilt of her brother 
so long as she does not let her imagination run away with her and like the police fancy that jacques dollon is still in the land of the living the position the poor thing is in is a very cruel one fandor had met jacques dollon's young sister repeatedly and every time he had been more and more troubled by the poor girl's touching grief as well as by her pathetic beauty which had made a great impression on him he began to read her letter dear sir you have been so good to me in all my troubles you have shown me such true sympathy that i do not hesitate to ask your help once more such an extraordinary thing has happened to me which i cannot account for at all which nevertheless makes me think more than ever that my poor brother is living innocent and kept prisoner perhaps by those who compel him to accept the responsibility for all those horrible crimes you know about to-day whilst i was in paris on business some people of whom i know nothing i need hardly say whom not a soul in the private boarding-house where i am saw these persons entered my room i found all my belongings turned upside down my papers scattered over the floor every drawer and trunk and box ransacked from top to bottom you can guess how frightened i was i do not think they had come to do me any personal harm not even to rob me for i had left my modest jewellery on the mantelpiece and found them still there those who entered my room did not covet valuables then why did they come you are perhaps going to say that my imagination is playing me tricks nevertheless i assure you that i try to keep calm but i cannot keep control of myself and i am terribly afraid i have just said that nothing was stolen from me i think however it right to mention one strange coincidence i was convinced that i had left in a little red pocket-book the list i spoke to you of which had been retrieved at my brother's house on the day of madame de vibray's death it was as i have told you written in green ink by a person whose handwriting i do not know i can hardly tell why but amidst all the disorders in my room i immediately searched for this list the little pocket-book was on the floor amongst other papers but the list was not to be found in it am i mistaken have i packed it in somewhere else or allowing for the fact that everything has been turned upside down has this paper slipped among other papers which would explain why i had not come across it again in spite of myself i must confess to you that the thieves i fancy had only one aim in view when they entered my room and that was to get hold of this list what is your opinion i feel that perhaps i am about to show myself both inconsiderate and injudicious but you know how miserable i am and you will understand how the position i am in gives me grounds for being distracted i am bent on talking this over with you on knowing what you think of it perhaps even knowing how clever you are you might be able to find something an indication some detail in my room i have not touched anything i shall stay indoors all to-morrow in the hope of seeing you do come if you possibly can it seems to me that i am forsaken by every one and i trust only you jerome fandor read and re-read this letter which had been written with a trembling hand poor little soul he murmured here is something more to add to her troubles it is really terrible it seems to me as if we should never come to the end of it and i ask myself whether the police will ever find the key to all these mysteries did someone really break into elizabeth dollon's room to steal this paper it is rather improbable judging from what she told me there is nothing compromising in it but then why this search she is right so far if the intruders had been merely thieves they would have carried off her jewellery then it is for that paper they came besides ordinary burglars would have had considerable difficulty in getting into her room where she is remarkably well guarded by the very fact of there being other boarders in the house no the very audacity of this attempted theft seems to prove that it is connected with the other affairs which have brought the name of jacques dollon into such prominence i see in this the same extraordinary audacity the same certainty of escape the same long and careful preparation for it is a by no means convenient place for a burglary in open day comings and goings are perpetual and the guilty persons ran a hundred risks of being caught fandor interrupted his reflections to read elizabeth's letter once more she is dying of fright that is evident in any case she calls to me for help her letter was posted yesterday evening i will go and see her and at once 
who knows but i might find some clue which would put me on the right track jerome fondor did not feel very hopeful after having gone carefully over every point connected with and pertaining to the affair of rue de quatre septembre he had almost come to the conclusion optimistic as he was regarding the police that chance alone would bring about the arrest of the guilty parties to lay these criminals by the heels he had frankly declared requires the aid of very favourable circumstances and without them neither i nor the police will get at the truth of it all fondor made a definite distinction between the opinion of the police and his own because two different theories now obtained with regard to the two affairs that of the attack on the princess sonia danidoff and that of the robbery of rue de quatre septembre where the imprints of jacques delon's fingers had been found the police and fondor coupled monsieur havard with monsieur bertillon under this definition the police held it for certain that jacques dollon was alive very much alive and the probabilities were great that he was guilty of the different crimes attributed to him in an interview granted to a press rival of la capitale monsieur bertillon had stated we base our assertion that dollon is alive and consequently guilty on material facts we have found his signature attached to each of the crimes and it is a signature which cannot be imitated by any one for his part fondor held it as certain that jacques was dead i maintain that since fifty persons have seen jacques dollon dead it is infinitely more likely that he is dead than that he is alive the imprints of his fingers his hand are equally visible it is true and seem to prove that he is alive but the conclusive nature of this test is nullified by the fact that before the discovery of these imprints before these imprints had been made jacques dollon was dead and in his articles in la capitale jerome fandor with a persistency which finished by disconcerting even the most convinced partisans of the police contention continued to maintain that jacques dollon was dead dead as dead and to use his own expression as dead as it was possible for any one to be dead jerome fandor had just rung the bell at the garden gate of madame borat's private boarding-house in atul jules hastened to answer this ring and was met by the question is mademoiselle elizabeth dollon at home no monsieur she went out not an hour ago and you are certain she has not returned absolutely monsieur there are two visitors waiting for her already she will be in soon then certainly monsieur she will not be long fondor looked at his watch a quarter past ten very well i will wait for her if monsieur will kindly follow me fondor was shown into the drawing-room he had advanced only a step or two when he was greeted with why monsieur fondor i am delighted to see you cried fondor shaking hands with monsieur barbet and monsieur nantoux both gave him a pleasant smile of welcome you have come to see mademoiselle dollon i suppose yes we have come to assure her that we will do all in our power to help her out of her terrible difficulties she wrote to us a few days ago to ask if we would act as intermediaries regarding the sale of some of her unfortunate brother's productions also to see if we could get her a situation in some dressmaking establishment we have come to assure her of our entire sympathy that is most kind of you they told you did they not that she had gone out i think she will not be absent long for i have an appointment with her but if you will allow me i will go to the office and ask if they have the least idea which way she has gone for i have little time to spare and if we could go to meet her it would save at least a few minutes jerome fandor rose and went toward one of the drawing-room doors you are making a mistake said monsieur nantoux the office is this way and he pointed to another door bah all roads lead to rome with that fandor went out by the door he had approached first they are nice fellows said fandor to himself if elizabeth dollon is really not in but is she really not in the house i am by no means sure if she feels timid at the idea of seeing the bankers their visit may have made her nervous considering the state she is in she might have sent to say she was not at home in order to have time to add some finishing touches to her toilette fondor who knew the house mounted the little staircase leading to the first floor elizabeth's room was on this floor before her door he stopped and sniffed queer smell he murmured it smells like gas he knocked boldly calling mademoiselle elizabeth it is i fondor 
the smell of gas became more pronounced as he waited a horrible idea an agonizing fear flashed through his mind he knocked as hard as he could on the door mademoiselle elizabeth mademoiselle elizabeth no answer he called down the stairs waiter porter but apparently the one and only manservant the house boasted was occupied elsewhere for no one answered Fondor returned to the door of Elizabeth's room, knelt down, and tried to look through the keyhole. The inside key was there, which seemed to confirm his agonizing fear. She has not gone out, then. He took a deep breath. What a horrible smell of gas! This time he did not hesitate. He rose, stepped back, sprang forward, and with a vigorous push from the shoulder he drove the door off its hinges. My God! he shouted in the centre of the room fandor had just seen elizabeth dollon lying unconscious a tube detached from a portable gas stove was between her tightly closed lips the tap was turned full on he flung himself on his knees near the poor girl pulled away the deadly tube and put his ear to her heart what joy what happiness he felt when he heard very feeble but quite unmistakable beatings of elizabeth's heart she lives what unspeakable relief jerome fandor felt what thankfulness the noise he had made breaking the door off its hinges brought the whole household running to the spot as the manservant followed by madame borat followed in turn by monsieur barbet and nantoul appeared in the doorway uttering cries of terror jerome called out no one is to come in it is an accident then lifting elizabeth in his strong arms he carried her out of the room what she needs is air he hurried downstairs and out into the garden with his precious burden followed by the terrified witnesses of the scene you have saved her life monsieur cried madame borat in a tragic voice she groaned oh what a scandal yes i have saved her replied fandor as panting with his exertions he laid elizabeth dollon flat on a garden seat but from whom it is certainly not attempted suicide there is some mystery behind this business it's a regular theatrical performance arranged simply for effect and to mislead us declared fandor then turning to the bankers he said courteously but with an air of command please lay information with the superintendent of police at once the nearest police station you understand madame he said addressing the overwhelmed madame barat you will be good enough to look after mademoiselle dollon will you not take every care of her there is not much to be done however i have seen many cases of commencing asphyxia she will regain consciousness now in a few minutes then looking at the manservant he said in a sharp tone come with me you will mount guard at the door of mademoiselle elizabeth's room whilst i try to discover some clues before the police arrive on the scene to tell the truth our young journalist felt embarrassed at the idea that elizabeth dollon was about to regain consciousness and that he would have to submit to being thanked by her when she knew who had saved her accompanied by the manservant he went quickly upstairs and into elizabeth's room you must not enter mademoiselle dollon's room on any account said fandor sternly it is quite enough that i should run the risk of effacing the probably very slight clues which the delinquents have left behind them but monsieur if the young lady put the tubing between her lips it must have been because she wished to destroy herself on the face of it you are right good fellow but when one is right one is often wrong without more ado fandor started on a minute inspection of the room elizabeth had but stated the truth when she wrote that it had been thoroughly ransacked only her toilet things had been spared but some books had been taken from their shelves and thrown about the floor their pages crumpled and spoiled he noticed the emptied trunk its contents copy-books letters pieces of music had been roughly dealt with on the mantelpiece in full view lay elizabeth's jewellery some rings and brooches a small gold watch a purse a very queer affair murmured fandor who was kneeling in the middle of the room rummaging searching and not finding any clue he rose carefully examined all the woodwork but found nothing incriminating he examined the lock of the unhinged door which had subsided on the floor the lock was intact the bolt moved freely the screws only of the staple had given way that thought fandor is probably owing to the force of my thrust the window fastening was intact the window closed if the robbers reflected fandor got into a closed room they must have used false keys 
having examined the means of access to the room fandor started on a still more minute examination of the interior he scrutinized the furniture and the slight powdering of dust on each article in vain then the washstand had its turn nothing he scrutinized the soap ah this is interesting he cried the manservant had made himself scarce and fandor unobserved could wrap up the piece of soap in his handkerchief and hide it in the lowest drawer of the chest of drawers under a pile of linen he was whistling now that bit of soap is interesting very he cried let the police come i am not afraid of their blundering now to see how elizabeth is getting on when he reached her side he found she had recovered full consciousness and was preparing to answer the questions of a police superintendent who summoned by the bankers had hastened to the scene of action he was a stout apoplectic man very full of his own importance come now mademoiselle tell us just how things happened from beginning to end we ask nothing better than to believe you but do not conceal any detail not the slightest poor elizabeth delon when she heard this speech stared at the pompous police official astonished what had she to conceal what had she to gain by lying what did he think this fat policeman who took it upon himself to issue orders when he should rather have tried to comfort her nevertheless she at once began telling him all that she knew with regard to the affair she told him of her letter to fandor that her room had been visited the evening before by whom she did not know that she had not said a word about it to any one fearing vengeance would fall on her frightened not understanding what it all meant then she came to what the police dignitary called her suicide as she finished her recital with a reference to her rescue by fandor she looked at the young journalist it was a look of great gratitude and a kind of ardent tenderness with a touch of fear in it strange very strange pronounced the superintendent of police who had been taking notes with an air of great gravity so very strange mademoiselle that it is very difficult to credit your statements very difficult indeed whilst he was speaking fandor was saying to himself decidedly it is that just what i was thinking it is quite clear clear as the sun in the sky evident indisputable and he refused very politely of course for one has to respect the authorities to accompany the superintendent who in his turn went upstairs to elizabeth's room in order to carry out the necessary legal verification end of chapter thirteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 14 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 14. Someone Telephoned. The nuns of the Order of St. Augustine were not expelled in consequence of the decrees. This was a special favor this was a special favor but one fully justified because of the incalculable benefits this community conferred on suffering humanity the vast convent of rue de la glaciere continues to serve as a shelter for these holy women and as a sort of hospital for the sick for close on a hundred years generation after generation of those living near its walls have heard the convent clock sound the hours in solemn tones so too the convent chapel's shrill voiced bells have never failed to remind the faithful that the daily offices of their church are being said and sung by the holy sisters within the hallowed walls in the vast quarter of paris peopled with hospitals and prisons the convent shows a stern front in the shape of a high blackened wall a great courtyard gate in which a window with iron bars and grating is the only visible opening to the exterior world about half past six in the morning slightly out of breath with his rapid walk from the metropolitan station jerome fandor rang the convent door bell the sound could be heard echoing and re-echoing in the vaulted corridors till it died away in the stony distance there was a silence then the iron-barred window was half opened and fandor heard a voice asking what do you want monsieur i wish to speak to madame the superior replied fandor 
the window was closed again and a lengthy silence followed then slowly the heavy entrance gate swung half open fandor entered the convent under the arched doorway a nun received him with a slight salutation and turned her back kindly follow me she murmured fandor followed along a narrow passage on one side of which were cells whilst on the other it opened by means of large bays on a vast rectangular cloister quite deserted a door window in the passage was ajar the nun stopped there and said kindly wait in this parlour and be good enough to let me have your card i will inform our mother superior that you wish to see her the room in which our journalist found himself was severely furnished its walls were white on them hung a great ivory crucifix and here and there a simple religious picture framed in ebony a few chairs were ranged in a circle about an oval table on the floor polished till it shone like a mirror were a few small mats which gave a touch of commonplace comfort to the icy regularity of this parlour set apart for official visits what emotions what dramas what joys have had this parlour for a setting it is there that the life of the cloister touches mundane existence it is there the nuns receive their future companions in the religious life and their weeping families it is there the parents of those in the convent infirmary come to hear from the doctor's lips the decrees of life or death for the convent is not only a retreat it is an asylum for the sick the ailing recommended to their patients by the most eminent doctors the most prominent surgeons accustomed though he was to every kind of human misery fandor shuddered at the thought of all these walls had seen and heard his reflections were broken by the arrival of a little old lady whose eyes shone strangely luminous in her pale and wrinkled face a face showing the highest distinction fandor made a deep bow it might have expressed the reverence of the world to religion madame la superieure murmured he i have come to pay my respects to you and ask for news of your boarder the mother superior in a gay tone which contrasted with her cold and reserved appearance replied at once ah you preferred to come yourself you had not the patience to wait at the telephone i quite understand would you believe it while the sister who has charge of this young girl was being sent for the communication was cut off that is why we could not give you any information fandor stared but i do not understand madam the mother superior replied was it not you then who telephoned this morning to ask for news of mademoiselle Delon? i certainly did not do so in that case i do not understand what it means either but it does not matter much you shall see your protege now the mother superior rang a sister appeared sister will you take this gentleman to mademoiselle Delon? she was walking in the park a short while ago and is probably there now monsieur i bid you good day gliding swiftly and noiselessly over the polished floor the mother superior disappeared the nun led the way and fandor followed he was very much upset by what the mother superior had just told him how had elizabeth's place of refuge been so quickly discovered who could have telephoned to get news of her the nun had led fandor across the great rectangular courtyard then by corridors and many winding vaulted passages they had come out on to a terrace overlooking an immense park which extended further than the eye could see here were bosky dells ancient trees bowers and grooves meadows where milky mothers chewed the cud in the shade of blossoming apple trees it might have been in normandy a hundred leagues from paris the nun turned to the admiring fandor the young lady you seek monsieur is coming along this path there she is i will leave you fandor had seen elizabeth's graceful figure moving towards him thrown into charming relief by the country landscape flooded with sunshine in her modest morning dress with her fair shining hair she appeared prettier than ever a touching figure of sorrowing beauty elizabeth pressed fondor's hands warmly oh thank you monsieur thank you she cried for having come to see me this morning i know how little spare time you have i feel vexed with myself for putting you out so but you see elizabeth could not repress a sob i am so alone so desolate i have lost everything i cared for and you are the only person i can trust and confide in now i feel like a bit of wreckage at the mercy of wind and wave 
i feel as though i were surrounded by enemies i live in a nightmare what should i do without you to turn to our young journalist moved by such great misfortune so simply so candidly expressed returned the pressure of elizabeth's hands you know mademoiselle he said softly but in a voice vibrating with sympathetic emotion the only sign of feeling he permitted himself to show you know that you can count absolutely on me and getting you to take a few days rest at this retreat i felt i was doing what was best for you you are not solitary but your surroundings are peaceful and friendly and should you have enemies though i am loath to think of it you are sheltered here beyond their reach with reference to that have you given your address to any one since yesterday to no one replied elizabeth has any one by chance she looked troubled and gave an anxious questioning glance at fondor he did not want to frighten the much-tried girl but he wished to solve the mystery of the unaccountable telephone call oh i just wished to know mademoiselle now tell me have you quite recovered from your experience of the other day ah monsieur i owe my life to you cried elizabeth for i am certain that someone wished to get rid of me don't you agree with me i must have been dosed with some narcotic just as they dosed my poor brother for i am now absolutely convinced that he also was sent to sleep and poisoned and that he is dead is that not so asked fondor in a low voice without hesitation in a tearful voice elizabeth repeated and that he is dead you have given me so many proofs that it is so that i can no longer doubt it alas but i will take courage as i promised you i would i ought to live that i might strive to rehabilitate his memory and restore him to his reputation as a man of probity of honour to which he is entitled but directly i begin to think about the horrible mystery in which i am involved my very reason seems to totter you can understand can you not i don't understand i don't know i can't guess oh but interrupted fondor we must seriously consider the situation in all its bearings it may cause you atrocious suffering but you must summon all your courage mademoiselle we must discuss it fondor and elizabeth had moved away from the terrace and were now in the leafy solitudes of the park fondor began there is that paper with this list of names written in green ink mademoiselle it was a mistake on your part not to attach any importance to it until you fancied and perhaps rightly that someone had tried to steal it from you come now can you tell me whether this list is still in your possession or not elizabeth shook her head sadly i do not know i cannot tell my poor head is so bewildered and i find it all the trouble in the world to collect my thoughts i told you the other day that this list had disappeared from a little red pocket-book that i had put on the chimney-piece of my room at autel but the more i think it over the more doubtful i am it seems to me now that this list ought to be must still be unless it has been stolen since in the big trunk into which i threw pell-mell the papers and books my brother left scattered about his writing-table to be quite sure about this we must return to atul but perhaps it is useless because when i wanted to send it to you some forty-eight hours ago i searched everywhere for the wretched thing and in vain i am not even sure now that i brought it away with me from rue norvance fondor gently comforted the distracted girl whose eyes were full of tears do not be disheartened try rather to put together in your memory what was written on this paper you told me surely that there were names on this list of persons you knew or had heard of search your memory a little mademoiselle i don't know i cannot remember said elizabeth nervously come now said fondor encouragingly i know an excellent way of assisting the memory the eyes are like a sensitive photographic plate what the brain does not always retain the mirror of the eye registers but do not try to remember but try as it were to read on white paper what your eyes saw let us sit down a minute and i will help you to do it fondor pointed out a rustic seat under the trees in front of which was a garden table they sat down together and fondor drew from his pocket a sheet of white paper and his fountain pen elizabeth's arm touched his shoulder as though electrified by this contact the two young people trembled their eyes met in a glance full of troubled emotion a feeling new to both whose immense significance neither understood fondor remained speechless and elizabeth blushed they gazed at each other embarrassed not knowing what to say for themselves and their embarrassment was only relieved by the appearance of the sister who attended to the turning box at the entrance gate 
she stood at the top of the steps leading down to the park and called elizabeth mademoiselle mademoiselle there is someone on the telephone who wishes to speak to you fondor rose will you allow me to accompany you mademoiselle i am very curious to know whether the person now asking for you is identical with the person who asked for you a little while ago the young couple hurried to the big parlor and elizabeth went to the telephone hello elizabeth had handed one of the receivers to fondor he heard a voice an unknown voice but beyond question masculine who said over the wire hello is it really mademoiselle delon to whom i have the honor of speaking yes monsieur who is speaking to me but just as elizabeth was about to repeat her question fondor thought he heard whoever had called up elizabeth hang up the receivers no reply reached them elizabeth cried impatiently hello hello who is speaking to me but there was no one at the end of the line fondor swore softly to himself then seizing the two receivers he called hello come monsieur reply whom do you want who are you he could not obtain any reply fondor rang up the central office when the telephone girl answered he called mademoiselle why have you cut me off but i have done nothing of the kind monsieur but i cannot get any reply it is because the receivers have been hung up by whoever called you i assure you that is so what is my caller's number i cannot tell you that monsieur the rules forbid it fondor knew this quite well so he did not insist further but as he turned away from the telephone a dull anger smouldered within him who was this mysterious individual who had called elizabeth twice over the telephone and then no sooner put into communication with her had refused to talk to her fondor felt nervous anxious exasperated by this incident but it would never do to trouble his young friend to no good purpose he led her back to the garden where were we in our talk monsieur asked elizabeth with a considerable effort the journalist collected his thoughts we were discussing the mysterious paper found at your brother's mademoiselle in agreement with elizabeth jerome fondor determined the approximate size of this list of addresses he tore from his notebook a sheet of white paper elizabeth looked fixedly at the white sheet for a long time as though by concentrated will-power she could force the mysterious names which she read some days before on the original paper to rise up in front of her eyes certainly it seemed to her that on this list figured the name of her brother that of the baroness de vibray lawyer Gerin's also then she remembered a double name a name not unknown to her which had appeared on the list barbe none too she suddenly cried yes i do believe those two names were on it fondor smiled encouraged by his smile and the results of this semi-clairvoyant attempt elizabeth allowed her thoughts free play i am sure of it there was even a mistake in spelling nantul was spelled nautul the bankers were third or fourth on the list and i am certain now that the baroness de vibray's name headed the list there was also a date composed of two figures a one then wait wait a minute a figure with a tail on it that is to say it could only have been a five a seven or a nine i cannot remember which then there were other names i had never heard of try mademoiselle to remember there was a silence fondor was puzzling over the figures he had written down in the order elizabeth had mentioned them fifteen seventeen nineteen but what could he deduce from them ah the mysterious robbery of rue de quatre septembre was committed on may fifteenth there may be a clue there the thread of fondor's reflections were abruptly broken by a cry from elizabeth i have recalled a name something like thomas does that tell you anything thomas repeated jerome fondor slowly i don't see but suddenly he saw light he jumped up isn't it thomery cried he intensely excited are you not confounding thomas with thomery elizabeth taken aback confused tried hard to remember she threshed her memory with knitted brows it may be so she declared i see quite clearly the first letters of the word tom written in large hand then the rest is indistinct but i have the impression that the end of the word is longer than the last syllable of thomas perhaps you are right fondor was no longer listening to her he had left the rustic bench and without paying any attention to elizabeth he began walking up and down the shady path talking to himself in a low tone as was his habit when he wished to reduce his thoughts to order thomas that is thomery jacques delon the baroness de vibray barbe nantoul lawyer Guerin, 
but they are all the victims of the mysterious band that plots and plans in the shade it is incomprehensible but we shall find a way to get to the bottom of it all fandor returned to elizabeth we shall get to the bottom of these mysteries cried he with so triumphant an air his face shining with joy that elizabeth in spite of her torturing anxieties could not help smiling they were alone in these green and flowery spaces a great peace was all about them the birds were singing the breeze lightly stirred the trees and bushes with caressing breaths fondor gazed tenderly at elizabeth very tenderly the young girl smiled tremulously as she met this glance of lover-like tenderness we shall get to the bottom of it repeated fondor you will see i promise you their glances mingled in a mute communion of thought and feeling spontaneously their hands met and clasped they were standing close together and theirs the consciousness of living through an unforgettable moment they felt most vividly alive together how young they were how intoxicating a moment the world of outside things ceased to exist for them they were enwrapped in a glowing world of their own fondor's hand slid to elizabeth's shoulder he leaned towards the unresisting girl and with closed eyes their lips met in a long kiss a kiss all ecstasy it was a moment's mutual madness the instant passed both knew it torn from this momentary dream of bliss they gazed at each other embarrassed greatly moved for that very reason they wished to part ah this was not the moment to speak of love to dream of happiness and mutual joy dark dreadful mysteries enclosed them it was a sinister net they struggled in as yet they could see no clear way out they had no right to be themselves until the mysteries were cleared away they could not belong to each other now fondor when taking leave of elizabeth expressed a wish that she should not accompany him to the convent and she still shaken with emotion had not insisted on doing so as he was on the point of stepping into the street a sister came up to him you are monsieur jerome fondor yes sister our mother superior wishes to speak to you our journalist bowed acquiescence some minutes later the mother superior joined him in the large parlour monsieur she began i must apologize for having sent for you but i wish to have a necessary talk with you fondor interrupted the saintly nun and i must apologize reverend mother for not having come to pay my respects to you before leaving had i not been much troubled i should never have dreamed of leaving without thanking you for the help you have been good enough to give me the nun looked at him questioningly fondor continued in agreeing to receive mademoiselle elizabeth dolan as a boarder you have done a deed of true charity this poor girl is so unhappy so tried so unfortunate that i really do not know where she could have found a better refuge than in this convent under your sheltering care i but the nun would not allow fondor to continue it is precisely about mademoiselle dolan that i wish to speak to you of course i should be glad to help and comfort one suffering from a real misfortune but i must confess that when mademoiselle dolan presented herself here as a boarder i was ignorant of the exact nature of the scandal in which she is involved fondor was taken aback at the harsh tone of the nun's speech good heavens madam what do you mean to insinuate i have just been informed monsieur of the exact nature of the relations which existed between the criminal jacques delon and madame de vibray fondor stiffened with indignation it is false he cried utterly false you have been misinformed he stopped short the nun signified by a movement of her hand that further protests were useless in any case whether false or not it is quite certain that we cannot keep this girl here any longer for her name will in the end do harm to the respectability of this house fondor was astounded at this extraordinary statement in other words said he you refuse to keep mademoiselle here any longer as a boarder yes monsieur the journalist moved a step or two then with bent head seemed to be turning something over in his mind it comes to this madam you are not giving me your true reasons for again the nun interrupted the young man with a gesture true monsieur i should have preferred not to mention my real and very definite reasons which make it an imperative duty that i should request mademoiselle dolan to seek another refuge nevertheless since you insist i will tell you that mademoiselle dolan's attitude just now her behaviour is what we cannot possibly allow good heavens what do you wish to insinuate now madam you kissed her monsieur i regret that you have forced me to go into details i regret that you have compelled me to put into words this 
i will not allow you to turn this religious house into a lover's meeting-place am i clear before fandor had time to protest the nun gave him a curt bow and prepared to leave him the young journalist recalled her he was angry all the more so because he knew that the mother superior had some justification for the attitude she had taken up alas all his protestations were vain very well madam he said at last you are utterly mistaken but i recognize that your attitude has some color of justification and i bow to your decision based on misinformation and a mistake though it be kindly allow me two days grace that i may find another refuge for mademoiselle dallon with a movement of her head the nun signified her assent then with a final bow she left the parlour crestfallen but full of angry resolve jerome fandor turned his back on the convent End of chapter 14. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Section 15 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 15 vague suspicions fondor was talking to himself an inveterate habit of his as he sat in the cab which was carrying him to the palais de justice beyond question i ought to have examined that paper they have stolen from mademoiselle elizabeth i should have looked through it at the first opportunity that sequence of names those dates which seem to almost coincide with the different criminal attempts probably relate to the mysterious plan which the assassins are carrying out systematically but that means there are to be more victims and we shall witness fresh tragedies i am not at all easy about elizabeth either who the deuce could have telephoned her at the convent perhaps what i am going to do is stupid but no chance must be neglected i wonder if i shall learn anything worth knowing at the court to-day when they arrested these smugglers five months ago i recollected perfectly that monsieur thomery's name was mentioned in connection with the business if i only held the connecting link of interest in my hands which would make it clear why all these people jacques delon the baroness de vibray princess sonia danidoff barbe nantoul and even elizabeth dollon have been the victims of the horrible band i am pursuing the motive evidently robbery but there must be some other reason for and it is a significant fact all these people know one another meet one another or at least are either clients of the barbe nantoul bank or are friends of monsieur thomery it's the devil's own mystery jerome fandor had arrived at the palais de justice he crossed the great hall de passe perdues and entered the assize court the trial of the cooper and his accomplices was a small affair and had not attracted many listeners for these smuggling and coining cases were apt to be dull as a matter of fact there would not have been a soul present if the accused had not had the most popular of counsels to defend them maitre henri robart fondor joined a group who were on familiar terms evidently and although he had not seen her for many a day he at once recognized mother toulouche by her remarkable appearance and grotesque get-up he had had so many other irons in the fire that he had not followed this smuggling case at all closely he was surprised therefore to see mother toulouche in the little passage adjoining the court for he had the impression that the old receiver of stolen goods had been under lock and key for some weeks she was now being interviewed by one of his colleagues fondor went up to them though she had not been accused of anything so far the old storekeeper was vehemently protesting her innocence yes she declared to her interviewer it is abominable when such things are discovered all of a sudden mother toulouche went on to explain that on clock quay she rented a small shop for the sale of curiosities that she was an honest woman who had never wronged a soul by as much as a farthing all she asked was to be left in peace to earn a decent living so that she could retire from business some day or other everyone had a right to ask as much as that her store consisted of two rooms and an underground cellar in which she had put a quantity of old odds and ends when she had moved to her present abode she never descended to this cellar never at all she was far too much afraid of rats to venture down there not she 
but one day if you please when she was quietly engaged in mending some old clothes the police had suddenly burst into her store and they had accused her of receiving smuggled goods and false money and she didn't know what more besides the police not content with this had made her go down to the cellar to find out whether or no there were such things in the second cellar belonging to her store who had been the most surprised then why who but mother toulouche who until that very minute had not known that this second cellar existed how then was she to know that it communicated with the sewer still less that the sewer opened on to the seine and that by the seine arrived bales of smuggled goods which were concealed in her cellar by the smugglers fortunately the judges had understood this and after twenty-four hours detention on suspicion mother toulouche had been set at liberty at first she had declared that she did not know the accused persons summoned to appear that day the cooper in particular to tell the truth she had made a mistake she did know them through having met them a long time ago when she lived near la capelle so long ago was it that she had forgotten all about it anyhow she wanted to have done with the business from the very beginning of the trial mother toulouche had been disagreeably struck by the inquisitorial glances and pointed questions of the public prosecutor throughout the proceedings now in her turn the old storekeeper was questioning her audience trying hard to find out what would be the probable attitude of the magistrate when she herself should be summoned to the witness box witness mother toulouche fondor smiled as he listened to the loquacious old storekeeper for he knew how much faith was to be put in her veracity and respectability it was pretty clear that she was every whit as guilty as the handcuffed individuals now in the dock as she had not been arrested it simply meant that in juve's opinion this was not an opportune moment to put a stopper on the nefarious activities of this bad old woman at this precise moment fondor recognized juve he was leaving a group of barristers and officials who had been hugely entertained by his stupid answers and remarks yes it was juve so admirably made up and disguised that fondor had difficulty in recognizing him here was Cronajour on the scene. He approached Mother Toulouche and stood there, a Cronajour who was the picture of gaping imbecility. "'You too?' cried Mother Toulouche, looking askance at him. "'Are you one of the witnesses?' Cronajour's reply was a comical grimace. He scratched his beard, remarking finally, "'I have forgotten. I don't know.' His audience burst into roars of laughter. Fondor laughed loudest of all one of maitre henri robart's juniors whispered in fondor's ear with an air of giving the journalist a piece of information worth having a simple-minded soul that a kind of idiot you can guess that at the preliminary inquiry they soon found that out he may be heard or he may not fondor nodded he found it difficult not to laugh thanks for the information he stammered the young barrister did not understand the ironical tone of our journalist Mother Toulouche was envying Cronajour. "'You're in luck, you are, to be too silly to go and talk to those inquisitive fellows in there, eh?' Conversation stopped. The low door, giving entrance to the court, had just opened. An usher announced, "'The case is resumed. Witnesses this way. The woman, Toulouche, it is your turn.' They jostled and pushed their way through the narrow entrance in order to get into the courtroom quickly. Fondor, however, instead of following the crowd, had grasped the simple Cronajour by the shoulder, and shouted loud enough to be heard by those who might have been surprised at his action. "'You duffer of a Cronajour! Go along with you! You're the man for my money, old fellow! Here's something for a glass, but come with me for five minutes. I want to interview you and make a jolly good article out of it!' Fondor went off, followed by the detective. When they were quite away from everyone, Fondor turned quickly to his friend. "'Well, Juve?' nothing so far you have not run into the whole gang not i replied juve these are only the supernumeraries and there are some of them out of my reach look here fandor continued juve in a low tone you will see someone in court presently whose presence will astonish you it is an aviator the aviator emulet well my boy i have a notion that this fellow is no stranger to all these goings-on but patience besides you know fandor it's not my way of doing things to put the bracelets on mediocrities such as he i fly higher good-bye shall see you later on fandor asked in a low tone 
shall i remain for the sitting yes said juva it's quite likely that i shall not be present and it would be a good thing if you were to get a general idea of this affair you may pick up some useful information juva i very much wish to have a longer talk with you there are things i want to say to tell you steps could be heard coming in their direction the two men separated at once but juva had just time to say this evening then at eight i shall come to your place fandor expect me half an hour later fandor entered the courtroom the speech for the crown had just been concluded the arrest of these smugglers now on their trial had made some stir about five months ago public opinion had been aroused almost to fever pitch when it became known that the accused had for nearly two years past succeeded in getting through into paris without having paid town dues quantities of the most highly taxed articles and thus had accumulated a large store of riches in contraband goods and money they owed their arrest to the betrayal of a wretched dealer who was dissatisfied with his remuneration the journalists had after their manner amplified all the details had exaggerated the realities and had given a romantic colouring to the various incidents in the varied lives and adventures of this daring band of smugglers they had been represented as perfect gentlemen who had formed themselves into a marvellously organised black band led by a chief having right of life or death over them a band fertile in tricks and extraordinary stratagems who massed their plunder in immense vaults and cellars under the very heart of paris in the isle of the cite and communicating with the river which under the eyes of the police served to bear the barges laden with their booty cellars and vaults in the isle of the cite well thought fandor men organized into such powerful association in this part of paris might well put one on the track of strange discoveries regarding the mysterious events connected with the jacques delon affair then having spoken to his colleagues on the press fandor turned in the direction of the jury and set himself to follow attentively maitre henri robart's speech for the defence end of chapter fifteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 16 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 16 Discussions. The portress rang up Fondor on the telephone. Monsieur Fondor, there is a stout little lady down here. She wants to see you. Should I let her go up? fondor's first impulse was to say no he glanced at the timepiece it was exactly two minutes past eight and juva might be here at any minute he was sure to keep his appointment after an instant's hesitation fondor decided on a yes he called down to the portress let her come up fondor had an idea perhaps this person knew something about the appointment made that afternoon at the palais de justice it would be well to find out the why and wherefore of this call in any case it was best for a journalist to see all comers if possible there was a discreet ring announcing that the stout little lady had already mounted the five flights of stairs and was now on fondor's landing our journalist went to open the door standing well back in the shadow so that his visitor might show herself first as she passed into the little hall yes she was certainly stout short and also elderly she wore a bonnet with strings perched on a thick crop of grey curls yellowish at the tips this elderly dame wore glasses she was wrapped in a large brown shawl and she supported herself as she walked with a crooked handled stick whilst the puzzled fondor closed his front door the visitor made straight for the little sitting-room where our journalist usually sat surrounded by his books and papers ah she seems to know my flat thought fandor the next moment he jumped back for no sooner had the visitor got well into the room than she straightened her bent back threw off her shawl and dropped her stick then tearing off her grey curls and her spectacles the visitor revealed herself as juva fandor burst out laughing juva well i never it's juva all right my boy cried the smiling detective as he rid himself of the feminine get-up which impeded his movements 
i was pleased to see my lad that you did not suspect my identity until i had thrown off this second-hand wardrobe i bulked myself out with oh cried fondor that's only because i hardly looked at you if i had juba you may be sure i should have recognized you possibly but what do you think of the disguise not so bad juba but why did you change your sex this evening oh for the fun of it and to keep my hand in besides the more precautions we take when we meet the better admit for a moment that our enemies are keeping a watch on you here what will they recollect about your doings this evening why that fondor the journalist had a call from a lady and that she did not leave in a hurry either hang it all i've no objection to a don juan reputation but i may say without offence that as a woman there's nothing particularly attractive about you juba in the garb you've just discarded bah replied juba you mustn't be so particular my dear boy as if dress mattered or appearance either juba was lighting a cigarette as he walked about the room examining the books and other objects with which fondor had surrounded himself a charming home murmured the detective then he inspected the contents of a little showcase in which fondor had collected what he called his circumstantial evidence in other words various objects relating to cases he had been engaged on such as scraps of clothing blood-stained weapons broken locks these records of crimes new and old were carefully labelled juva began questioning fondor about these sinister relics five minutes of jokes and laughter then fondor became serious he drew his friend to a corner settee juva said he in an impressive tone i have found the connecting link by jove you have have you cried juva in a bantering tone and with a quizzical look let us see it explain regardless of his friend's scepticism fondor proceeded to expound his theory i did as you suggested i was present at the trial of the smugglers i listened to counsel's speech for the defence but judged it useless to stay to the end when maitre henri robart began a disquisition on the facts i left here is what i have noted some one owns a house in the isle of the cite a house which is a meeting-place for receivers of stolen goods ruffians robbers and vagabonds a house possessing underground cellars of no ordinary kind now this some one never mentions this strange house of his though he must be aware of its existence then this someone knows intimately several at least of the people more or less involved in the jacques delon affair and one may boldly assert it the delon plot was hatched in a cellar in a sewer of the cite one of two things either this personage is timorous is afraid of being compromised and does not consider in what an awkward position this coincidence places him if that be so he is a singularly thick-headed individual or well monsieur thomery you are the most rascally scoundrel it has been my lot to admire up to now but i assure you we know how to get even with you from the moment we have established in the first place a connection between all these affairs that they indubitably hang together secondly that you monsieur thomery are the connecting link no interrupted juba sharply what is that you say i say no what cried fondor taken aback he stared at juba who continued to smoke his cigarette unmoved but fondor was obstinately set on stating his point of view the primary cause of the delon affair seems to be the suicide of the baroness de vibray a suicide probably owing to a love disappointment the old lady had been forsaken by her lover monsieur thomery no juba's denial slightly annoyed fondor but did not stop him i ask was the man who robbed sonia danadoff one of the guests it is very unlikely for not only were the clothes of all those present searched but all thomery's guests were known well known no fondor bit his lip it's true juva you were there yourself and no one penetrated your disguise and discovered who you really were my last argument is therefore worthless but i fancy your attitude your way of receiving my deductions hides something have you got new information fresh facts to go on you know who stole the jewels no good heavens how aggravating you are juba but this time you will simply have to agree with me listen when we first met after our long separation you admitted that one thing bothered you the ease with which your nefarious band of villains of the isle of the cite were able to get rid of considerable sums of false money and you were trying to find their market by what means these wretches were able to rid themselves of the coin 
when apparently they were not acquainted with any influential people in the business world or in the circles of high finance well i have discovered their channel of distribution it is none other than the proprietor of this house properly the ground floor and basement of which are occupied by mother toulouche obviously it is thomery no fondor lifted hands to heaven in despairing fashion and sat silent he was deeply mortified there was a long pause during which juva calmly smoked on at last fondor asked in a hopeless sort of tone well what do you think slowly as if awakening from a dream juva began to speak we know nothing for certain so far my lad except that the baroness de vibray has committed suicide that princess sonia danidoff has recovered from the shock of her jewel robbery and is to marry thomery next month there is nothing extraordinary in that just as there is perhaps nothing surprising or extraordinary in the series of robberies nor even in the crimes occupying our attention at the present moment fondor jumped up nothing he shouted you are joking juve it is absurd what you say do just think a minute my dear fellow why all these affairs are closely connected from the jacques delon affair up to up to fondor stopped short juve who had been listening to him with seeming inattention now appeared wholly anxious to hear the end of the sentence he stared hard at fondor go on go on i want to make you say it and fondor as though in spite of himself finished with up to fantamas yes at last we have got it cried juve the two men gazed at each other once more the logic of deductions the chain of circumstances had inevitably led him to pronounce the name of the formidable bandit of whom they could not think without a shudder whose memory they could not evoke without immediately feeling themselves surrounded by sinister gloom lost in a thick fog of mystery of what was strange hidden occult fondor's countenance cleared suddenly as he gave utterance to the idea which had just crossed his mind juve do you not think that this mysterious prison warder called nibet might very well be an incarnation of fantomas because in so many circumstances juve interrupted fondor with a gesture of denial no old fellow said he gravely don't start on that trail it is assuredly a bad one nibet is not fantomas nibet does not count for much one might say for nothing at all he can scarcely be called a tiny wheel even in the great machine driven on its diabolical course by our fiendish enemy we must look higher than that thomery insisted fondor who still held to his idea and was determined to turn juva to his way of thinking but juva still said no to that let us drop thomery my lad as to fantomas how do you think we can identify him in this haphazard fashion basing our idea on pure supposition for who is fantomas the real fantomas among so many probable fantomas can you tell me that fandor continued juva who was getting excited at last i grant you that we have seen in the course of our chequered existence an old gentleman like etienne rambert a thick-set englishman like gurn a robust fellow like lupart a weak and sickly individual like chalec we have identified each one of them in turn as fantomas and that is all as for seeing fantomas himself just as he is without artificial aid without paint and powder without a false beard without a wig fantomas as his face really is under his hooded mask of black that we have not yet done it is that fact which makes our hunt for the villain ceaselessly difficult often dangerous fantomas is always someone sometimes two persons never himself juva once started on his subject could go on forever and fondor did not try to stop him when the course of conversation led them to talk of fantomas the two men were as though hypnotized by this mysterious creature so well named for he really was fantomatic a spectral entity the two friends could not turn their minds to any other subject they discussed fantomas up and down in and out and round about it was getting on towards one o'clock when fandor saw juve off as far as the staircase the detective had resumed his disguise but neither man was in a joking mood now fandor had given juve an account of the annoying yet rather absurd incident at the convent when he and elizabeth were unsuspectingly bidding each other a passionate farewell under the watchful and scandalized eye of a nun 
Fondor had thought it better to take Juve into his confidence on the point, though it went against the grain, for he was bashful with regard to his feelings. Juve had openly laughed at first, but when he understood that Elizabeth, requested to leave the convent, would again be without a safe shelter, he became serious, reflected for a minute or two, then gave his dear lad a piece of advice, advice which Fondor had seemingly taken objection to, and had finished up by agreeing to. They parted with these words. "'The more you think it over, dear lad, the better you will like my idea,' said Juba. Fondor had not said no to it. End of chapter 16 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 17 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 17 An Arrest. The day after his memorable talk with Juva, Fondor was summoned to appear before the police magistrate because he could give evidence regarding the Rue Raffet affair and had saved elizabeth delon's life it was about four in the afternoon and he had just entered the passage leading to the offices so familiar to him when he met elizabeth behind her came several persons whom he recognized among them were the barbey nantoul partners madame bourrat and the servant jules they were together and were talking the moment she saw him elizabeth went up to him oh monsieur she cried with a reproachful look we had given up all hope of seeing you just imagine the magistrate has finished his inquiry already twice he asked if you had come fondor seemed surprised the summons was for four this afternoon was it not he asked taking from his pocket the summoning letter a glance showed that he was not mistaken he gave elizabeth the letter to read she smiled you were summoned for four o'clock i see but we had to appear earlier i was examined as soon as i arrived and i was summoned to appear at half-past two fondor was annoyed with himself he might have guessed it he was vexed because he had not been on the watch in the passage whilst this examination was proceeding he was moving towards monsieur fuselier's room the magistrate in charge of the Autul affair and he must have looked his vexation for elizabeth said i am a little to blame perhaps that you had not due notice but what could i do yesterday evening when you telephoned to the convent to ask for news of me i was just going to tell you at what time i was summoned but when i went to the telephone what's this you're telling me asked fondor staring hard at elizabeth i never telephoned to you yesterday evening who told you i had been asking for you on the telephone nobody said so but i supposed it was you who else would be so kindly interested in my doings fondor made no reply to this here was the telephone mystery again an alarming mystery elizabeth had not given her address to anyone fondor had been careful not to give it to a soul clearly this poor girl even in the heart of this peaceful convent was not secure from some unknown outside interference and fondor optimist though he was could not help shuddering at the thought of these mysterious adversaries implacable and formidable who might work harm to this unfortunate girl whose devoted protector he now was besides did he not feel for jacques delon's pretty sister something sweeter and more tender than pure sympathy whenever he was near her did he not experience a thrill of emotion fondor did not analyze his feelings but they influenced him unconsciously he turned to elizabeth since you cannot remain any longer at the convent where do you think of staying well monsieur i shall go back to the convent this evening though it is painful to me very very painful to be obliged to accept their icy hospitality as for to-morrow fondor was about to make a suggestion when the door of monsieur fuselier's room opened halfway the magistrate's clerk appeared and glancing round the passage over his spectacles called in a dull tone monsieur jerome fondor here replied our journalist i am coming then making a hasty farewell of elizabeth as he went toward the magistrate's room he whispered wait for me mademoiselle and for the love of heaven remember this 
whatever i may say whatever happens whether we are alone together or in the presence of others whether it be in a few minutes or later on do not be astonished at what may befall you even though it be my fault be absolutely convinced of this whatever i may do will be for your good more than that i must not say elizabeth had not a word to say but his words were humming and buzzing in her ears when fandor was in the magistrate's room with a cordial handshake monsieur fusilier began by congratulating him on having saved elizabeth dollon's life ah oh, said he smiling you journalists have all the luck and between yourselves i envy you a little for your lucky star has led you to the discovery of a drama and has enabled you to prevent a fatal ending to it now do you not think as i do that this atul affair is not a case of suicide but of attempted assassination there is no doubt about it replied fandor quietly the magistrate drew himself up with a satisfied air that is also my opinion has been so from the start the clerk now interrupted the two men who were talking as friends rather than as magistrate and witness asking in a nasal tone does his honour wish to take the evidence of monsieur jerome fandor in four lines then i do not think monsieur fandor has anything more to tell us than what he has already told us in the columns of la capitale that is so is it not asked the magistrate looking at fandor that is correct replied our journalist the clerk rapidly drew up the deposition of monsieur jerome fandor in due form and read it aloud in a monotonous voice fandor signed it it did not compromise him at all he was about to leave when monsieur fusilier caught him by the arm please wait a minute there are one or two points to be cleared up i am going to ask the witnesses a few questions we will have a general confrontation we will compare evidence then the journalist's friend now all the magistrate asked the assembled witnesses certain questions in an empathic and professional tone fandor seated a little apart had leisure to examine the faces of the different persons whom circumstances had brought together in this room his first look was for elizabeth energy and courage were plainly marked on her pretty sad face then there was the proprietor of the atul boarding-house an honest vulgar creature red-faced perpetually mopping her brow and raising her hands to heaven ready to bewail her position deploring the untimely publicity given to this affair a publicity which threatened discredit to her boarding-house as he was seated directly behind the manservant jules fandor had a view of his broad back surmounted by a big bullet head and ruffled hair this witness spoke with a strong picardy accent and there was nothing remarkable about his answers he seemed the conventional second-rate type of servant he did not seem to have understood much of what occurred on the famous day when questioned as to the order of events his answers were vague uncertain then seated beside fandor were the bankers barbet a grave-looking man no longer young judging by his beard which was going grey he was decorated with the legion of honour the other nantu looked about thirty elegant distinguished lively these two were well known in the highest parisian society as representing finance of the best kind they were highly thought of the magistrate asked the bankers a question why asked he did messieurs barbet nantou call on mademoiselle delon was it to bring her some help as has been stated elizabeth blushed with humiliation at the magistrate's question monsieur nantou answered there is a slight distinction to be made your honour and mademoiselle dollon certainly will not object to our mentioning it it never entered our minds to offer mademoiselle dollon charity charity she never asked of us be it clearly understood mademoiselle dollon with whom we had previously been acquainted whose misfortunes have inspired us with deep sympathy wrote to ask us if we could find her some employment hoping to find some post for her we came to see her to talk with her to find out what her capabilities were that is all we were very glad it so happened that we were able to aid monsieur fandor in restoring her to life can you tell me monsieur fandor did you notice anything suspicious in mademoiselle de Lon's room when you entered it you wrote in your article that at first you had thought it simply an attempted burglary followed by an attempted murder that is so replied fandor directly the window was opened i leaned out i wanted to see if there was anything suspicious on the wall of the house i also looked behind the shutters why asked the examining magistrate 
because i had not forgotten the close of the thomery drama the same monsieur thomery mentioned in the assize court yesterday oh in all honour of course but you have not forgotten although that examination was not in your hands and i regret it because i am of the opinion that there are points of connection interlinking all these mysterious affairs you have not forgotten i am sure that when the investigations were over and monsieur thomery's guests had been allowed to leave the house that a thread of flax was discovered hanging to the window fastening of the room in which princess danidoff had been found unconscious this flax thread was very strong and was broken at the end it is easy to conclude that the stolen pearls had been temporarily fastened to it this led me to think that the aggressor or aggressors had remained in the reception rooms during the whole course of the investigations since it is proved that no one left the house but after all we are not here to investigate the thomery affair i wish to explain why i had examined the window and shutters of mademoiselle delon's room i wanted to ascertain whether the procedure of the would-be murderer of mademoiselle delon was similar to that of the robber in the danidoff thomery case and what conclusion did you come to asked the magistrate window and shutters bore no traces that i could see said fandor i could not come to any conclusion here monsieur barbet intervened if i may be allowed to say so he glanced at the magistrate for the required permission which was given with a smile and gesture of assent i quite agree with monsieur jerome fandor i also am convinced that even if there is not a close connection between the thomery affair and the atul affair at least there exists such a connection between the atul affair and the terrible drama of the rue norvans i would go even further than that declared monsieur nantoux the robbery of rue de quatre septembre of which we are the victims is also connected with this same series of mysterious cases the magistrate asked the question it is a matter of twenty millions is it not it must have been a terrible blow to you fearful monsieur replied monsieur nantoul our credit was shaken it affected a considerable number of our clients monsieur thomery among them and we consider him one of our most important clients you are aware of course that in financial matters confidence is almost everything our losses have just been covered by an insurance but we have suffered other than direct material losses still the banker turned toward elizabeth who was wiping tears from her eyes still what are our troubles compared with those which have struck mademoiselle delon blow upon blow assassination of the baroness de vibray mysterious death the baroness de vibray was not assassinated she committed suicide interrupted fandor sharply most certainly i do not wish to make you responsible for that gentlemen but when you wrote announcing her ruin you dealt her a very hard blow could we have done otherwise replied monsieur barbey with his customary gravity of manner and tone in our matter-of-fact business where all must be clear and definite we do not mince our words we are bound to state things as they actually are what is more we do not share your point of view and are convinced that the baroness de vibray was certainly murdered monsieur fuselier now expressed his opinion or at least what he wished to be considered as his opinion gentlemen consider yourselves for the moment as not in the presence of the examining magistrate but as being in the drawing-room of monsieur fuselier in my private capacity i will give you my opinion regarding the rue norvans affair i am decidedly less and less in agreement with monsieur fandor though i recognize with pleasure his fine detective gifts thanks interrupted fandor ironically that is a poor compliment smiling the magistrate continued i am of the same opinion as monsieur's barbey nantoul i believe madame de vibray was murdered fandor could not control his impatience be logical monsieurs i beg of you he cried the baroness de vibray committed suicide her letter states her intention the authenticity of this letter has not been disputed the disastrous revelations contained in monsieur's barbey nantoul's communication prove too severe a shock for the poor lady's unbalanced brain the news of her ruin abruptly conveyed drove her to desperation the death of the baroness de vibray was voluntary and self-inflicted there was a dead silence then monsieur barbey asked the question well then monsieur fandor will you explain to us how it happened that the baroness de vibray was found dead in the studio of the painter jacques delon fandor seemed to expect this question from the banker there are two hypotheses he declared the first and in my humble opinion the more improbable is this 
madame de vibray at the same time that she decided to put an end to her life wished to pay her protege a last visit all the more so because he had asked her to come and see his work before it was sent into the salon perhaps the baroness intended to perform an act of charity in this instance before her supreme hour struck perhaps she miscalculated the effect of the poison she had taken and so died in the house of the friend she had come to see and help her death there could not have been her choice for she must have known what serious trouble it would involve the artist in were her dead body found in his studio here is the second hypothesis which seems the more plausible the baroness de vibray learns that she is ruined she decides to die and by chance or coincidence which remains to be explained for i have not the key to it yet some third parties interested in her fate learn her decision they let her write to her lawyer they do not prevent her poisoning herself but as soon as she is dead they straightway take possession of her dead body and hasten to carry it to jacques delon's studio to the painter himself they administered either with his consent or by force probably by force a powerful narcotic so that when the police are called in the next day they find not only the baroness lying dead in the studio but they also find the painter unconscious close by his visitor when jacques delon is restored to consciousness he is quite unable to give any sort of explanation of the tragedy naturally enough the police look upon him as the murderer of her who was well known to have been his patroness how does that strike you it was now monsieur fuselier's turn to hold forth you forget a detail which has its importance i do not pretend to judge as to whether she was poisoned by her own free act or not but in any case we have this proof an uncorked phial of cyanide of potassium was found in jacques delon's studio it seemed to have been recently opened but when the painter was questioned about it he declared that he had not made use of this ingredient for a very long time fondor replied i can turn your argument against you monsieur if the baroness de vibray had been poisoned voluntarily or not with the cyanide of potassium in delon's studio he would have taken the precaution to banish all traces of the poison in question it would have been his first care when questioned by the police inspector he would not have declared that he had not made use of this poison for a very long time the contradiction involved is proof that delon was sincere therefore we are faced by a fact which if not inexplicable is at least unexplained monsieur barbey now had something to say you criticize and hair-split in a remarkable fashion monsieur and are an adept in the science of induction but let me say without offence meant that you give me the impression of being rather a romancing journalist than a judicial investigator admitting that the baroness de vibray was carried to the painter delon's studio after her death and that seems to be your opinion what advantage would it be to the criminals to act in such a fashion jerome fandor had risen his eyes shining his body vibrating with excitement i expected your question monsieur he cried and the answer is simple the mysterious criminal seized the baroness de vibray's body and brought it to delon's studio to create an alibi and to cast suspicion on an innocent man as you know the stratagem was successful two hours after the discovery of the crime the police arrested mademoiselle delon's unfortunate brother with a dramatic gesture fandor pointed to elizabeth who no longer able to contain her grief was weeping bitterly the audience had risen moved troubled subjugated in spite of themselves by the journalist's eloquent and persuasive tones even monsieur fuselier had quitted his classic green leather armchair and had approached the two bankers madame borat was behind them and the servant jules with his smooth face and staring eyes fandor continued this is not all monsieurs there is still something that must be said and i beg of you to listen with all your attention for what the result of my declarations will be i do not know it is no longer my reason that speaks instinct dictates my words listen it was a poignant moment all the witnesses the magistrate included were thrilled with the certainty that the journalist was about to make a sensational revelation taking his time jerome fandor walked slowly quietly up to elizabeth who distraught with grief was in floods of tears mademoiselle he said in a clear level voice which was in strange contrast with his recent persuasive and authoritative tones mademoiselle you must tell us everything 
you are here not in the presence of a judge and of enemies but amidst friends who wish you nothing but good i understand your affectionate feelings i know what an unreasoning but quite natural attachment you have for your unfortunate brother but mademoiselle it is now imperatively necessary that you should do violence to yourself you must tell us the truth the whole truth interrupting his appeal to elizabeth fandor turned to the magistrate with a smile so enigmatic that his audience could not tell whether he was speaking sincerely or was acting a part i have contended in my articles up to now that jacques delon was dead dead beyond recall but when confronted with recent facts my theory seems to fall to the ground fandor turned once more to elizabeth resuming his authoritative tone and manner since the affair of the depot the legal authorities have recognized indelible traces of jacques delon's hand in the series of crimes which have been recently perpetrated up to the present i have determinedly denied such a possibility but mademoiselle i put it to you you have forgotten to tell us something of the very utmost importance something quite out of the range of ordinary happenings something phenomenal now here is the staggering fact i am faced with the other day between two and three in the afternoon at the atul boarding-house where you are staying you received a visit from your brother jacques delon the supposed robber of the princess sonia danidoff's pearls the suspected author of the robbery of rue de quatre septembre and lastly the fratricide for what other explanation of the attack on you can be given an attempted murder beyond question and i add fondor could not continue his eyes were fixed on those of elizabeth who at the first words addressed to her by the journalist had started up trembling from head to foot their glances met challenging each seeking to quell to subjugate the other it seemed to the onlookers that they were witnessing an intense struggle between two very strong natures separated by a deep a fathomless gulf that a veil dark as night hanging between them had been rent asunder giving passage to an illuminating flash that this luminous ray carried with it all the revelations and the key to the fantastic mystery but to a calm perspicacious observer of the two beings standing face to face it would have been clear that jerome fandor's real attitude was both suppliant and persuasive and that elizabeth delon's was one of overwhelming surprise monsieur fusilier carried away by the journalist's startling and extraordinary statements did not perceive this suddenly he saw in jerome fandor the denunciator and in elizabeth delon the accomplice unmasked nevertheless he said quietly monsieur fandor you have just uttered words of such gravity that you are bound to confirm them by indisputable evidence do you mean to persist on these lines fandor looked away from the stupefied elizabeth and her questioning glance he answered the magistrate at once the proof of what i advance you will find by searching mademoiselle delon's room i would rather not say more than that allow me to state monsieur that i cannot arrange for such an investigation until to-morrow morning then addressing the astounded madame borat the two bankers and the manservant jules madame messieurs will you be kind enough to withdraw madame i advise you under pain of the most serious consequences not to allow any one whatever to enter your premises nor go into mademoiselle delon's room before this matter has been fully sifted by the legal authorities be good enough to wait in the passage all of you having witnessed their exit the magistrate walked up to fandor and looking him straight in the eyes said well out with it well replied the journalist if you institute a search in the place i have indicated you will find in a chest of drawers under a pile of mademoiselle delon's personal linen a piece of soap wrapped up in a cambric handkerchief take this soap to monsieur bertillon's department and after the scientific tests have been applied to it you will be able to say that it bears distinct impressions of delon's hand delon's the magistrate gasped elizabeth delon had fallen back into the armchair from which she had risen all trembling her tears had ceased she stared at the two men with wide open terrified eyes all the time the clerk in spectacles wrote steadily on at his table noting down the details of the scenes he was witnessing there was a palpitating silence monsieur fusilier had returned to his writing-table jerome fandor seemed to have recovered his composure an ironic smile curved his lips beneath his small moustache whilst his hand sought that of elizabeth 
it was the only way he could at the moment express the sympathy he had never ceased to feel for her monsieur fuselier filled in a printed paper and pressed an electric bell two municipal guards appeared monsieur fuselier rose and signing to the soldiers to wait he faced elizabeth delon mademoiselle have you any objections to make to the statements of monsieur jerome fandor will you say whether or no you received a visit from your brother elizabeth tortured by intense emotion her throat contracted strove in vain to pronounce a word at last by a supreme effort she murmured in a strangled voice oh why you are all mad here as she gave no direct reply to his question monsieur fuselier after a pause announced in a grave voice mademoiselle until i have more ample information i am under the cruel necessity of ordering your arrest guards arrest the accused cried the magistrate sternly elizabeth delon made a movement of revolt when she saw herself surrounded and felt her arms seized by the two representatives of authority she was about to cry out in protest but a glance it seemed to her a tender glance from fondor restrained her she stood speechless inert after all had she not confidence in him although she could not understand his attitude had he not been her staunch defender up to now had he not warned her that she must not be astonished at anything that occurred that she must be prepared for anything nevertheless elizabeth delon felt her brain reeling she was astounded beyond words the surprise was too strong for her about a quarter of an hour after this tragic scene fondor was pacing up and down the asphalt of the boulevard de palais plunged in thought when someone clapped him on the shoulder he turned it was monsieur fuselier well my dear fellow cried the magistrate resuming his customary tone of good fellowship well what an adventure you have been playing some fine tricks i never expected such a stroke as that the deuce if i did ho oh, ho laughed fondor i think that a week from to-day we shall know a good many things well replied the magistrate i have had the girl placed in solitary confinement that makes them willing to speak out fondor looked the magistrate up and down ah murmured he with a scarcely perceptible note of contempt in his voice you think you will extract information from that quarter do you but why not why not interrupted the dapper monsieur fuselier in a sprightly tone and leaving fondor abruptly he leapt into a passing tram-car fondor watched fuselier cross the road and climb to an outside seat whilst the magistrate waved a friendly farewell from the top of the disappearing car fondor shrugged disdainful shoulders and with pitying lips muttered one word Foe. End of chapter 17 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 18 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Suvestra This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Don W. Jenkins chapter eighteen at the bottom of the trunk after monsieur fuselier's departure fondor rejoined madame borat on the boulevard the good woman was very much upset by the dramatic scene she had witnessed she had sent off her manservant and was preparing to take the tram back to atul fondor asked if he might accompany her and madame borat was only too delighted to have a chance of further talk with the journalist for she had a lively desire to learn all she could about the extraordinary drama in which she found herself involved when they arrived at atul madame borat had learned nothing definite for the journalist had given only evasive answers to her questions still one point was obvious madame borat considered monsieur jerome fandor as the most amiable man in the world and she was disposed to help him to the utmost of her powers in defence of any interests he wished to safeguard madame borat was absolutely set on receiving monsieur fandor in her private apartments she then seized the opportunity to complain of the trouble this affair had brought into her regular and peaceful existence certainly in summer her boarders were less numerous their numbers being in fact reduced to two or three this season there had been fewer than usual but the accident or attempted assassination of mademoiselle delon 
had undoubtedly brought discredit on the house an old paralyzed gentleman who had been in residence on the day of the drama had departed the day after there was not a single boarder in the house it was empty having made certain that her manservant jules and her cook marianne had retired to their respective rooms madame borat conducted fandor as far as the door of her dwelling they had been so interested in their talk that they had forgotten all about dinner their experiences of the past few hours had left them with little appetite it was about nine o'clock night had fallen house and garden were wrapped in a mantle of darkness can you find your way asked madame borat if she accompanied the journalist to her garden gate she would have to grope back to the house in the dark and alone her nerves were shaken by recent events she did not wish to venture forth and back in the mysterious gloom of night even on the familiar path of her garden what might that darkness not hide what robbers what murderers might there not be lurking near fandor laughed why of course i can madam to find the points of the compass to cultivate the sense of locality is part of a journalist's profession do not forget to draw two behind you it needs a strong pull the gate which separates us from the street once shut no one can open it from outside fandor shaking hands with the boarding-house keeper promised to close the gate as the sound of his steps on the gravel grew less and less as the gate fell to with a loud noise and an absolute silence followed madame borat felt sure that her guest had left the garden had gone away but he had done nothing of the sort fandor had shut the gate noiselessly but he had remained inside the grounds he stood motionless holding his breath wishing neither to be seen nor heard he remained so for a long twenty minutes then being assured that madame borat had retired for the night she had closed her shutters and put out her light he rubbed his hands murmuring now we shall see stepping gingerly along by the side of the wall he reached the main building of the boarding-house luckily it was empty as far as boarders were concerned he recognized elizabeth dulon's window on the first floor and was glad to see that it was half open chance favored him there was even a gutter pipe running down the wall and passing close to the window providence had favored him with a fine staircase there would not be much difficulty in climbing that no sooner thought than done accustomed as he was to exercise in games fondor agile as a young man in good training can be squirmed up the pipe as far as elizabeth's window he caught hold of the sill recovered his balance jerked himself up and two seconds after had landed in the room dared he strike a light he remembered pretty accurately the position of the various pieces of furniture but he would like to study the room more in detail his luck still held for a ray of moonlight suddenly shone out from behind a cloud he saw the moon sailing in a clear sky there would be sufficient light from the moon rays to enable him to pursue his investigations it was an essentially modern room the white walls were painted with ripolin and were as bare of ornament as a nun's cell an iron bedstead stood in the middle of the room a wardrobe with a mirror panel in front and locked occupied one of the corners behind a folding screen was a toilette table a louis the fifteenth bureau two chairs an armchair that was all after making this rapid inventory fandor considered the situation is growing complicated said he to himself i am quite persuaded that this room will shortly receive a visit from some individuals who will not court recognition their interests are all against that and they certainly will not be anxious to meet me here these individuals assuredly know at this minute that the examining magistrate is going to make a thorough investigation here to-morrow morning how do they know it it's very simple the prime mover in the attempted murder or one of his accomplices was assuredly among the witnesses this afternoon is it the amiable madame borat is it that doltish jules who looks like an absolute fool but may be masking his game suppose the serious barbet pops up or the elegant nantour but i do not think so they are rather victims than attackers everything leads me to that opinion but all this does not tell me whether the place has already been visited or not 
Fondor unlocked the drawer, searched for the piece of soap under the pile of Elizabeth's linen, and had the extreme satisfaction of finding the soap had not been moved. Good. I am here first. Ah, we shall see our men presently. Which and how many? Fondor seated himself and let his imagination work. He tried to picture the faces of the mysterious individuals he was determined to track down, but so far in vain. Then, with strange, uncanny persistence, one face rose again and again before his mental vision, clear, vital, the face of the enigmatic Tomery, with his silver-white hair, his red face, his light blue eyes, that Yankee head of his, well set on his robust torso. "'Tomery!' cried Fondor almost aloud. "'The fact is, everything leads me to think.' but don't let us anticipate concealment is the next item on the program fondor realized that to hide under the bed was impossible he would be discovered immediately the screen was no better there was elizabeth's trunk why it was a kind of monument in wickerwork the very thing it was quite big enough to hold him it was one of those enormous trunks beloved of women to hide in it would be an excellent trick a real joke let me burrow in there and see the stupefaction of these estimable characters when they open it to rummage about among elizabeth's belongings and find themselves face to face with me they will see besides my sympathetic countenance the stern mouth of my revolver let us see whether it is a possible hiding place fondor raised the cover and lifted out a top compartment in which were scattered among objects of feminine apparel papers, books, and all sorts of things which had evidently belonged to the unfortunate painter. The distracted Elizabeth, in the hurry of departure from Rue Norvons, must have thrust them in pell-mell. The lower division of the trunk was empty. Another bit of luck, thought Fondor, now to sample my little hide-hole. Fondor found he could get into a fairly comfortable position. Then he calculated that with the compartment back in its place and the cover open, all he had to do to close it was to shake the trunk transversely he could certainly remain inside for several hours without intolerable discomfort raising the cover fondor slipped out the interminable hours crawled by to smoke was out of the question fondor's pride in his exploit was sinking to zero was he passing a wretched night to no purpose a violent ring sounded Someone was ringing at the garden gate, ringing loudly, insistently, an imperative summons. Instantly, Fondor was on the alert. Useless to slip to the window and peer cautiously out, for Elizabeth's window did not face the gate. Even by leaning out, he could not catch any glimpse of any visitors, either coming to the house or passing along towards Madame Borat's apartments in the annex. Besides, Fondor feared to make a noise, and the polished boards of the floor cracked and creaked at the least movement. "'The one thing for me to do,' thought he, "'is to creep back into my retreat and wait. Now who can it be at this time of night?' Fondor's curiosity was rapidly satisfied, after a fashion. The call of the bell had been answered by noises and hurried footsteps, whisperings, an outburst of voices, then silence. A few minutes after, Fondor clearly heard some persons entering the ground floor of the house. He listened intently. He could hear his own heartbeats. Then a voice said, "'In heaven's name, is it possible? Why do you come to upset people at this time of night, as if we had not had enough to put up with during the day? It is a dreadful business. There is no doubt about it. Are we never to be left in peace?' "'Why, it's Madame Borat's voice,' said Fondor. "'Poor woman, what's up?' he listened someone said the law is the law madam and we are its humble executors as the examining judge has ordered me to make an investigating distraint we are compelled to carry out his instructions to the letter be good enough to tell your servant to lead us to the actual spot where the crime was attempted now what is all this asked fondor and from whence comes this police inspector it only wanted that he won't know what to make of it when i tell him who i am and how am i to explain my presence here anyhow wait and see what happens someone was coming upstairs more than one this way monsieurs said a hoarse voice the room the young lady occupied is at the end of this passage this time i recognize my fine fellow thought fondor it is that imbecile of a jules but what a triumphant tone 
and how different his voice sounds to what it did this afternoon at the examination then fondor all but jumped from his hiding place oh what an egregious fool i am why there is not a police inspector in france who would come at this hour to carry out an investigation and a distraint to boot what the devil does it mean can they be the fine fellows i am lying in wait to meet the dubious individuals who had roused the house at such an unholy hour entered the room someone turned on the electric light though fondor could obtain a sufficient supply of air through the openings in the wickerwork he could not see what was going on he could only listen with all his ears madame borat accompanied her strange visitors it is here she exclaimed that the journalist jerome fondor found my border stretched out on the floor you see in this corner is the gas stove with its tubing they have forgotten to refix it to the pipe but there is no danger the tap is turned off and so is the meter the personage who had given out that he was a police inspector whose voice was probably an assumed one replied only by monosyllables fondor did not recognize his voice but there was another speaker who also had very little to say for himself and fondor thought he recognized certain tones as belonging to a man who had been much in his thoughts of late tomery thought he is it tomery but he only knew the sugar refiner by sight and had heard him speak but once or twice at the ball that was not enough to go on for fondor had not paid special attention to the distinguishing tone and quality of his host's voice nevertheless he could not get out of his head the idea that the celebrated sugar refiner honored by all paris esteemed by everybody was standing only a step or two away from him now in this house of strange happenings and under very peculiar circumstances was he a burglar an assassin one of a nefarious band for fondor was now convinced that these were not police emissaries bearing a legal mandate to search and distrain no they were robbers criminals he was preparing to rise from his hiding place and appear before the bandits he would fire a few shots and make the deuce of a row and rouse the neighborhood he would also save poor madame borat who was certainly not their accomplice just then he heard the pretended police inspector say will you provide us with writing materials madame we must write an official report why certainly monsieur replied madame borat i will go downstairs and get what you require fondor heard her leave the room no sooner had she gone than a hurried conversation began in low tones clearly jules was guilty for the pretended police inspector asked no one this evening nothing happened no replied jules in a servile tone the journalist brought the mistress back and then went off at nine o'clock no news of alfred asked the voice the third person answered why no you know very well he is always at the depot let us set to work said voice number one fondor felt that the decisive moment had arrived someone opened the cover of the trunk and feverish hands were turning over the confused mass of objects in the top compartment didn't you find anything asked the voice of jules no no monsieur i searched everywhere but as i do not read easily it's difficult for me imbecile murmured the voice ah said fondor to himself this fellow pleases me he has the same opinion of this dolt of a jules as i have revolver in hand fondor was on the alert the moment they lifted up the compartment out he would jump just then madame borat could be heard approaching unfound it we shall not have time to go through everything muttered a voice the trunk cover was hastily closed fondor heard madame borat enter the room with a slow heavy step here are ink and paper monsieurs she said then the pretended police inspector made a statement that startled the concealed fondor madame we have no time nor are we able to make a minute investigation now besides with one exception there does not seem to be anything suspicious about the room but here is a trunk which contains papers of great importance we are going to take it to the police station as you please replied madame borat i ask only one thing and that is to be left in peace i do not want to hear anything more about this abominable affair a rapid turn of the key given to each of the locks and fondor knew that he was now a prisoner brave as he was he felt a rush of blood to his heart and a cold sweat broke out on his forehead dash it all i am in an awful position impossible to move if these brutes suspected they had me tight in here they would pitch me into the river as sure as fate 
then good-bye to la capitale then before fandor's mental vision rose a sweet consoling figure the figure of the girl for whom he was braving danger for love of whom he certainly did love her he had placed himself in such a serious position then all that was optimistic in his nature and that was much rose to the surface and declared the dilemma was not as serious as it seemed how could the bandits know of his presence in the trunk they never would think jerome fandor so stupid as to shut himself up in the trap jules and i might shake hands as equals in folly concluded fandor just then the trunk began to move they were trying to lift it whilst trying to preserve an unstable equilibrium he said to himself in a satisfied way and just to think now that they have not rummaged in the chest of drawers nor have they seized the tell-tale piece of soap it's true that fusilier alone knows of its being there i was careful not to tell anyone else but where the deuce are they going it's the stairs of course it might be a rough precipice by the shaking up they're giving me End of chapter 18 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 19 of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Elaine and Pierre Silvestre This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins chapter nineteen criminal or victim at the bottom of his trunk jerome fandor was foaming with rage furious at being caught in the trap and uneasy as to how this adventure would end whilst he was realizing that his unknown porters were carrying their heavy weight with difficulty to the pavement of rue raffet he made up his mind to a definite course of action regardless of consequences he was going to shout move about make a regular disturbance rouse the attention of the passers-by if there happened to be any but at all costs he meant to get out of the trap he saw a ray of hope madame bourrat had accompanied her visitors as far as the gate in presence of such a witness they would at least hesitate to do him serious bodily harm when he made his presence unmistakably known furious though they would be he would take every advantage of the situation fondor was about to act a second more and he would have started when he heard them speaking he kept quiet we must have a taxi or at the very least a cab to transport this big trunk do you know where one is likely to be found i doubt if one will be passing at this hour monsieur we retire early in these parts but if you like jules can go to the station that's settled let him go as fast as he can well that is reassuring thought fandor if these fine fellows take a cab it is not with the intention of chucking my cage and me into the river and that is what i feared most they may be going to leave me in a cloak-room till called for or they may pack us off as luggage to some destination unknown oh well i shall only be a traveller without a ticket and i shall be sure to find some way out of the difficulty and then what stuff for an article i shall have when i get back to la capitale what must they be thinking at the offices it's forty-eight hours since i put foot in them never mind when they know fondor was listening with all his ears but the bandits had little to say and when they did speak their voices were plainly disguised was it as a general precaution or was it on account of madame borat but unless they were known to her why the necessity if however she knew one or more of them personally why they must have disguised their faces and figures as well as their voices if only he could have a peep at them the sound of wheels made him suppose that jules had succeeded in getting a cab at the Atul station then the trot 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 of a horse became audible a few moments later a cab drew up at the edge of the pavement a hoarse voice was heard it's not a long journey i hope said the hoarse grumbling voice of the cabman to police headquarters replied the pretended police inspector we shall see about that thought fondor that address is to throw dust in madame borat's eyes they will change their destination on the way i bet on it the brutes are they going to jam my cage and me on to the seat
fondor asked himself for they had seized the trunk and were beginning to lift it up am i to be stuck upside down beside the driver i don't fancy so we must weigh at least ninety kilos as i weigh seventy myself fondor's mind was soon made easy on that score after a fruitless attempt to hoist the trunk to the box seat they decided to put it on to the back seat of the victoria one of the bandits planted himself on the little folding seat opposite the trunk the other bandit mounted to the box seat next to the driver the two bandits took leave of madame borat the rickety old vehicle started off presently fondor heard what he had expected to hear one of his captors told the driver to take them to some other address than police headquarters owing to the rattling of the ramshackle cab it lacked rubber tires fondor though listening with ears a stretch could not hear one word distinctly soon pale gleams of light began to filter through the wickerwork dawn was near ah we shall soon reach our destination thought fondor i don't fancy my trunk lifters will wish to be seen with this turnout in broad daylight now where the deuce are we going in vain did fondor strive to follow the route taken by the bandits he had noted each shock and countershock produced by cobbled streets and smooth roads by bumping against pavements by crossed tram lines and sharp turnings the cab stopped with a jolt and a jerk the two men got out the trunk was lifted down to the pavement the driver was paid he rattled off now trunk and i are in for it thought fondor a bell pealed a courtyard entrance gate was thrown open the two men lifted the trunk cursing under their breath at its weight in passing under the archway they called some name unknown to fondor and so unintelligible that he could not remember it then it was a painful ascension up a staircase they went with prodigious effort stopping on two landings two floors counted fondor we are coming to the end and all said and done i would rather be in a house than at the bottom of the river a key turned in a lock the trunk was pushed rapidly inside then the noise of a door being shut fondor was in a room no doubt alone with the two bandits and at their mercy he was plunged into complete darkness evidently the shutters were still closed the noise made by footsteps on the floor showed that it was uncarpeted judging from the sound there seemed to be little furniture and no hangings in the room and i in my cage in an ordinary room in a studio or in a hall wondered fondor in any case the fellows who had brought him there seemed anxious to avoid making a noise then he felt the cover of the wickerwork trunk bend slightly and heard it creak for a moment he thought the two men were about to open his prison he had his revolver ready every inch of him was on the defensive then he realized that his captors had merely seated themselves on the trunk to rest they began to talk this thought fondor is splendid i shall hear everything they say why it is a conversation in my honour what luck fondor was delighted thanks to his position he could hear some interesting secrets he listened alas he could hear every word they uttered but he could not understand what they were saying fondor swore strictly to himself the two wretches were conversing in german to the best of his judgment a good hour had passed since the false police inspector and his acolyte had left the room they had simply drawn to the door behind them not troubling to lock it much to the joy of jerome fondor absolute silence reigned fondor attempted some discreet movements as a test the wicker work creaked as he gently shook the trunk at short intervals not an answering sound came from outside menaced with cramp fondor felt that the moment of escape had arrived he was certainly the only living soul in the place listen as he might and his sense of hearing was acute he could not hear any sound of breathing yes the time to quit his prison had come fondor had with him besides his revolver a box of matches and a hunter's knife consisting of several blades and a little saw getting out his knife with some difficulty he began to hack at the wickerwork dry and pliant the interlaced rods did not long resist the saw's steel teeth 
it took him a bare ten minutes to make an opening sufficiently large to push his head and shoulders through the rest of his body followed easily such was his haste to be free that he tore not only his clothes but his elbows and hands on the jagged ends of the broken wickerwork large drops of blood fell on the flooring bah i got off cheaply cried fandor standing up to relax his cramped muscles and stretching his aching legs and arms unless i am jolly well mistaken i am lord of all i survey i am alone in my glory there's not a soul in the place good luck indeed he turned for a last look at his broken prison house the cage in which he had spent such exciting hours he suddenly stiffened and drew back a nervous trembling seized him the nervous trembling due to sudden shock between the trunk which had been dumped down in the centre of a large square room without a scrap of furniture in it and the window through whose shutters the rays of morning sunshine shone fondor had caught sight of a body lying on the floor a man's body fondor leapt forward was this same cunning criminal feigning sleep for some evil purpose standing over that motionless figure fondor bent and touched one of the man's hands it was ice cold and rigid the man was dead to see his face was imperative it was turned towards the floor with a difficulty fondor raised the head and shoulders for they were unusually large and strongly built fondor glanced at the face and suddenly withdrew his hand the corpse fell back on the floor with a thud tomery murmured fondor why it's tomery it was the well-known sugar refiner's body the face was purple the tongue protruding round his neck was tied a tri-coloured scarf the scarf of a police inspector was this the murderer's ironic touch fondor sank down quite overcome he tried to collect his thoughts a disgusting joke this if someone should take into his head to enter the room at this moment what kind of explanation could i give here i am alone with the dead body of a man i know and in a room i don't know in a neighbourhood whose whereabouts i know no more than the man in the moon where am i in whose house for what purpose have those beauties of last night no suspicion of the truth did they leave me in this lair of theirs of set purpose knowing i was cooped up inside the trunk just then fondor felt a slight moisture on the palm of his hand it was all red the scratches made by the jagged edges of the wickerwork were still bleeding better and better i declare murmured fondor if i don't look like a little holy saint john a corpse and a man with blood on his hands seated beside the dead body of this murdered man nothing more is required to jail me with all the power of the law to go to prison under such suspicious circumstances is serious the police who are floundering about in a maze of investigations without any result so far will be only too delighted to kill two birds with one stone to suppress a journalist and discover a criminal i have got to get out of here that is plain as a pikestaff get away yes but with the honour of war i must establish an alibi that is absolutely necessary i like to think that my false police inspector and his accomplice have cut and run for some time at any rate that they will be in no hurry to come back to see what is happening where they have so neatly and nicely left the corpse of this tomery what part did this fellow play in the drama criminal or victim fondor had reached the door of the hall opening on to the main staircase he was listening he had explored the flat it was empty he had found water in the kitchen had washed his face and removed every trace of blood from his person it was a flat suitable for a middle-class household there were three large rooms decorated with a certain amount of luxury fondor looked at his watch it was seven o'clock he stood listening someone a man was coming downstairs someone a woman was coming up they met on the landing just outside monsieur mercadier here are your letters i was bringing them up to you it was hardly worth while my good lady i have come down you see so you can save yourself five flights of stairs oh no monsieur i have to come up to go down my stairs monsieur mercadier continued to descend and the portress continued to mount fondor's heart beat faster when he realized that she was approaching the door would she come in and find him there had the new tenants left a key of the flat with her no the portress dusted the landing quickly and continued her ascent he heard her going up and up 
he made up his mind to slip out on to the landing despite his efforts he could not prevent his shoes creaking it was springtime and already the stair carpet had been taken up he was on the point of going downstairs when he heard the portress calling from above who's there what do you want had she heard him leave the flat was he to be stupidly caught just as he was escaping he must act at once he went up a step or two of the next flight of stairs and called out is monsieur marcadere at home ah no monsieur he has just this minute gone out i am surprised you did not meet him very good madam i will come another time fondor turned on his heel and whistling with hands in his pockets he gained the ground floor passed the entrance gate and found himself in the street he mingled with the passers-by and learned from the first plaque he came to with the name of the street on it that he was in rue le corbe vaugirard end of chapter nineteen